Honourable members, the Speaker. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this Parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Honourable, the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion relating to the routine of business interruption for question time, adjournment of the House and the 11 o'clock rule. Is leave granted. The Honourable the Minister. Thank the House. I move that one. So much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent the ordinary routine of business for the remainder of the week being as follows. A. On Thursday 21st of December 1989. 1. Privilege order of the day. 2. Presentation of petitions. 3. Notices and orders of the day. 4. Questions without notice. 5. Presentation of papers. 6. Ministerial statements by leave. 7. Matters of public importance. 8. Notices and orders of the day. And B. On Friday 22nd December 1989, notices and orders of the day. 2. Sessional Order 101A, interruption for question time apply to this sitting. 3. Sessional Order 101A, interruption for question time be suspended for the sitting on Friday. 22nd of December 1989, and four, Sessional Order 48A, adjournment of the House, and Standing Order 103, 11 o'clock rule, be suspended for this sitting. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Hume. Mr Speaker, I did not uh, refuse leave <coughs> for the Minister to uh, move this resolution, but I want to give right at the outset an indication of the protest of the opposition in relation to how the business of this House is being organised. For example, uh, the first matter to be dealt with this morning is a matter of privilege. And uh, at this moment, as I speak in the House of Representatives, I do not have a copy of the resolution to be moved by the Minister. Now, this is, this, 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 this is an important matter, a matter of privilege. A member of the opposition is, uh, is, is under some kind of censure, under some kind of a cloud, as a result of actions of the government. There's been a minority report that has uh, received very little publicity, but we'll come to that in another, in another debate later this morning. But the point that I want to make is that at this point we have not received a copy of any resolution that the government proposes to make or to proposes to move. I spoke to the Leader of the House very briefly before you entered the chamber, and he did indicate to me that there is a resolution. Now, what's happened over the past uh, few weeks, and in particular, over the, at least over the past few years, and in particular the last few weeks, is that the government is just treating this House with contempt. Yeah. Absolute contempt. Uh, Inherent in what the uh, minister has said this morning is that the House will sit late tonight. We have no objection to that. We're happy to stay here till two or three o'clock in the morning if that's the only way the government of Australia can get its business through the House of Representatives. We're prepared to sit here right up until Christmas. We would have sat for the last two weeks. We would have sat. We would have sat for the last two weeks if the government could have got its business in order. But, uh, Mr Speaker, this is an incompetent government in every respect, and certainly in relation to the way it conducts the business of the House. Just recently order. I was in the House of Commons watching Question Time. The Prime Minister, the Prime Minister came in for only 15 minutes, and I thought at first, that was a travesty of justice. The, min the Prime Minister in the House for question time for only 15 minutes. But I was pleasantly surprised. In that 15 minutes, the Prime Minister answered more questions than this government answers in 50 minutes in an ordinary question time in the House of, in the House of Representatives. Order. 
Now we have a. Hume. The Leader of the House interrupts and says that we provide details. What a lot of nonsense. You can't get details out of this government. You can't get answers to questions. If you ask a short question that requires a brief factual answer, they go on and on and on with something that, with great respect, Mr Speaker, is irrelevant. And we seek your assistance from time to time under the rules of relevance to draw the minister back to the subject of the question. Now, Mr Speaker, we're not going to oppose the suspension of standing orders and the, the change in the sitting pattern for today and tomorrow, but I do want to give notice that this opposition is going to oppose and protest on every available opportunity at the way the government is treating this House. I said it's treating it with contempt. It's nothing more than a charade. If it didn't have to come here to conduct the business of the Government of Australia, it would not come here. We are sitting for fewer days each year. There's less opportunity for private members to raise matters of importance to the public. There are less opportunities to ask questions. In 1984, it increased the size of the House for no reason other than for political reasons, because it believed that it would give it a, an electoral advantage. Now, with additional members in the House, what does it do? It arranges for us to sit for fewer days. It gives less opportunity for members to ask questions and so on. On one sitting day, towards the, the end of the last sitting period, the opposition was only given the opportunity to ask four questions in a 50-minute question time, an absolute disgrace. In 1987, this parliament sat for 84 days, whereas the Canadian and the United Kingdom legislative parliaments sat for 167 days each, and the US Congress for 170 days. I call on the government, Mr Speaker, to rearrange its program for next year and to ensure uh, no no order I'm coming there's to far that in too a much moment. noise in the chamber the, gov the government whip shouldn't get uh, too excited about what I'm saying I asked them to rearrange their program for the first part of next year to ensure that we sit earlier than is presently proposed and that there are, there is more time allocated for the opposition and indeed for government members to raise matters of great national importance. Surely every person in this House agrees that our system provides for governments to govern, in other words, for the majority view to prevail and for the minority view to be heard. But this government doesn't want the minority view to be heard. And as a result, of course, the minority view is very rapidly becoming the majority review. And my reference to next year, of course, is that I want the Leader of the House to indicate clearly whether this House will reassemble on the 20th of February as scheduled, or uh, does it intend to run with its tail between its legs and not face this House again before the election? Now, I want the, the Leader of the House to give us an assurance one way or the other. Will the House of Representatives be recalled on the 20th of February, or do they intend to uh, go to the people before meeting the House again? And if it's the intention to come back on the 20th of February, then I ask the Minister to reconsider that timetable and to come back early next year so that there will not be a bunching of uh, legislation. We saw bill after bill go through during 1989 with absolutely no discussion on those pieces of legislation and other pieces of legislation where only five or ten minutes was allocated. Mr Speaker, what's happening in this place is an absolute disgrace yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's time that the government changed its ways 
and provided a better opportunity for people to discuss matters of great national importance in the chamber and also to demonstrate to the Australian public that this is a democracy. We're all hailing what's going on in Eastern Europe. But what does it, what's happening in Eastern Europe is that at last people are given an opportunity to speak, to speak their minds. Not all of them have got the opportunity yet to vote. In this country, particularly in the House of Representatives, thankfully we still have the opportunity to vote. But Mr Speaker, we have less and less opportunity to speak. The Honourable Minister. I thank the opposition for their support of this resolution, uh, as expressed by the manager of opposition business in his remarks. I, uh, there are a couple of points that, uh, a couple of questions that he directed to me, and one or two other points that I would quite like to take up. The first is, will uh, Parliament reconvene on the 20th of February? Uh, I, the answer to that is, it depends whether or not there's an election before that date or uh, a period of time uh, in the few weeks. Uh, the few weeks after that date, it's as simple as that. If there isn't, a, if there isn't an election, then uh, the parliament will reconvene on the 20th of February. If there's not, then the parliament won't. So, uh, so there we are. That's the answer to that question. And I rather suspect that uh, that is the answer that uh, the honourable member expected, and uh, it's the only answer that common sense could provide. The, uh, the, second, the other points that he made was the question of the oh, position nah of private members in this place. Now, I don't think there can be any doubt at all that the changes supported by the government to standing orders for this parliament, which have effectively, except, and, and even largely for this day's sitting, handed over Thursday mornings to private members for the consideration of private members' business, are the most substantial advance for private members' rights in this House for a very considerable period of time. And, uh, and the, uh, and the fact of the matter is that private members in the House of Representatives now have a meaningful role. In addition to that, the government has provided for a series of committees capable of monitoring government policy in the House of Representatives to give more meaning to the parliamentary role in checking the executive in this place. Again, that is a position which was not per permitted by our predecessors when they were in office. So insofar as the advance of uh, the rights of private members in this place, we have a reputation and achievement second to none in regard to the operations of this House, second to none. And, uh, but it has to be said, it has to be said we didn't have much to beat. It has to be said that in the periods of times when you have, which is most of this federation, period of the history of this federation, run this House, you've run it on the basis that private members, at least in the House of Representatives, have few rights at all. The then, the, uh, then the question is made Order. by the uh, point is made by the honourable member for uh, Hume that we do not meet often enough. Well, that is a matter for debate. Uh, that may or may not be true. But what is un what is absolutely indisputable is if you take our period of time in office and take the period of time in office of the seven years of the Fraser government before then, there is essentially no difference. Basically, we meet. Sometimes uh, in one particular year there will have been more sittings by the Fraser government in a particular year of the Hawke government, but averaged out over the period of time we meet effectively the same amount of time that has been met by this parliament really for the last couple of decades. So if there is error, if there is, uh, if there is error in that regard, it's an error that all governments have, uh, have uh, perpetrated in the operation of this chamber. Of course, we are different. We are different from the uh, House of Commons, and both here, uh, both in Britain and in Canada. The House of Commons does not, in either of those places, operate with the same level of party discipline that we do in this place. It does not operate on the basis that ministers are there to be available for questioning in the House on every day of the week. In fact, uh, in the United Kingdom, the, apart from the Prime Minister, ministers are available for questioning, I think, on the basis of about once a fortnight. And, uh, and junior ministers scarcely at all. So, uh, so the, uh, Member for Hume will cease We do not have in our chamber the situation where, uh, or they do not have in that place the situation where ministers are constantly on call to answer for the administration of their portfolio. So 
Obviously, there are swings and roundabouts. You, ex you exchange the opportunity for more extensive questioning, uh, question times for the opportunity of uh, having available on a daily basis ministers for questions. So, uh, and if you, if, you, if you don't like that, if you don't like that, well then raise it with the Standing Orders Committee. You've got, you've got or Procedures Committee. You've got members on the uh, Procedures Committee that can raise alternative methods of conducting question time if you wish to. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that whenever question time has been seriously looked at, and uh, the uh, position that applies in this country, where you can ask questions without notice, a position that you cannot uh, apply, it does not apply in either Canada or the United Kingdom. Uh, we have always said, well, we'd rather keep questions without notice rather than have to place them on notice, which you have to do in those two countries. And we've always said we would rather have the ministers available for questioning on every day that Parliament sits than have them available once a fortnight. That, that is what various uh, the committees that have looked on this over objecting. the years have said that. Uh, uh, the member for Hume have a point Mr. of order. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, the, the, uh, the minister has just said that they'd sooner have question time order. on every day parliament will sit. No and I've asked order. him to indicate the whether there will be Hume question will time tomorrow. Seat. And if he continues to interject, I'll deal with him. I, uh, I must say, I think all members of parliament would rather I'll maximum warn the member for, for uh, Morton. I, I think all members would prefer to keep maximum flexibility tomorrow so that we can get out of this place and get back home for Christmas, no matter what obfuscation may be presented by the manager of opposition, uh, opposition business in this place. So the fact of the matter is that those, our question time has, when finally put to analysis by not only members of the government but also uh, more, more generally members of the House, have always in the end come back to the view that the way in which we conduct question time is better than the way in which they do it in the House of Commons. Personally, I think that's highly arguable. But nevertheless, that is the point that we have always uh, arrived at, and uh, I can't see that being likely to change in the, in the foreseeable future. Now, the, uh, the Honourable Member, Manager for, of Government Business, the Member for Hume, also uh, spoke at some length about the fact that we had not been sitting for the last couple of weeks. I think, in fact, there is a development having taken place in, that taking place in parliamentary politics since 1986 that requires the serious attention of members of this House, and, uh, and whatever means they can, uh, uh, by whatever means they can, to uh, find some may way of altering it. I think it is appalling that we are now placed in a situation where, at the end of the legislative session in the House of Representatives, we are obliged to guillotine through huge amounts of legislation, then go off for a couple of weeks and come back to uh, meet on them for a couple of days. Either that or not do the legislation in the course of this year. Now, that is a discipline which has been imposed on this House by the Senate since 1986. Ever since the carriage of the Macklin resolution by the Democrats and the opposition in the Senate, in which a date has been placed on the consideration by the Senate of legislation passed through this chamber, we have been in a situation where I believe, the, uh, in practical terms, the, the rights of the House of Representatives have been monumentally trampled upon. Because what it says to the government of the day is all the business that you wish to have started up by the 1st of January, all the, all, that is all your budget and related material, all the other legislation, most of which have fairly serious implications if it's not started up on the 1st of January in the forthcoming year, by the way in which governments do business in this country. If you do not have that in place by date X, the Senate simply will not consider it. Date X, date X, in, this, date X in this case happened to be the 23rd of November, some one month ago. That is when the, House, the Senate said to us in the House of Representatives, one month ago, any further material that you pass in the House of Representatives will simply not be considered by us in this session. Well, now, that is a, that, that is a very damaging proposition to the conduct of government. I would also have thought it's a rather stupid position for the opposition to adopt. Whatever we might think about the Senate and its, uh, and its role in the, uh, in, the, in the party process as a forum for debate and the articulation of public policy in this country and the presentation of government and opposition views on the issue of the day, one area where we unquestionably remain, uh, maintain authority in the House of Representatives is we are the focus of public attention. And I would have thought 
that a competent and sensible opposition in the Senate would never support a proposition like the, uh, like the Macklin resolution, because it's always in the interest of the opposition to have the, me have the House of Representatives sitting. And you do not have the House of Representatives sitting if there is not government business to be considered. Now, there may be a load of other business to consider, but it would be totally unprecedented in the history of the Commonwealth if we decided to hand over the House of Representatives for a month, basically for, which is what is effectively being asked for here, anybody to get up and raise anything they liked on. There are other things to be done. But if the opposition had not supported that fatuous proposition that, and had not sustained their support for it for the last two or three years, we would have had the House of Representatives sitting. We would have not had the situation where we are called back at the end of the period. To consider, with our, to consider our uh, legislation, and, uh, and we would have been in a, a position to do things, uh, do things much more sensibly. Now, if you take a look, if you take a look at the record of, uh, of uh, closure debates versus guillotine, you'll notice an interesting thing. That is, you, by a factor of about 70 per cent, when you were in office, moved the closure on. Uh, uh, in a as opposed to the way in which we have chosen to do business. We very rarely close debate in that way. You frequently did. We, however, have had far more frequent recourse to the guillotine since 1986 than you ever did. And, uh, and I think you can see in that an explanation as to the impact of that Macklin resolution. It forces the House of Representatives to rapidly conclude, conclude its business. In your situation, the House of Representatives still had to conclude its business, but you're able to do it in a much more leisurely fashion by recourse to closure motions. And, uh, and the, uh, we bring it in as early as you ever did. There is no the, difference the member between for ourselves Hume will cease and interject. yourselves and the period of the Fraser government on the question of when, when legislation is brought in. Now, you have failed to do that. Uh, you, you have failed to understand the political implications for yourself as an opposition of uh, persisting in your support of the Macklin resolution. You have put yourselves at a disadvantage by effectively bringing the, uh, bringing the House of Representatives to a point where at the end of every session, when a month when it may well have been meeting, it does so no longer. And you have also effectively allowed your senators to offend against the rights of this House by allowing them to place a statement on the record saying that they will not consider business by the House of Representatives after a particular date. Now, that is incompetent handling of business by the opposition. It's a, 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 an incompetence which entirely comes back on them in their capacity to be an opposition in this country. Uh, this particular set of sittings happens to be a consequence of, uh, of their failure to understand a, 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 what is an effective role for the opposition in the Senate and uh, they have only themselves to blame if they feel that this House, out of necessity, uh, gets badly treated. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion please say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Order of the day number one, Committee of Privileges, report relating to matter referred to committee on 23rd of November 1989, consideration of report. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Mr uh, Speaker. I move that, one, the House agrees with the finding and recommendations of the committee and calls upon the honourable member for Bruce to withdraw the allegation and apologise to the House, <coughs> and two, in the event of the honourable member for Bruce not withdrawing and apologising, a motion be moved that the honourable member for Bruce be suspended from the services of the House for two sitting days, including today. Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, we have now had some considerable period of time to view both the report of the Committee of Privileges and uh, the minority reports and to study the minutes of the Committee of Privileges since uh, that day, that very unfortunate day, back on the 23rd of November, when one of the members of this House had, without due resolution, uh, effectively tabled a series of allegations of a most serious nature. The Committee has, of course, not gone into those allegations. They've simply gone into the issue that, uh, of uh, what should have been the state of the honourable member's knowledge as to how he might proceed with those matters. 
The committee evidently sought to ascertain uh, from the honourable member as to whether or not he, uh, uh, in this case the honourable member for Bruce, as to whether or not he understood what the processes were which uh, would, uh, uh, he would be obliged to follow in order to have such uh, matters considered by the House of uh, Representatives, and quite clearly he should and did understand the processes he ought to have gone through. Now, the Honourable Member for Bruce makes a fetish of a willingness to make bizarre allegations under privilege in this place. If you go back over his record over the years, he at least ought to be as, co as competent as any member of this House in understanding exactly what he ought to be doing in placing matters, bef placing matters before the House. He has made over the years bizarre allegations about the connection of uh, industry leaders, trade union officials, politicians and police to uh, uh, their alleged involvement in drug trafficking when investigated by the AFAP, AFP, but found to be unfounded and based on rumour and conjecture. He has also uh, at various times managed to uh, describe the Prime Minister as being, uh, as being linked to organised crime. He has uh, managed uh, over the years to find uh, spies in all sorts of locations. And whenever order. order. The Honourable Member for New England on a point of order. The Minister might resume his seat. The Leader of the House at the moment is digressing from the content of that report and in that he's criticising the Honourable Member for Bruce for matters that are not pertinent to the report from the Privileges Committee, I'd suggest that it's entirely out of order. Under our standing orders, if a member is to be condemned, they must do so, be done, that must be done by substantive motion. Order. Now, the matters to which the Leader of the House is referring are not in the Privileges Committee report. They're quite outside the matter now order. before the House, and I suggest they're entirely out of order. order. The, the Minister was said that he believed the member for Bruce should be aware of the standing orders and, and was recounting where he believed the member for Bruce should have been aware of the standing orders. To that extent, to that extent I find him relevant, but he should be talking to the, the mat, substantially to the matter before the House. I have in fact made the, uh, the points that I wanted to make in that regard, which, as you say, go to the point of whether or not the Honourable Member for Bruce ought to be familiar with the procedures of this House and the way in which matters of uh, allegations of substance are, uh, are made. And in this particular matter, the uh, Member for Hotham was the victim of a two-pronged assault, one in the other place, which we cannot deal with here, and one in this place that went to the very heart of his integrity, as was pointed out in the debate by which this matter was considered by the uh, uh, the Honourable Member for uh, Melbourne Ports. Those allegations, if uh, substantiated on the basis of a resolution in this place, uh, would go very much to the heart of whether or not the Honourable Member for Hotham ought to hold tenure in this place. So they were allegations of a very serious nature, and uh, they were allegations, I might say, when looking at it, uh, were presented without any substantial proof at all. Now, what is, the conclusion, what is the conclusion of the committee? The committee concludes, A, whilst acting on the basis of information presented to him, the honourable member for Bruce, if of the view that the allegation should have been brought before the House, should also have been alert to the requirement that such a matter ought to be put forwards by means of substantive motion, open to debate, and which would admit of a distinct vote of the House. B, as a matter of urgency, the committee drew attention of all, on, all members to the requirements of the standing orders and practices of the House which govern the matter of reflections on and charges against members, and c. The great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility, and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. The member for Mayo. Having regard to the experience of the Honourable Member for Bruce, the Committee finds that the Honourable Member has offended against the rules of the House. Accordingly, the Committee recommends that the Honourable Member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for a serious breach and recommends that the House requires him to withdraw the allegation. Hence the resolution that uh, I have put before the House. 
Now, that is a serious set of findings, a set of findings in a limited area. Not to the substance of what the Honourable Member for Bruce has had to say, uh, which we, uh, I think the House would wisely treat like the substance of just about everything the Honourable Member for Bruce has had to say of this sort of nature in the past. Totally unfounded. But by the way in which he handled himself in this place and the processes that this House ought to enforce to ensure the protection of its members, to ensure that all members are effectively capable of exercising the privilege that they have in this place. So the committee narrowed itself to a consideration of how that procedure ought to have been undertaken. Now, I note there are one or two oddball elements of objections to this that come out of the minority report. One of the objections is to the way in which this process uh, arrived before the committee for consideration. Uh, well, all I can say to, in answer to that proposition, the uh, opposition supported the way in which uh, this matter was placed before the, uh, the Privileges Committee. When, they, when the matter was, uh, was considered by the House. And the Speaker outlined to, this, lined to us that there are two ways in which a matter might be placed before the Privileges Committee, one on his recommendation, the other on the recommendation of the House, and any sensible reading of the standing orders would say that to be the case. Now, in terms of whether or not the opportunity was available for the, uh, the member for uh, Bruce to address himself and the issues raised against him at the Privileges Committee, there were some, I believe, five meetings of that committee that went for a substantial period of time over a period of a week. There are plenty of opportunities for the Honourable Member for Bruce to uh, explain himself uh, and to explain the course of action he undertook to that committee. If he feels that he has not had an ample opportunity to explain himself, then that may in some way relate to the way in which he chose to conduct himself at those committee hearings. But that is something for other members, for members of the committee to, uh, to discuss. I was not uh, uh, present at those meetings. What is obvious, though, is to me, and ought to be obvious to every other member of the House, that the processes which ought to have been followed in placing the sorts of allegations made by the Honourable Member for the Bruce before this place simply were not followed by the Honourable Member for Bruce, and that uh, whereas in some circumstances failing to observe the privileges of this place might be excused either by ignorance, if a member happens to be a new member and not used to doing the sort of thing that uh, caused the offence, or because the matters to be considered by uh, in the way in which they are raised to be relatively trivial, uh, that uh, sort of defence does not happen to be available in this case. Firstly, the Honourable Member for Bruce, at least as much as any other member of this House, as he's a long-standing member and a member given to this type of allegation, ought to be thoroughly aware of uh, the processes by which he should place his views before the chamber. And the second is, goes to the nature of what was presented. And the nature of what was presented were very serious allegations indeed. And the, the build-up which occurred outside this place and in the other chamber, and then finally in this place itself, was, a, was by any fair-minded fair uh, view or reading by any member of this chamber meant to create, create the impression uh, that the Honourable Member for Hotham was a traitor to this country and as such a person not fit to hold office in this place. So these are, these are serious statements, statements which can only be dealt with in this House Order. by a... Uh, by, a, by recourse to the standing orders and recourse to the norms of this House. The Honourable Member for Bruce failed to observe that. Uh, that is all the committee has uh, found on. The committee, of course, did not consider the substance of the allegations. The committee has sensibly, therefore, asked the Honourable Member for Bruce to uh, withdraw and apologise, and that is a, uh, a proposition which all fair-minded members of this House ought to agree with. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Menzies. Um, Mr Speaker, the Opposition opposed this motion and uh, within that uh, context may I say at the outset that the Opposition has been given no notice of this motion whatsoever. One would have thought, uh, especially considering the pompous tone of the speech that we've just heard, with all those lofty references to decency and high principle, Order. I would have thought that at the very least in that context that a motion calling upon a member of this House to withdraw an allegation and apologise, and a motion that goes on to say that if he does not, 
then he is to have that mark against his career that he is to be suspended for two sitting days. One would have thought that at the very least what the government could have done would be to give the opposition notice of the fact that it intended to move such a serious uh, motion. But no, no such notice has been given. The second instalment of the whole ambush that has coloured this matter from beginning to end has just been visited upon this House. Well, we regard that conduct as utterly reprehensible in every respect, utterly reprehensible. The very least the government could have done would be to give notice of the fact that it intended to move this motion, which is in effect a form of proposed punishment of the Honourable Member for Bruce. Now, Mr Speaker, may I say that this is not a report, the Privileges Report, it is not a report of which this House can be proud. And I would invite all honourable members to read the committee's report. And I venture to say that if they read the evidence, if they read the minutes, if they read the report itself, any fair-minded observer will come to exactly that conclusion, namely that the report is not one of which this House can be proud. In fact, the House should be ashamed of it. The inquiry of which this is the report that's before us now is unsatisfactory from beginning to end and in virtually every respect. It was conducted without any jurisdiction whatsoever. It never clarified exactly what it was inquiry into. It never decided what the real issues were. And it was conducted in a manner that was a complete denial of natural justice to the Honourable Member for Bruce. It was, in fact, a shambles from beginning to end. It was the ultimate, Mr Speaker, of the Star Chamber set up with the clear intention of convicting and then proceeding through an empty charade until its inevitable conclusion. Now let me tell the House why I, why I myself reject the majority report and why in my view the House should be thoroughly dissatisfied with the job done by the committee. First, the committee never made, and this is hard to believe but it's true, never made any formulation of the alleged matter of privilege that was before it and this was despite the fact that the Honourable Member for, Bruce, uh, for Flinders and I asked the committee at the very beginning of the proceedings to do exactly that. You'd think that would be the obvious and first thing to do, to clarify exactly what the committee was inquiring into, but that was never done. Every member of the House who heard the debate when the matter was referred to the Committee of Privileges knew that there was an alleged matter of privilege of some sort to be examined. Some members, I presume, thought that it had been alleged that the Honourable Member for Hotham had infringed his privileges as a member. Other members presumably thought that what was being said was well, that it was the Honourable Member for Bruce who had broken privilege because of the speech he made in the grievance debate on the 23rd of November. But never, and I repeat, never in the course of the proceedings did the Privileges Committee ever formulate the matter of privilege it was supposed to be inquiring into. The only attempt at such a formulation that was made was when it decided that, and these are its words, the allegation referred to it comprised the address made to the House by the member for Bruce on the 23rd of November 1989, recorded at Hansard, page 2804 to 6. Now, as I said in my minority report, that tells us exactly nothing about what head of privilege it said that this matter comes under, and it tells us nothing at all about who was supposed to have committed the breach of privilege, nor does it tell us how it was thought that there had been a breach of privilege committed by the Honourable Member for Bruce or by anyone else. And so the committee, Mr Speaker, started off in a fog and it remained in a fog for the whole of the inquiry. It almost beggars belief, but the harsh reality is that from the moment of the very reference being made to the committee, until today, there has never been any statement of what the alleged breach of privilege is. Not only is this a flaw in the committee's deliberation that existed from the very beginning, but it is doubly bad. And it is doubly bad because the Honourable Member for Bruce was expected to defend himself against a charge where not only did he not know what the charge was, but the committee that was trying him was never able to tell itself what the charge was. And if that is not a travesty of justice, I don't know what is. And so the whole proceedings were flawed from the beginning and in my view remain flawed 
and that without any more is the reason why the House should reject this motion. Now, the second reason why the inquiry was completely unsatisfactory is uh, that the way in which it conducted its inquiry was a complete and absolute denial of the most elementary principles of justice and fairness to the honourable member for Bruce. I've already said, Mr Speaker, that the member was never given uh, the substance of the charge against him. Furthermore, his trial was conducted by a committee whose first failing was its own composition. As is known, the Leader of the House is entitled to nominate a member to the committee. The Leader of the House nominated the Minister for the Arts. Now, what is extraordinary about this is that it was the Minister for the Arts who raised the alleged matter of privilege in the House on the first occasion. And in support of what he said of the Honourable Member for Bruce's remarks that are said to have given rise to the matter of privilege, what the Minister for the Arts said was that they were the vilest of allegations. And not content with this, he added that, I have never heard a more serious allegation than this. Now, we cannot, of course, ask members of the Privileges Committee to be judges in the strictest sense. But what we can ask for and what the rules of natural justice obviously call for is that those who sit on the Privileges Committee, especially when they are to pass judgment on the conduct of one of their colleagues, should come to that committee with an open mind and without prejudice. And it cannot conceivably, by any stretch of the imagination, be said that when a member has contributed to a debate referring a matter to the Committee for Privileges and in the course of that debate has said that the person to be brought before the committee has been guilty of the vilest of allegations, it cannot, beyond any stretch of the imagination, be said that that member can have an open mind when he comes to the Privileges Committee to exercise his role as a member of that committee. It is just fanciful to suggest that he can. And I have no hesitation at all in saying that the composition of this committee was tainted from the beginning and was utterly illegitimate because of its composition. Now, particularly is this so because the minister was given an opportunity to withdraw from the committee but declined to do so. And yet, unblushingly, the committee went on and passed judgment on the honourable member for Bruce. And that is the first denial of natural justice. The second clear denial of natural justice is, I believe, simply this, that the honourable member for Bruce asked for the opportunity to obtain legal representation, and he asked for this indulgence on two occasions. And as I've said in my, minor my minority report, he should have been given a reasonable opportunity to obtain advice before being expected to answer questions and defend himself, and yet he was denied this opportunity. He did not ask for a permanent adjournment, or indeed a lengthy one, and I, for one, would never have granted him one. But I would have granted and proposed, in fact, that he should be granted a reasonable adjournment to enable him to obtain advice and representation. But that was denied, and this was a serious and substantial denial of natural justice. But there was a third and far more serious breach of natural justice. The member for Bruce came before us twice. Before he appeared the second time, a resolution had been prepared and circulated, a resolution which, in effect, found him guilty. So a majority of the committee decided the matter and reached its conclusions before the honourable member for Bruce had been heard before he had completed his evidence and before he could call his witnesses, which he indicated he wanted to call before the committee. And I regard this as offensive in the extreme. It is nothing more than exactly what it was intended to be, and that was a prejudging of the issue and a prejudging of the honourable member for Bruce. But it gets worse because the majority report does not even say whether a breach of privilege has been committed or not. And in fact, the committee in its deliberations decided that there was no breach of privilege. And that is the basic fact that must be understood about this matter. Before the government tries to hang the member for Bruce, the committee decided, the Privileges Committee decided, that there was no breach of privilege. And let us get that fact firmly and clearly in our heads. Now, the situation is simply this, uh, Mr Speaker, one would think at the very least that the committee would conclude on the matter of breach of privilege and could say so in its majority report. You would think that it could say whether a breach of privilege had been committed or was not. 
That was the obligation that the committee had to this House, no more and no less. And yet the report is silent on that most basic of issues. But it is even worse than that because the committee, in fact, as I've said very early in the proceedings, reached the conclusion that it was obvious that there was no breach of privilege. But if that was said, of course, the honourable member for Bruce would be cleared because this was the Privileges Committee and the matter was clearly sent to the committee with the intention of having him examined to see what strength there was in the allegations that had been made, not by him but in the statutory declaration. And when the com committee concluded that there was no breach of privilege, that, Mr Speaker, should have been the end of the matter. But no, the committee has chosen to proceed to deal with the complaint on the basis that there was a breach of the rules of this House. And the House should think very carefully before accepting this report and acting on it by passing this resolution, because it means that the Committee of Privileges is allowed to pass judgment on whether a member has broken the standing orders or the rules of procedure of this House or not. And that was never the function of the Privileges Committee, and it is not a function of the Privileges Committee now. And I would therefore put it to the House very seriously that the committee has gone widely astray and has absolutely no authority to be passing judgment on whether any member of this House has departed from the rules of the House or not. The final defect of this appallingly slack procedure is that it is very doubtful indeed whether the Honourable Member for Bruce did in fact commit a breach of the standing orders or of the rules of the House. And let me remind the House of exactly what happened in the grievance debate. The Honourable Member tabled a statutory declaration. He did not make allegations, as the Minister has said this morning. And the Honourable Member, uh, the Honourable Member who tabled the statutory declaration, the Honourable Member for Bruce, made no allegations of his own. Now, it goes without saying that the statutory declaration, as Honourable Members will see when they read it, did not say anything of the hysterical sort attributed to him by the Leader of the House or by the Minister for the Arts in his contribution in the earlier debate. Now, the Honourable Member for Bruce asked for leave to table the statutory declaration and was granted it. He was granted leave by a minister who read it. There was no objection made by any member of this House. There was no objection taken by the acting speaker who was in the chair of the mo at the moment at the time. Now, it is said in the report that the Honourable Member created difficulties for the Chair. What difficulties did he create? Is this the situation we're now to be left with as a result of this report and as a result of the motion that's now put up by the government that a member of this House is to have his freedom of speech denied because he runs the risk of being pilloried simply because he asks for leave to table a document and that leave is granted by a minister and no objection is taken by any honourable member and no objection is taken by the chair, because they are the basic facts in this matter. A member asked for leave to table the statutory declaration. The minister examined the document and gave that leave. No one, no member, neither the acting speaker or anyone else, took any objection whatsoever, any objection whatsoever to the uh, tabling of the statutory declaration. And now it is said, on the basis of that, not on his allegations, not on the member's allegations, but on the basis of him tabling a statutory declaration, that he is to be hauled before the Privileges Committee, convicted as a result of a kangaroo court of the worst order, breaching natural justice at every opportunity, and then to be, in effect, censured by this House. Now, we believe the Honourable Member for Farrer and myself and the Honourable Member for Morton for Hume, the Honourable Member for Hume and the Honourable Member for uh, Morton and myself, and I'm sure the Honourable Member for Flinders would associate himself with these remarks, but he's unfortunately not here. We believe that this was a travesty of justice from beginning to end, and it would be a considerable denial of the rights of free speech of members of this House, guaranteed under the Bill of Rights of 1689, if a member now were to be punished in this way that's proposed simply for exercising his rights of freedom of speech in this House. That is what the government is doing, and it should be ashamed of it, and the House should indicate its appalling re its a rejection of this motion with, uh, in no uncertain the terms. Time has expired. The Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I seek uh, leave to table two documents on behalf of the Committee of Privileges. Is leave granted? 
The, the two documents are the, uh, the minutes of proceedings granted. and the transcript uh, of evidence, is leave as granted. agreed to by the committee. Leave is granted. Thank you. I present a copy of the proof transcript of evidence taken during the inquiry, which the committee has authorised for publication, and a copy of the minutes of the committee's meetings on 30th November 1989. <laughs> Mr Speaker, as chairman of the Committee of Privileges, it would not be appropriate for me to argue the merits of the matter now before the House. Nevertheless, it may help the House if I recount to it the substance of the committee's report. In the report I presented on 30th November, the committee notes that the allegation contained in the speech by the honourable member for Bruce during grievance debate on 23 November amounted to a serious imputation against and personal reflection on the honourable member for Hotham, but that the circumstance of the speech created difficulties for the chair in the application of the rules of the House. The committee noted that there is often an inclination on the parts of members to bypass the correct forms of the House in the make, making of charges and allegations. The committee believed that it had not been charged with the responsibility of making a determination of the substance or otherwise of the statements in the statutory declaration which contained the allegation against the honourable member for Hotham. It noted that in the ultimate it did not have the capacity to conduct an authoritative investigation into the allegation itself. The committee reported to the House its conclusions that a, whilst acting on the basis of information presented to him, the honourable member for Bruce, if of the view that the allegation should have been brought before the House, should also have been alert to the requirement that such a matter ought to be put forward by means of a substantive motion open to to debate and which would admit a distinct vote of the House, b, as a matter of urgency the attention of all members should be drawn to the requirements of the standing orders and practices of the House which govern the matters of reflections on and charges against members, and c, the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. The committee found that having regard to the experience of the honourable member for Bruce, he had offended against the rules of the House. Accordingly, the committee recommended that the honourable member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for the serious breach. It recommended that the House require him to withdraw the allegation. The committee's report was accompanied by two dissenting reports. Those who have read the report and the dissenting reports will recognise that there was a measure of disagreement on the committee. I do not wish to go into the detail of the committee's operations now, but I would say that this case illustrates how difficult it can be for members of the House to make judgments about their fellow members. I wish to also emphasise the point made by the committee about the great privilege of freedom of speech. This privilege carries with it a very heavy responsibility. As members, we must be careful in our use of this privilege and in our use of the forms of the House. Freedom of speech is essential to the parliament and I do not think any member would deny this. Nevertheless, the community is entitled to expect a very high degree of responsibility and care in the raising of serious matters whether about members or other people. I do not wish to argue the merits of the present matter, but have sought only to recount the substance of the main report for the information of members. The honourable member for White Bay. Mr Speaker, it will not have escaped the attention of the House that my name is listed among those who supported the majority report to the parliament. For that reason alone, I think it appropriate that I say something. But I move beyond that to express my disenchantment that the presentation by the Honourable Member for Menzies might well be described as that sort of presentation that would be given by a learned man of the law on behalf of a client at considerable costs, not necessarily to secure him justice, but to ensure that he escaped it. Now, what are the simple facts of the matter? 
and I'm conscious that my friend, the Honourable Member for Bruce, is virtually at arm's length just beyond it, which might be a happy circumstance. <laughs> that he knows, as we know, over seven parliaments we get to know each other. That he came into this House with the firm intention of, to use the vernacular, tipping a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham. Does any member in this House, including the Honourable Member for Bruce, suggest for one moment that that was not the case? It goes without saying. He came to tip a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham, notwithstanding that Standing Order 76 clearly says all imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on members shall be considered highly disorderly. So he wittingly, knowingly, deliberately came in the House to defy that standing order, which is a cardinal standing order, should be firmly imprinted in the minds of every member coming into this House. If there's need to raise a matter which impugns directly or indirectly another member, there are forms of the House by which it might be done. But the Honourable Member for Bruce on this occasion decided that he would treat the forms of the House, dare I say it, with contempt. His particular mission was of greater importance than the forms of this House. So he embarked on an exercise which was characterised by a duplicity. The committee in its report to the House pointed out that it was difficult for the presiding officer to deal with the emerging contempt or defiance of standing orders because the Honourable Member Bruce, with almost an admirable cunning, knew the way to get around that particular problem was to use a statutory declaration which damned another member on this House, but with a delightful degree of anonymity. No names, no pack drill. But in the final seconds of his address, he said, with a retrospectivity with which his House is no stranger, that the public figure referred to was the Honourable Member for Hotham. Now, that was just as damning and just as telling as if he had started his delivery with the, the very statement that he was about to pour a bucket on the Honourable Member for Hotham. <laughs> so there can be no mistake about the intent and the effect. Now it has been put by the Honourable Member for Menzies that so there were a number of technical points, legal points, which should subvert, should Order. subvert the determination of the committee. For example, that the Speaker did not retire and give thought, and I, as acting speaker, had to do that very thing. And I did retire and give thought to whether it had been a breach of privilege, because it was a rather delicate and sensitive thing which was not of a proportion to reg be regaled by that description, a breach of privilege. My colleague in the rear seat was involved in that. But I, I came to the conclusion that the House was best served by consulting its dignity. And I think that was the best course of action. But on the other end of the spectrum, there could be a breach which instantly be recognised by all in the House and the Chair and the Speaker as a breach of privilege or containing the elements, the characteristics of a breach of privilege and did not have occasion to retire. His approval, endorsement of a referral to the Privileges Committee would be instant and automatic. And I suggest in this case that is what was done. There was no particular problem in having it referred to the committee. The allegation is made that the committee did not deal with the breach of privilege alleged. It did. There was a, a complaint that we did not say in our report that there was no breach of privilege. For heaven's sake, that was implicit, implicit in the report. We're a privileges committee. We'd addressed it. We did not report to the House there had been a breach of privilege, but we had dealt with another abuse of the forms of the House, which is clearly saying, implying, if you like. Perhaps in hindsight we should have been more specific, but it was implying that whilst there was not a breach of privilege, there was a misuse of the forms of the House. 
How nonsensical for the committee to go away and study this in very tight terms and simply come back and say there's no breach of privilege by inference. And it was contained in the honourable member for Menzies remarks. If we'd come back here and said there was no breach of privilege, that would tacitly endorse every subsequent abuse of the same nature. But the committee, if you like, assume the responsibility to point out the House that this is a course of action that could not be tolerated by the House and not, should not be supported by any member and therefore behoved us to address ourselves again to the standing orders to ensure that there is no abuse on another member of this House other than by the forms provided for it. And that, of course, is not necessarily seen in the first instance as an abuse but an imputation or a reflection. And in the ultimate, there may be substance, but that's for the House to determine by way of vote whether or not the motion carried substance. There a number of suggestions in the minority reports that the committee had been derelict. Yes, the committee had been derelict. I'm at the end of my seventh parliament, my final parliament, and I go back to whence I came. And I've tried to be an upright parliamentarian to concern myself with the truth. And just as I told a reporter who descended on me after the report had been furnished to the parliament, and he said, why, Mr Miller, did you align yourself with the government position? That offended me. Not in a personal way, but the very suggestion offended me. And I said to him, in the Privileges Committee, there should be no alignment with anything other than the facts and the truth. And that's the only alignment I would accept. And it grieves me to have to say to this House that for the first time, in a privileges committee, I was far from convinced that there was not a political motivation or a misplaced loyalty within that committee to bring around a divided conclusion on that committee. The House would be well served. My friend, the Honourable Member for Bruce, will be well served to acknowledge that he had misused the forms of the House, not breached privilege, misuse the forms of the House and to dignify this place that he should withdraw and apologise for his breach. The Honourable Member for McEwen. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on the speech he just made. In fact, it's very difficult to follow because he has said much that we would all agree within this House, irrespective of what side we sit on but which, because of partisan politics, is often not said. And there was indeed a fair degree of partisan politics entered into the committee's deliberations and findings, and allegations are being made uh, by some members of that committee. And in fact, it was a stacked committee that, in fact, natural justice was denied and that the honourable gentleman did not get a fair hearing. Now, I find that rather strange when a Queen's Council of the Victorian Bar, the member for Menzies, sat on that committee. I find it strange that he would say natural justice was denied when he has, in his capacity as a Queen's Council and a member of this House, just given a professional defence of the honourable gentleman. I find it strange that you would say natural justice was denied when the member for Flinders, a solicitor from Victoria, also sat on that committee and in his dissenting report has given a spirited defence of the honourable gentleman. I find it even stranger that one would say that natural justice was denied when the member for Sturt, the honourable Ian Wilson, who was a lawyer, was given permission and did appear before the committee to advise the member for Bruce on how he should respond to questions, one would assume, but he was there as an advisor. And yet we're told today by the member for Menzies, the member for Bruce was denied natural justice. Now, there are three competent, qualified lawyers, I would assume, who have been in a position to put a defence to assist the honourable member. And yet we're told in this house he was denied natural justice. 
frankly, that must only be partisan politics speaking. It cannot be any common sense approach to this difficult question. And the reality is, of course, Mr Speaker, that in the evidence that was given to the committee, the member for Bruce said in his opening statement, on oath, and I quote, I am somewhat at a loss to understand how Mr Holding came to believe that I raised allegations that the Honourable Member for Hotham was an agent of a foreign power and a traitor. I made no such allegations. Mr Holding's representations of what I said during the grievance debate of 23rd of November 1989 is a total misrepresentation of what I in fact said, and that is sworn evidence given to the committee by the Honourable Gentleman. And yet, when I took the opportunity as a member of that committee to ask this following question, Perhaps I could ask a question despite that answer, Mr Chairman. In your statement, Mr Aldred, you have just said that you are at a loss to understand how it can be said that you made any allegations that the Honourable Member for Hotham, Lewis Kent, was in the service of a foreign power. I draw your attention to the newspaper reports in the Sydney Morning Herald of the 24th November 1989, the Canberra Times, 24th November 1989, the Age, 24th November 1989, the Sydney Daily Telegraph, 24th November 1989, the Australian, 24th November 1989. All of those newspaper reports, all of those articles, say that you alleged in the House of Representatives those facts, and you have not sought a personal explanation in this House to deny that those newspaper reports are incorrect. Why have you not denied in the House that those reports alleging that you made those allegations are true? Mr Aldred replied, on oath, Mr Chairman, I have made my position perfectly clear. Now, what can one draw from that conclusion? What can one draw from that conclusion? Every newspaper reporter who sat in the gallery by invitation, quite right, by invitation by the Honourable Gentleman, every one of those reported that the member made those allegations. Every one of them in the newspapers. Now we know the forms of this House are such that if a report is given which is incorrect, you make at the most available moment a personal explanation to this House and you deny those reports. To this day, at this moment, the member for Bruce has not stood in this House and denied that those newspaper reports were inaccurate and did not reflect what he said in this House. Now, if any member of this House has been condemned by his own actions or lack of them, it is the member for Bruce. Totally condemned. And if you look at his evidence, and every member should read the transcript, it cannot be said that the gentleman comes into this debate with clean hands. Now, it has been said that he didn't get fair hearing. There was a, a court of there to put him into this position. And yet the member, his history, is consistent with this approach. And it is appropriate that I, as a member, and as a member of that committee, put to this House what that evidence is. Because it is relevant to his actions before the committee the evidence he gave to the committee and his actions up to this date. Now, back in March 1980, the member, together with the Victorian member of the Victorian Parliament, Don Saltmarsh, produced what was called a confidential report. It named people involved in drug trafficking, racketeering, gambling, prostitution and other activities, and he named industry leaders, trade union officials, politicians, never a Liberal politician, mind you, but Labor Party politicians, and police. Now, the reports were made available to the Victorian Police and the Australian Federal Police Force, and their finding? Rumour-mongering. Totally unsubstantiated. Rumour-mongering. We go to November 1983, and under parliamentary privilege, he asked the Prime Minister why the Prime Minister was involved 
in organised crime with casinos. No proof, no evidence, but under privilege, the Cowards Act. November 1983, again, along a similar vein, he alleged that the Prime Minister, when ACTU President, and Mr David Coombe held a secret meeting in New York with a Mafia boss. The so-called boss of Mr Sam Amarina, the proprietor of a coffee shop in the city, was approached by the Australian media and he was reported as saying, a couple of guys walked in and had coffee. I didn't know them. Whoever those guys were, they sure didn't look like no Prime Minister. But that's the basis of the allegation he's prepared to put to this House. That's the basis of it. In October 1983, right, he claimed he had ironclad evidence. Let's hear that, ironclad evidence of a pending backbench result of a vote among the government that would result in the overthrow of the Prime Minister. He said he had leaked documents, never produced, never saw the light of day, never substantiated. Again said in this place, Coward's Castle. In 1986, early 1986, he claimed to have evidence that Soviet spies were operating in southern Sweden and were active in gathering information on the Swedish the submarine for New England on a point of order. But 1986 has nothing to do with the Committee of Privileges report. I'd suggest this is a very serious matter, not one that should be now denigrated by a personal attack on the Honourable Member for Pearce. I think, I think the, the, the member for McEwen is giving examples of the behaviour of the member for Bruce and, and as such he is, I, would, I assume, is giving reasons that drew him to his conclusions on the committee and I find him in order. Mr Speaker. And he claimed that the Soviet spies were acting in gathering information on the Swedish submarine builder Cockham's. He used this, again, undocumented, unsubstantiated rumour if it isn't rumour, because he probably made it up himself, for a call for the reopening of Defence Department tenders for the then proposed to build submarines for the Royal Australian Navy. He further claimed Cockham's were mounting a disinformation program and a campaign with the aim of discrediting anyone raising those criticisms against their dockyard. Can you imagine a major international company not exercising in some kind of public relations exercise when his claims would cost them billions of dollars? never substantiated, treated by this parliament as a joke, but did not prevent the member, does not prevent him from making such outrageous, unproved and unsubstantiated claims. In June 1986, again underprivileged, the honourable gentleman made allegations that the late Mr Justice Lionel Murphy had a secret meeting for unknown and unstated reasons with crime czar Abe Saffron. Murphy denied the allegation, as did Saffron, we never saw any evidence, any substantiation, nothing that would prove that allegation, and yet it did not prevent this gentleman from standing in this house under privilege from making that claim. In May 1986, in a triumph of distortion and misinformation, the gentleman alleged that a commander of the Australian Federal Police had issued an instruction to staff not to pursue investigations into illegal migrants. Apparently, in the view of the honourable gentleman, this issue became translated into the claim that the government was leaving the way open for Australians to become a haven for Chinese triad groups. In fact, the honourable gentleman had misread or misinterpreted a directive which had been issued and which said, and I quote, drug trafficking and organised crime were to be the Australian Federal Police Force's major priorities. He wasn't far out. He wasn't far out. You're quite right. The, the honourable member for McEwen might um, quickly get to the point. Uh, that the made. point is, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm the speaker, that this gentleman, the Honourable Member for Bruce, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry, does not come into this House and cannot give evidence to a parliamentary committee claiming that he does not know what he is doing. He cannot, in any honesty or with any integrity at all, claim that he either has a distorted view of the world, a conspiracy theory that everyone is out to get everyone else, or he just frankly does not understand the expression relevance. Anyone who has a history 
and I haven't finished his history, such as the member for Bruce, as a member of this House has, who is believed by anyone, you'd really have to question anyone's integrity who believed anything he said. And are now, on this occasion, to give sworn evidence before a privileges committee that he did not make those claims against the member concerned on that history, how can this House believe the gentleman? How can this House? And if there is going to be any integrity at all, and if this House will ever get to the stage where people stop tipping buckets on each other, then the House has to make some stand itself. Because it is not difficult to tip buckets. It is not difficult at all. It would not be difficult for me to make allegations against the member for Flinders involved in a cherry picking scheme. Order. It would not the, be difficult for me the to make similar McEwen, allegations. In well, the I go spirit no further of this debate, the Honourable Member for McEwen might just withdraw that. I, well, I had made no allegations other than mention a name, but if it's offensive, I withdraw, Mr Speaker. But I make the point, it is not difficult for anyone, for anyone, to make allegations against other members and drop buckets. And I don't. And I won't. I have files on people from information which gets given to me, which I could stand up and drop buckets, but I won't. And I find it offensive, as a member of this House, that it is so easy for some other members to use the privilege they have of free speech to do it. Because, as the Leader of the House says, that privilege did not come easily to the Parliament. It was fought for in the Bill of Rights in the 1600s. It should not be abused because if the House abuses that right of free speech, then ultimately this Parliament diminishes in importance and in value. And I would support strongly the motion and I would urge the member to comply with the forms of the House and withdraw the allegation. And I'd respect him if he did so. The Honourable Member for Morton. Thank you very much, um, Mr Speaker. The committee's report uh, in part C refers to, and I quote from it, the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it a heavy obligation that it be exercised with great care and responsibility and that the misuse of this privilege in making charges against other persons, whether members or not, could be held by the House to be not only an abuse but a contempt. It is proper to refer to the fact that the Privileges Committee did not find that there had been a contempt. I re refer particularly to the fact that that paragraph alludes to the realities that a reflection on members of this place and people outside this place can command the same gravity of seriousness if improperly used. The member for Wide Bay, in his comments before, asserted that the member for Bruce had come into this place for the purpose of tipping a bucket on the member for Hotham. Indeed, in the cross-examination of the member for Bruce, I did make an observation by way of a question that uh, I didn't believe that the member for Bruce had actually come into this place on that day to enhance the reputation of the member for Hotham. I made that comment. I, I recall it well. I have known the member for Hotham since he entered this place in, I think, about 1980, and I've known the member for Bruce since he entered this place in the 1970s. And to be placed in a position of making judgments on the contents of either direct or indirect allegations is always difficult. And there's always that danger of, of one allowing 
personal associations to cloud judgment. In this instance, I am not without respect for the member for Bruce and I am not without respect for the member for Hotham. The vast majority of Australians have little understanding of the power that they place in our hands when they elect representatives to this place. We have the power to make or break people in terms of what we say in this place. We can build a reputation and we can destroy a reputation. And it behoves each and every one of us to never forget that we possess a power which belongs to the rest of the community only for a passing moment should they be in a court situation and be in a situation whereby they can say what they feel or like. And then the court judges the veracity of the truth. But we have that power all the time. And therefore, we have that obligation to never improperly use it. I, Mr Speaker, have been here for a period in excess of 20 years, and it is a rare occasion that I have used the mechanism that indeed was used by the member for Bruce in that statutory declaration that he read into this place. In about May 1978, I named a member at the end of a speech. The last two words that I uttered were that person's name because that was a mechanism that I could use to say what I felt and I'm absolutely positive that if I'd used the mechanism of a substantive motion, that the government of the day would have clouted me and gagged me. And these mechanisms exist to allow people to come in this place and as long as they honestly hold a view, as long as they believe in what they're saying, as long as they've discharged the responsibility of doing as much checking on the facts as they possibly can, I see nothing wrong with a person, if they genuinely and honestly believe something, in using the privilege that the people of our electorates and the people of this nation have given us. Now, I do not seek to make a judgment on the allegations which were contained in that statutory declaration. I have a view, perhaps, but I am in no position, nor was the Privileges Committee in a position to judge the truth of it all. We walked away from that quite happily and judged ourselves as not having the confidence, the competence to make judgments. And not having made that judgment, Mr Speaker, we have now put ourselves in a position that not only do we find findings which are against the member for Bruce, and I remind this House or inform this House that in many ways I was happy to go along with reminding this parliament and members of their obligations in terms of the use of the procedures of this place. But when we reach a stage where we demand of the member for Bruce, we demand of the member for Bruce that he apologise to the House for his serious breach and that and we recommend that the House requires him to withdraw the allegation. And then we are looking today at saying to him that if he doesn't fulfil the requirements, that we will move that he be suspended for the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. I just wonder whether or not we've gone truly overboard. I have been in this place and seen members of the previous government side, and I'm not saying it, misuse of any procedure belongs to any side of the House, 
but I have seen reputations sullied, the people from the outside world sullied time and time again, particularly in relation to taxation matters, and people get away with it, and the people outside squirming and calling for an opportunity to clear their name, and yet this parliament did not see a reason for references to the Privileges Committee or reason to make judgments on member, one in particular, who in those days sat on this side of the House. Suddenly there is great indignation. Suddenly it's terrible and suddenly the member for Bruce has to be brought to account for his actions. We in the committee could not find that a breach of privilege actually existed. And yet we are here today making recommendations or the, the government with its motion is making a recommendation that the member for Bruce be subjected to banishment from this place for two days unless he says sorry. Well, Mr Speaker, I have the view that if the member for Bruce is one who misuses, abuses or carelessly uses the forms of this House, his jury lies back in his electorate. There's a second unofficial jury and they, are, they constitute the members of his party, of the Liberal Party, who subject him to his pre-selection. Now, if the member for Bruce genuinely and honestly believes that there is a matter to be, to be pursued in this place in the name of the nation's security or in the name of the security of an ethnic group in this country, as long as he has fulfilled the obligations of properly researching and not carelessly researching, that only the test of time will give us the answer. The member for Hotham is unlike the victims of so many people whose reputation or people from outside whose reputations have been sullied by attacks in this place. Because the member for Hotham sits here with the same privileges that I have that the member for Hotham that every other individual in this place possesses and that is the right to stand up and to defend. That is something that we are very privileged to possess, and something which, as I've already said, is something which does not belong to the vast majority of the people. We listened to the member for McEwen before, and he couldn't help himself. One of the jury but he couldn't help himself digging the knife in a couple of times along the road during his speech when he uttered the words, when he referred to a rumour and said, or, or some other matter that the member for Bruce had raised in previous years, referred to it as a rumour and then said that the member for Bruce, quote, had probably made it up. And then made some aspersion about some cherry picking and the member for Flinders that I've never heard of. See, that's the nature of this place. That's the nature of this place. And what we are about to do, or what we are being asked to do, is to condemn a member of this place for using a mechanism, for uttering a form of words that have now been judged as an imputation without those imputations having been subjected to analysis by us who are making the recommendations in the, the original report, here we are setting ourselves up while some of us who are on the jury can't even resist repeating in part what we are about or this House will probably by virtue of political numbers condemn on Christmas Eve the member for Bruce for having done. And I just say those words and the member from Western Australia there may sit and laugh but the reality is that what we are doing today is saying tut tut, naughty naughty, evil evil for, some, for 
uh, to a member who has done something that is simply being judged as being more serious by virtue of the implications for the member for Hotham than what other people have done on so many previous occasions. All I ask for, Mr Speaker, is absolute consistency, utter consistency. The Speaker of the day or the acting Speaker of the day should have, and there's no excusing this, by a form of words which refers to the acting Speaker having found himself or herself in a situation of difficulty. Because the rules of this House, if they are such that what the member for Bruce had done should have been expunged or been withdrawn, the Speaker of the day should have cut in, whether it be then or later, and said, hey, you must withdraw that, or I call on the member for Bruce to withdraw those, those words, or, or that document that's been tabled should never have been tabled. We cannot excuse, and I don't say this disrespectfully for one moment, we cannot excuse an oversight on the part of the chair by saying that it was made difficult by the member for Bruce. Because I think this is germane to it. The chair, whether it had been then or later, should have stood up in this place and said, this is judged as contravention of standing order. I think it is 76, 76 and therefore I require of you to withdraw it. So if mistakes were made on the day, they do not belong solely to the member for Bruce. There is a shared responsibility, and I conclude on the remarks that saying that people like the late Kevin Hooper, the Labor man from Queensland, years ago stood in that Queensland parliament making allegations that there was corruption in, in, in certain elements in Queensland. And he wasn't wrong. OK, and I tell you what, if the Kevin Hoopers in this world had been silenced from the start, a lot of things which eventually did come out would never have come out. And, Mr Speaker, I treat the privilege that is given to me as an utter privilege, and I just hope that we don't go recklessly and with a gay abandon into sentencing a man and punishing him for doing something that so many of others have done in the past. The Honourable Member for Hughes. Uh, uh, <coughs> Mr Speaker, uh, many things have been said in the course of this debate, uh, which I don't intend to go over again. But I would like to raise a number of matters that I think are important uh, for each and every individual member of this House to consider. And I put it in those terms because it seems to me that this is a debate uh, very much uh, about the role of the parliament. And each and every one of us as parliamentarians has got to decide what stand we're going to take on this issue. I must say it was a matter of uh, some concern that the member for Menzies rose in his place at the commencement of this debate and said that the opposition opposes this motion. Well, Mr Speaker, I can't believe that this is a matter that has been caucused on by the opposition uh, at this date, uh, and uh, I can't believe that the parliamentarians on the opposition benches, of whom there are a considerable number and whom the member for Wide Bay uh, stands as preeminent, I cannot believe that parliamentarians will, in some mindless way, uh, raise their hands in support of the, uh, the views that have been put by the member for Menzies, because they are neither, because they are neither uh, true, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, nor, they, nor do they, I believe, uh, have any moral foundation. The report that's been brought down by the Privileges Committee uh, is only two pages. Uh, it is not a weighty document. It is not a report that seeks to vilify uh, the, uh, the member who was the subject uh, of the allegation. Uh, it is not a report that seeks to impose some uh, draconian penalty on the honourable member. It is a report which is moderate, which is balanced, but which seeks to uphold the preeminent position of the parliament and the standing orders and practices of the parliament. And I'll just briefly remind uh, members uh, of the three elements of that, re that report. Uh, the first one, of course, was that the member for Bruce ought to have been alert to the requirement 
that such a matter ought to be put forward by means of a substantive motion open to debate and which would admit a distinct vote of the House. Now, the member has been a member of the House of Representatives for approximately 10 years. He's not a new member, he's not an experienced member, and uh, as we've heard uh, from some of the remarks that have been made in the course of this debate, uh, he is well versed uh, in parliamentary techniques. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a long-standing practice of this House, based on the practices of the House of Commons, based on long parliamentary traditions, that that standing order be observed. Mr Deputy Speaker, furthermore, Standing Order 76 of the House of Representatives is crystal clear. It is probably the most quoted standing order in the parliament, and that is that all imputations of improper motives and all personal reflections on members shall be considered highly disorderly. And the member for Wide Bay uh, has uh, told uh, far better than I am able to do so the, the uh, sequence of events that led to uh, the member raising these matters in the House and the fact that the naming of the member occurred in almost the last sentence of his speech. Now, I believe that it is open on any reasonable interpretation of what occurred uh, to uh, view the method of delivering that speech as a calculated uh, attempt to uh, effectively ambush whoever might be in the chair at that particular time. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is also a matter of fact, of which this House is entitled to take notice, that within 15 minutes uh, of the member making his contributions in the House of Representatives, attacking the member for Hotham, substantially the same matters, within 15 minutes, were raised in the Senate. Now, that may, of course, just be uh, purely a matter of coincidence. It happened to have been raised by a senator of the same political party from the same state. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the second matter that the uh, majority committee uh, looked to uh, was the uh, view that members ought to have their attention drawn to the standing order to orders and practices of the House which govern uh, matters of reflection and charges against members. So, in other words, the view of the committee sought to raise the tenor of debate and recognise the importance of proper debate within this parliamentary chamber. And the third thing that was in that majority report, of which uh, I was a party, was that the great privilege of freedom of speech carries with it heavy obligations that should be exercised with great care and responsibility and uh, went on to say uh, that the member, having regard to his experience, had offended against the rules of the House. And accordingly, the committee recommends that the member should, at the first parliamentary opportunity, be required to apologise to the House for the serious breach and recommends that the House requires him to withdraw that allegation. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, as you can see, that is a moderate, a balanced report, one which seeks to do justice in this case. Uh, and uh, one which I believe the House ought to adopt. Now, by way of comparison, there are two minority reports, two minority reports uh, which in their totality are of nine pages in length as compared with the balanced majority report of only two pages. You can search and read and reread those dissenting reports by the member for Flinders and the member for Menzies. You will not find one single word, one single word that in any way is even the, in, to any degree the most uh, mildly critical of the actions of the member for Bruce. Not one single word. Those minority reports are all about uh, a political attack, I believe, on the majority of members of that committee who included the member for Wide Bay. I do not believe that any parliamentarian on any rational reading of that report, both majority and minority, uh, could uh, support the minority view. Now, Mr uh, Deputy, Mr Speaker, uh, I, uh, in the, together with many other members, in the course of the, uh, elevated again, in the course of the uh, a, uh, questions asked of Mr Aldred, uh, focused on the question of whether or not there had been imputations of improper motives or personal reflections. And Mr Aldred said uh, that 
he did not believe that the standing orders had been breached. Well, I uh, just uh, again uh, refer to matters referred to by the member for McEwen. Just about every major newspaper in this country uh, took the view that the import of uh, the member for Bruce's uh, speech was to accuse the member for Hotham of spy links, uh, to uh, accuse, uh, uh, again, uh, links with spies, links with Yugoslav secret police, and so it goes on. Now, I ask every member of this House to put themselves in the position of the member for Hotham. And I have a view that most people who come into this chamber, in fact, almost all, uh, come here basically as fairly committed people, people basically of integrity. And all of us make mistakes from time to time. When we go overboard, we make errors of judgment. But I ask every member to put themselves in the position of the member for Hotham. Can you imagine to pick up the morning papers and find what has, uh, by any, uh, any interpretation, been an attempt to blacken your name, to besmirch your name, to tear down your reputation? Can you imagine the consequences of that for you, in your electorate, with your family, with your friends? Can you imagine what happens to a person who's been subject to that abuse? Well, the member for Reid can. And the member for Reid, in a very dispassionate and reasoned contribution in this House, reminded us of the hurt that such unsubstantiated and damaging allegations can make to a person. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I, I repeat uh, that I do believe that the, the uh, majority report is quite balanced, and for that reason I urge the House to support it. I would, however, alert the House to two precedents where the attention of the House has been drawn to breaches of the standing orders subsequent to uh, the occurrence of that breach. And, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, we on this side of the chamber are not immune uh, from having uh, people tip buckets. And of course, uh, uh, Bert James and Eddie Ward were preeminent uh, in uh, that role and developed to an art form. But what happened, of course, on uh, two occasions uh, when uh, the then speaker was alerted to the fact that there had been a breach of the standing orders, even though that had occurred on a prior occasion, the speaker quite uh, properly in the Parliament and the House intervened to insist th that there was a withdrawal of those matters. And in this case, uh, the House is taking that initiative. It is an initiative based on precedent. It is one based on morality and in the traditions of this Parliament. And I would hope that all parliamentarians on the opposition benches would vote according to their consci consciences and not according to the party dictates. Thank the House. The Honourable Member for Bruce. For Bruce. Mr Speaker, in this chamber on the 23rd of November last at 12.30, uh, I spoke in the grievance debate. On the same day, the Minister for the Arts, some two and a half hours later, raised a matter of privilege concerning my speech uh, in the grievance debate. As a result of the matter of privilege uh, raised, the House resolved to refer the matter to the Committee of Privileges. In the very late hours of uh, the 27th of November, I received a letter dated that day from the Chairman of the Committee of Privileges, the member for Canning. The letter said, and I quote, the committee has agreed to the following resolution with regard to the reference. One, that the allegation referred to it comprised the address made to the House by the member for Bruce on the 23rd of November 1989, recorded at Hansard page 2804 to 2806. Two, that the allegation by the Honourable Member for Bruce concerns the character and conduct of the Honourable Member for Hotham in his capacity as a member of the House. Three, that Mr Alder would be invited to address the committee at the earliest opportunity. And that's the end of the quote from the letter. Mr Speaker, four o'clock on the 28th of November, the following day, and less than 24 hours after receiving the letter, was suggested as the time for me to first appear before the Committee of Privileges. With regard to the resolution spelt out in the Chairman's letter, it is important for me uh, at the outset, uh, Mr Speaker, to draw to the attention of the House the gross misrepresentations made by the Minister for the Arts when he raised the matter of privilege. I should add that I also brought this very same matter to the attention of the Committee of Privileges during my first appearance before them. At Hansard page 2837 of the 23rd of November, 
The Minister of the Arts says, and I quote, it has been suggested by innuendo and by direct statement that the Honourable Member for Hotham is virtually an agent of a foreign power. That is the allegation. It is simple and direct as that." Uh, end of quote. But Hansard on the same page, the Minister of the Arts says, and I quote, "'What more prima facie case can one have than someone saying that a member of this parliament is a traitor not merely to this institution but also to his country?' That is the allegation." End of the further quote from the Minister. Mr Speaker, as I told the uh, committee during my first appearance, I am at a loss to understand how the Minister of the Arts came to believe that I raised allegations that the member for Hotham was an agent of a foreign power and a traitor. I made no such allegations. The Minister for the Arts' uh, representation of what I said during the grievance debate on the 23rd of November last is a total and gross misrepresentation of what I in fact said. In concluding my remarks, uh, Mr Speaker, to the Committee of Privileges during my appearance before them on the 28th of November last, I also asked the Committee whether the Minister of the Arts should disqualify himself from the Committee for the purposes of the inquiry, in view of the fact that it was he who raised the matter of privilege and because of the manner in which he had raised it. The question of whether the Minister for the Arts was an appropriate person to serve on the Committee and whether, in fact, his presence on the Committee was properly constitutional given that he was appointed by the Leader of the House after the inquiry had already started, is addressed in some detail by the member for Flinders in his dissenting report of the 30th of November. Mr Speaker, the 23rd of November I received a further letter from the Chairman of the Committee of Privileges. I noted from the letter that the Committee had the day before passed a resolution in the following terms, and I quote, that Mr Aldred be invited to appear before the Committee at 8.30am tomorrow to make uh, any further statement and to answer any questions in respect of his use of the procedures uh, this House during the grievance debate on the 23rd of November. End of the quote from the letter. Um, Mr, uh, Mr Speaker, it was the substance of the matters dealt with uh, by me in my address of the 23rd of November which were referred to the Committee of Privileges for consideration and not the procedures of the House during the address referred to. As I said to the committee during my second appearance on the 30th of November, it is my submission that my use of the procedures of the House is a matter for the Speaker and not one which was referred to the Committee of Privileges by the House when it resolved, and I quote, that the allegation against the Honourable Member for Hotham be referred to the Committee of Privileges, end of quote. Furthermore, uh, Mr Speaker, during my second appearance, I also brought to the attention of the committee the findings of the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Privilege, that is, the final report of October 1984 as contained in Recommendation 21. As I said to the committee at the time, though this recommendation has not yet been adopted by the House, it, or the version adopted by the Senate, should in practice be followed by the House of Representatives Committee of Privileges. In particular, I draw the notice of the committee uh, recommendations uh, 21C, D, F, G and I. Recommendation 21C says, and I quote, issues before the committee should be adequately defined so that a person or organisation against whom a complaint has been made is reasonably apprised of the nature of the complaint he has to meet." End of quote. At no stage, Mr Speaker, did the committee precisely define the matters it proposed to deliberate on, thus denying me the basic right to be informed of the committee's concerns. Recommendation 21D says, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have a reasonable time for the preparation of an answer to that complaint, end of quote. This recommendation raised two points. Firstly, as per recommendation 21C, the complaint was never precisely defined. And secondly, I was certainly not given a reasonable time to answer anything. Recommendation 21F and G say, uh, respectively, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have the right to adduce evidence relevant to the issues." End of quote. And, I quote further, a person or organisation against whom a complaint is made should have the right to cross-examine witnesses subject to a discretion of the committee to exclude cross-examination on matters it thinks ought fairly to be excluded, such as matters of a scandalous, improper, peripheral or prejudicial nature. End of quote. Mr Speaker, it is suffice to say that the committee denied me both these rights. Finally, uh, recommendation 21I says, and I quote, a person or organisation against whom a complaint has been made 
shall be entitled to full legal representation and to examine or to cross-examine witnesses through such representation and to present submissions to the committee through such representation." End of quote. Mr Speaker, this right was also denied me, despite my asking the committee on two separate occasions for time to retain and brief counsel on a full professional basis. Mr Speaker, one utterance made by the Minister for the Arts on the 23rd of November least was, uh, was at least correct. He said, and I quote, there is much learning on the whole question of privileges. Most of it uh, is to be found not in this House, but in the House of Commons, and I, uh, end of quote. And on this rare occasion, uh, Mr Speaker, I find myself in agreement uh, with the Minister. However, despite this House lacking any detailed learning on the matter of privilege, it will be apparent to you and any others who have read the uh, committee's uh, report that I did not commit a breach of privilege. Mr Speaker, there are a number of serious matters emanating from the report of the Committee of Privileges that the House needs to address. Given that you are the protector of the rights of members, uh, Mr Speaker, I ask for your advice on the following matters. However, before I do, I'd ask all honourable members to also carefully consider the matters I'm about to raise as they are indeed uh, very serious. Firstly, was the motion of reference valid or invalid? Secondly, was the committee properly constituted. Thirdly, the member for Menzies at paragraph 11 in his dissenting report says into Alia, and I quote, the majority report reaches no conclusions on whether a breach of privilege has been committed. As such, it has failed to discharge its responsibility to the House. This point is one that all members need to personally address. It is my contention that on reading the majority report uh, that no breach of privilege was found uh, to have occurred and therefore the committee has in fact to fail to discharge its responsibility to the House. Fourthly, the uh, member for Menzies at paragraph 12 in his dissenting report also raised the matter of whether the Committee of Privileges has any jurisdiction to deal with a breach of the rules of the House, as they have done in their report. I therefore ask, Mr Speaker, does the Committee of Privileges have the authority to deal with an alleged breach of the rules of the House or anything else other than the actual matter referred to it by the House? Fifthly, did the Committee of Privileges precisely define the matters which it proposed to deliberate on? And if so, do you consider that I was informed on those matters? Six, is it the usual practice of the Committee to obtain uh, uh, legal advice from the Clerk of the House? I'd ask you to particularly address that question, Mr Speaker. Seventhly, given that committee members intimately left the room whilst I was giving evidence, do you consider that those committee members uh, that did so were in a position to actively participate in the committee's final decision? In considering this point, let me inform the House that at times when I was giving evidence, the committee room was as busy as uh, Flinders Street uh, Railway Station in the rush hour. I am sure that all members would agree that anyone appearing to give evidence before a court of law is entitled to a fair hearing. That is, after all, what natural justice is all about. How would it be, for instance, if a judge of the federal court were to absent himself from the courtroom uh, while the subject of the hearing was given evidence to then reappear to deliver a verdict? It would make an absolute mockery of our whole system of justice. Eighthly, are you satisfied that the committee was competent to conduct the inquiry in the terms agreed by the House, given the matters raised by the member Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph three, subparagraphs B, C, D and E? Ninthly, I take it the member for uh, the member doesn't want uh, answers to his rhetorical questions now. Not now, no, Mr. Speaker. But I would ask you, to, I would ask you to deliberate and consider these questions. Well, I, I would imagine if the member wished to have uh, the member for Bruce wanted answers to those questions, maybe the proper way would have been to have communicated with me in writing rather than raising them uh, in this debate. He might well, want to. Mr. Uh, he Mr. might Speaker, at some later date uh, place the matter in writing to me and I'll consider what he has to say. Uh, Mr Speaker, I only have uh, two more no, questions to go and they are part of my, uh, my participation in this important debate and I would seek your leave just to uh, put on the record the remaining few questions that I have. But you have the call. You can... Thank you. Ninthly, are you entirely satisfied that the committee itself in no way breached the Parliamentary Privileges Act, given the point raised by the member Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph 3, subparagraph H? Ten, 
uh, tensely, are you concerned at the matter raised by the member for Flinders in his dissenting report at paragraph 3, subparagraph I, that the majority were not prepared to give adequate time to those members of the committee who indicated that they wished to lodge a minority report? Eleventhly, is it the usual practice of the Committee of Privileges to prepare and circulate the outline and substance of the committee's majority report prior to the subject of the committee's inquiry completing his or her evidence? In reaching a, a point on this point, Mr Speaker, you and honourable members might uh, like to consider the consequences for the principle of a fair hearing and natural justice if such a practice uh, were to occur in our court system. Thankfully, uh, it doesn't occur here. Only in places like Romania would such practice be considered. Finally, uh, given the very serious matters raised in the dissenting reports and the points I have just raised, I ask you, Mr Speaker, and all honourable members, do you sincerely believe I was accorded natural justice? Mr Speaker, the completion of my grievance speech on the 23rd of November, I sought and was granted leave to table the statutory declaration from which I read. At the time of tabling, no point of order was taken against me. Furthermore, no point of order, Mr Speaker, or other objection was made during my speech or the tabling of the document by the Minister in charge of the House at the time, or for that matter, by any other member present. Additionally, uh, Mr Speaker, the Deputy Speaker in the chair at the time could have examined the document and ruled on whether or not it could be tabled. However, the Deputy Speaker did not prevent me tabling the document. To say that I created difficulties for the chair is therefore not an argument that can be sustained. Mr Speaker, I earlier referred to the gross misrepresentation of what I said on the 23rd of November last by the Minister for the Arts. On this matter, I also seek your advice. Were the gross misrepresentations of my speech by the Minister for the Arts a breach of privilege? Finally, uh, Mr Speaker, as the Committee of Privileges has itself said that it does not have the capacity to conduct an authoritative investigation into the allegation itself. I wish to inform the House that as a result, I will therefore be handing in a notice of motion that will address the issue of the activities of the Yugoslav Secret Service in Australia. The Honourable Minister for the Arts and Territories. Mr Speaker, there is probably no more difficult role for any member of this House, or for any House of Parliament, than to sit upon a Privileges Committee. Because although these committees fortunately meet rarely, they are entrusted with very difficult tasks and they have to face, in this particular case, the difficult task of judging one of their colleagues, affording him the benefit of the doubt and trying to fulfil the obligations which the House itself, by deliberative vote, had referred to it. It's a matter of deep regret for me that the Honourable Member for Menzies chose to use terms which, in my view, in describing the activities of the committee as a star chamber, were not merely jaundiced, coloured, but were an essentially an intemperate exercise in legal obfuscation. So let's go to the issues of the day. Let's see how these matters arose. And what are the matters that the now House now has to determine? I find it strange, and indeed I find it difficult to comprehend, that the Honourable Member for Bruce now says that I had not only misrepresented, but obviously grievously misrepresented his allegations in the House concerning the Honourable Member for Hotham. Let's look to the statements made by the Honourable Member to see whether, in fact, one could reasonably deduce that I, in fact, had either innocently or deliberately misrepresented his position. The Honourable Gentleman at page 2805 of Hansard speaks of the activities of the Yugoslav Secret Service in Melbourne. And he says, uh, he's going to quote uh, from an affidavit, and he says, I've interviewed both the person who'd sworn the affidavit and his informant at length about the contents of the document that I'm about to read. Now, weigh that heavily. This is not a, a statement by, by an honourable member saying, well, look, I, I found an affidavit and it fell off a truck and uh, I'm not certain whether it's uh, true or false, 
but nevertheless, in, as a matter of public interest, I feel I ought to read it out. That's not the situation at all. What we were assured by the honourable gentleman was that he had spoken to both these informants. He was satisfied of their veracity. He referred to the person who swore it as a prominent and respected identity of the Melbourne Croatian community. Now, one is asked, one is, I believe, able to ask the House, well, does the honourable member, does the honourable member uh, for Bruce adopt the statements as being true or being false? If they were false, he should not have adopted them. But he then proceeded to read them out. And what does the affidavit say? It says that the activities of the SDB or the Yugoslav Secret Service is, a, is apparent. It talks of people living in fear, fear of physical violence and indeed of death. The allegation is that a certain official of the M Yugoslav Embassy uh, was an agent of the Yugoslav Secret Service. And then at the very last moment, the point at which the honourable gentleman resumes his seat is to make the specific allegation that the person who was connected with that Yugoslav agent was the honourable member for Hoffman. Now, I was the duty minister at the earlier part of the honourable member's speech, and he was making allegations about some Yugoslav organisation. And I then left the House, and I believe that what then occurred, I mean, there were difficulties for the chair, uh, there was an exchange of ministers on duty as the honourable member hadn't reached this part of his evidence and when he says uh, he'd tabled the document, he'd already read the document out. The damage had already been done and uh, it's already been suggested and properly so that there are ample precedents where the House or the Chair may be in error by virtue of a set of circumstances that occurs in the House. It's open, it's open to the House. Order, the honourable member for point of order on, on point a matter of, order. of fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. West uh, uh, was present throughout my entire There's speech. There's no point of order. The honourable minister to, the to correct that. So, if some two and a half hours later, when I raise the nature of the allegations made by the honourable gentleman, and I repeat the basis of the head of privilege under which I raised them, that if they were true then the Honourable Member for Hotham could not adequately and properly discharge his duties as a member of this House. And that, and that is clearly a head of privilege. And that argument was accepted unanimously by the House. Unanimously. And let me say this. If I misrepresented the Honourable Member for Bruce, why did he not raise in his place on that occasion to say that I had misrepresented him. That was not his intention. It, there was a mistake being made. He had never intended to suggest what was implied. Uh, and I made it quite clear. He was clearly indicating that, in his view, the Honourable Member for Hotham was involved in activities with the Yugoslav Secret Police. The Honourable Member for, for Bruce, in fact, rose in the House. He had a parliamentary opportunity. But did he rise to say that I had misrepresented his position? Not a bit of it. If you look at Hansard, he rose in order to see if he could lodge another affidavit. That's what occurred. Now, let me deal with the proceedings of the committee and the intemperate, and the intemperate, or the intemperate statements made that somehow this committee acted as a star chamber. Let me say this, that I believe the majority of members of this committee and who wrote this report gave it a great deal of time, probably a great deal more time than it, that it deserved, having regard for the general attitude that the honourable member for Aldred adopted towards the members of the committee. Because you see, when you examine the transcript, when you examine the transcript, what honourable members might not be aware of, the committee decided as a matter of discretion, as it was open to it, not because it was a right for the honourable member for Hotham. They decided, as a matter of discretion, if he wanted the assistance of uh, his legally trained colleague, the honourable member for Benighton, that would be available to him. Sturt. But if what we are doing... Order. The Minister I'm sorry, the honourable member for Sturt. And if what we are doing is saying, well, now, we must adopt the processes, 
that we see in our courts, because the honourable member is very keen on the processes as they occur in our courts. I spent some 17 years in various courts in this land. I have never seen a process where when you ask, as we ask the honourable member for a hopper, how long have you been a member of this house? There is wink, wink, nod, nod, a conversation with his legal adviser and after some uh, 30 seconds, well, three quarters of a minute, he then proceeds to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one asks him what is a fairly simple question with which I would have thought any, any honourable member who's try, trying to deal with, some, uh, with, with a candid response to his parliamentary colleagues to resolve this matter, when you say to him, do you understand the standing orders? It's wink, wink, nod, nod, more consultation, and after about another 30 seconds, the answer is yes. <laughs> and then when you say to the honourable member, well, and it's absolutely germane, what was his intention when he came in with this affidavit? Did you intend uh, to damage the honourable member for Hotham? We could have got a candid yes or no, but wink, wink, nod, nod, um, and the answer then comes no. And then when you say, well, what did you intend to do? Wink, wink, nod, nod. A much longer period of consultation. I don't believe I should answer that question. <laughs> and you see, it's not as if this committee didn't give the honourable gentleman every opportunity. You see, it's not just the honourable gentleman that's on trial here today. And he's not on trial. He's being asked to comply with the standing orders is to be asked if he'll behave with some sense of honour in terms of this parliament and this institution. It is this institution, it is members of the opposition who are as much on trial as members of the government. Because, you see, if you want to support the honourable member for Hotham in his suggestions that somehow, or Bruce, the honourable member for Bruce, that somehow he has been grievously misunderstood and badly treated, that he didn't really intend to say all these things, then the first thing you've got to ask yourself, as an intelligent politician, and there are a few of them in this chamber, was it an accident? Was it an accident on the very same day in a matter of hours, his parliamentary colleague from Victoria, Senator Short, in another place, is making precisely the same allegation and he can't proceed with it because it was contrary to the standing orders of the Senate. Have a look at the Senate debate. Have a look at the attempt that was made there. And you are invited to believe that that was somehow a political coincidence. Well, uh, in case we should have misjudged uh, the honourable member, I'm not giving him an opportunity. It was brought to the attention of members of the committee because there aren't many secrets in this parliamentary institution. It was suggested to members of the committee that members of the press gallery had been informed prior to this gentleman making his speech that uh, they ought to be present because he was really going to give uh, the treatment to the honourable member for Hoffman. Now, is that a fact or isn't it? Because, you see, it goes to the question of intent. If it was never his intent to do damage to the honourable member for Hopper, then it couldn't possibly be true that he would be approaching a member of the press gallery uh, to suggest that he was going to, to use the terms of the honourable member for Wide Bay, drop a bucket. Well, what more can you do to try and establish the innocence or otherwise of this honourable gentleman. And in the, if you look at the transcript at page 50, the question is put very simply and very directly. And I put it, and I put it on the basis that it might be to his benefit. It would be to your benefit, would it not, if it were totally untrue that you had approached a member of the press 
or members of the press prior to making your speech to inform them that you were going to attack the member for Hotham, would it not be to your benefit if that were totally untrue to deny it here and now? To deny it here and now. And I say to honourable gentlemen opposite, if in fact that was totally untrue, it was just one of the rumours that run around this place, wouldn't it have been of advantage to the honourable member to say there's not a skerrick of truth in it? And have a look at the honourable gentleman's answer. He was not prepared to deny on oath the veracity of that allegation. So I believe the conclusion that was reached, and I condemn the statement of the honourable member for Menzies who said that a member of the committee had drafted a resolution virtually to prejudge it. What you forgot to say, what you forgot to say was that the member who drafted that resolution was not a member of the government or a supporter of the government. He was one of the most highly respected members of this House and the candidate of the opposition for the position of deputy chairman of this House. Oh, well, I, I, I believe it's nonpartisan, but you're not going to walk in here and accuse members of this committee of, of running a star chamber, accuse in a general way, a member of the committee, hoping that people will reasonably believe that that was a, a somehow a scurrilous exercise which was devised by a supporter or a member of the government. It was, it was, a, it was, a, it was an imputation that you're entitled to withdraw. So, you see, when it comes Order. down to the, the question... Menzies will cease interjecting. When it comes the down... The member Menzies will cease interjecting. When it comes down to the issue before this House, it's really very simple. It's do, were members of the committee entitled to form the view that the honourable member did not intend to damage the member for Hotham, and the members of the committee have clearly reached a view about that. So on the basis of all the evidence, if he was subject to misrepresentation, as he now says he was, he had several parliamentary opportunities to rectify that, but he chose not to do so. Now, if you're an experienced Order. member of parliament and you're being Member's misrepresented. Time. Order. The minister's time has expired. <laughs> I've asked leave to make a personal explanation, but not necessarily now if this is not a time convenient to you, but simply to we raise it at the first possible opportunity. We might do it after this matter is discharged. The honourable member for New England. Mr Speaker, this is a House of Parliament, not a court of law. Over the last hour, we've heard attacks on the member for Hotham, we've heard attacks on the Honourable Member for Bruce. I just suggest to all of those participating in this debate that this is not the function of this House. This House is a place where properly, if there are issues that reflect against the integrity of an individual, they can't be resolved here. If they are, they're going to be resolved on a political basis. And I suggest, therefore, the first thing we need to do is to set aside something of the hypocrisy and pomposity we've just heard from the Minister for the Arts and address what are significantly the powers and responsibilities of the Parliament when it comes to a matter of privilege. I find myself totally opposed to the report. I'm opposed on three bases. The first is that I believe that this finding were it to be reached is one that should be given by the Speaker of the House or he or she who acts on your behalf. If it were to be accepted by this House, indeed, I think it goes almost as a reflection against the Chair. In the Chair has not acted as the standing orders give them capacity to. In the nature of the findings, as my friend and colleague, the Honourable Member for Wide Bay said, is that the Honourable Member for Bruce has in fact abused the forms of the House. Now the custodian of the forms of the House is you, Mr Speaker, and if there's a breach of the forms of the House, and if the committee has found there's abuse of the forms of the House, what they're doing is saying that you are derelict in your duty. So what the committee is doing, they've said there's no breach of privilege, what they're doing is say that you are not fulfilling your responsibility, that it is you who are at fault. I'm not used to sitting here, I'm afraid. It is you and not 
the, the, the parliament itself. The, me the member for New England also to, better be careful he doesn't reflect upon the chair. Well, I'm just suggesting the committee itself does, Mr Speaker, and that's my concern. That the committee, in fact, I'll in reaching a conclusion, it has said there's no breach of privilege, there is an abuse of the forms of the House, and you, as the custodian of the forms of the House, are the one who, therefore, in some ways, is derelict in your duty. And I'd far be it for me to suggest that you should ever be that. <laughs> the well, third I appreciate concern, those sentiments from the member for New England. The third concern that I have, Mr. Speaker, I suppose, is that in the reference and in the first paragraph of the report, we see that. The reference to the resolution was passed on the 23rd of November in this place. What we should have done at that stage, and as I said when I raised a point of order at the time, is allowed you to consider the matter rather than rush straight into the resolution. Had we done so, you might well have come out with a report that we're now considering. Had you done so, that would have been at a different basis altogether. But it concerns me that what instead has happened has indeed has so properly been identified in the two dissenting reports to the report, is that the committee has been called on to examine matters which, while in your hands are matters which I can well understand might cause concern, are matters which have been distorted. Now, as to the findings themselves, I also have problems in the way that they have been reached. I find that the nature of an abuse of the forms of the House seems to be because there's been a statutory declaration tabled. Now, I'm not too sure that uh, statutory declarations have any great consequence, although, of course, they are attested, and the people who make them normally accept the consequences of their having not only put their name to that statutory declaration, but they've had their name attested, sometimes by a justice of the peace and sometimes by some or other authority. So what we're really saying, and I think that my honourable colleague, the member for Wide Bay, was suggesting that statutory declarations in some way are matters which should not be used and should certainly should not be used in this place. Now, if they are used, they can only be used if they are tabled by consent. Now, we know that you've got to seek leave, and we know in this instance the minister who was at the table at the time gave leave. Now, it concerns me that apparently his action in giving leave has not been apparently considered by the Committee of Privileges. And yet, if somebody has abused the forms of the House, then the person who is the, in standing in place of the Prime Minister at any time, as the Minister in charge of the House, is the person who should care for the government's interests. And in this instance, while it was possible for him to disagree, he did not do so. Now, I disagree with the Honourable Member Bruce in suggesting the Deputy Speaker could have looked at the document. It's not for the Speaker or the Deputy Speaker to determine whether or not in the statute of declaration, at least in the first instance, there is something that uh, is against the forms of the House until it is read. When it is read, he has a capacity to identify it. But in the normal course of events, once somebody in the in the parliament seeks to table something, then it's up to the minister in charge of the House at the time to determine whether or not it's acceptable. When it is read, then of course it becomes the responsibility. One voice, all right, one voice. But when it is read, then of course it's the person who is the speaker. So my concern, secondly, is very much that within the nature of the proceedings of this place, that there should have been action taken at the time, and it is not peculiarly the member for Bruce who has transcended the standing orders of this place. It is the minister, and query whether or not in its findings there has not been a reflection on the person sitting in the speaker's chair who, when the matters were read, did not identify the fact as requiring a substantive motion. Now, when I spoke prior to the resolution in the parliament, Mr Speaker, I said, as I would again now, the privilege is a very important function of this House. It concerns me that in accepting, there's no doubt on the basis of the government's endorsement of this report, it will, this House is going to give to the Committee of Privileges powers that certainly were not, I think, thought to be the powers of the Committee of Privileges when the matter was debated and the parliamentary privileges legislation was passed through this place. Indeed, as I recall it, uh, there was quite a significant debate in this House, and that Parliamentary Privileges Act 1987 codified our requirements as to how privileges should be debated, 
how the committee should be concerned. And uh, I suspect that the nature of this finding, which is going to go down on record, is going to extend the power of that Privileges Committee in a way that I don't think the Act itself envisaged, nor do I think is in the best interests of this chamber. I think it's also important that we understand that as far as uh, the findings of the report, there have been very serious allegations made about some aspects relating to the committee's deliberations. As I am not a member of the committee, I cannot speak to them, but I certainly express my concern that uh, in uh, the uh, dissenting report of the honourable member for Flinders, that paragraph H seems to me to raise very serious matters as to the conduct of the affairs of the Committee of Privileges. From this, Mr Speaker, it seems to me that again it reiterates the fact that if there is to be a reference on privilege, it must be done very seriously, it must be done after proper consideration, and I would suggest it would have been far better had the conclusions that are now presented to us come from the Speaker rather than from committee, certainly in circumstances where the deliberations of that committee are in question. I find it really quite remarkable that we've had some of the contributions we've had today. I found that, uh, for example, the Honourable Member for McEwen in attacking the Honourable Member for Bruce, I don't believe that this is a forum where the Honourable Member for Bruce is under attack for his views of the past. Sure, the findings of the report relate to his abuse of the forms of the House, and uh, we heard from the Minister of the Arts how it was all a matter of intent. Well, once you get down to matter of intent, I'd suggest you really are getting down to the legal processes. And because this is not a place where the legal processes should be pursued, I'd suggest that that was all irrelevant. Indeed, I thought that uh, the minister for a while had got uh, a bit too locked up in reading uh, Enid Blyton to his children with his wink, wink, nod, nod, and all that went with that. But, Mr. Speaker, there is another part of this report to which I want to address for a moment, and that's the penalty. I suppose, of all the findings of this place, the one that's had and that is of the Parliament of Australia that's had as much uh, notoriety as any other with the conclusions reached with Brown against Brown and Fitzpatrick so long ago. Now, I don't want this deliberation today to finish in the same order. It might well be that the members should be reprimanded. It might well be that uh, the conclusion, which is in the last part of the paragraph C of the committee's report, and recommends the honourable member apologise that that is an appropriate course. But that not really is what we're talking about now. We're talking about a suspension for two days. I find it quite incredible this non-legal forum is finding itself in a position where arbitrarily, at the whim of the government, we're to have a penalty imposed on one of its members, not after some proper consideration. How do we reach two days? I mean, why not 20 days? Why not 20 months? I mean, there are all sorts of prejudices that I know that emerge about other members of this place and how long people should be from wherever. I find that the nature of the penalty and the recommendations of the penalty also reflect the discredit of this House. I don't see that we are capable of deciding it's an appropriate penalty, the two days uh, suspension be the, the proper conclusion to the member failing to apologise. I mean, I just find that uh, totally unrelated to the nature of the alleged crime. I mean, sure, there's been an abuse of the forms of the House, but as I've suggested, the Minister of the Table was party to that. And I'd suggest, with due respect, Mr Speaker, in the findings of the committee, there's an implication that the chair itself in some way might have been involved. So how can it be that one of those three participants the member himself is going to be suspended for two days, but everybody else let go scot-free. Indeed, the honourable member for McEwen was referring a while ago to the publicity accorded in the Melbourne papers. As I recall the publicity was really for the statement from the Minister for the Arts rather than for the member for Bruce. Now, if you're going to start looking at who said what and who's reported where, the Minister of the Arts is culpable, for it was his comments as much as any others that were reported in the media. So let's be honest with ourselves. I mean, two days suspension. What's the basis of coming to this sort of a penalty? We really are having ourselves on. I mean, all this false piety and sudden uh, judicial merit in being able to determine that somebody's been nasty and said terrible things to each other. Look, for goodness sake, this is a political forum. 
We're in the rundown to election and the Labor Party is going to be defeated. We're going to say horrific things about each other in the next few months. We all know that. But come off it. Don't let's carry on and believe that somehow, because we're in government, we know that this man's a terrible fellow. We don't agree with all those things we've, he said, so we're going to give him two days suspension. Really, I think it's absolute arrant nonsense. And what it does is bring this parliament into disrepute. And that's my concern, Mr Speaker. That was the reason why when the matter was first canvassed, I raised a point of order and suggested order. that the it would be a very good idea if the Speaker considered the issue. Because I don't believe privilege is something that should be just cast lightly aside. I don't believe it's a matter where we are or can be in a position of judging right or wrong. I mean, I make no judgment whatsoever about the individual attitudes of members of this place on a whole range of issues where I have very strong views contrary to theirs. And we're all the same. But what we're doing is we're not only Coming to a conclusion that the standing orders haven't been followed, we're going to suspend one of the party, and only one of the parties responsible to two days' absence from this place because of it. Now, Mr Speaker, I think what it does is really reflects against this House. When we come to a conclusion that's a non sequitur, it comes to a conclusion that shows that somehow we're purporting to be a House of law, somehow we're going to reach a judgment which is beyond our capacity. I don't find the penalty fits the crime, and I'm quite sure Gilbert and Sullivan alive would make a tremendous musical opera of the whole jolly scene. The Honourable the Minister, the question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The vision required? Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Macmillan and Streeton. Tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling. Tell us for the nose. The honourable member for Hume on a point of order. Whether there's a capacity to record that all members of the Privileges Committee who wish to speak in this debate were not afforded that opportunity. Yeah, it's not uh, in the chair's position to give advice to members. But if the member for Hume wants to consult me later, I'll uh, talk to him. Order. The result of the division is eyes 75, nose 50. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Streeton and McMillan tell us for the ayes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 76, noes 49. In accordance with the resolution, I, therefore the division is resolved in the affirmative. In accordance with the resolution just passed by the House, I call on the honourable member for Bruce to withdraw the allegation and apologise to the House. For the reasons I have stated earlier, Mr. Speaker, I decline to do so. The honourable minister. Uh, in the light of that, Mr. Speaker, I move that the honourable member for Bruce be suspended from the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I move the motion be put. Oh, the question is that the motion be put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Order. The member for O'Connor. The member for Menzies will cease interjecting. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Street and McMillan tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 52. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. All those with that opinion please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Street and the Macmillan tell us for the ayes, the honourable members for Riverina, Darling and Wannan tell us for the noes. The Honourable Member for Herbert. Order. The result of the division is ayes 78, noes 54. The division is therefore resolved in the affirmative. And the honourable member for Bruce is suspended from the service of the House for two sitting days, including today. <coughs> Order. The honourable member for Bruce should leave the chamber. The clerk with petitions. Petitions from certain citizens have been lodged as follows: by the members for Indy, McKellar, McEwen, Wills, Griffith, seat. Fraser, Herbert. Hind Marsh and Eden Monero from 69, 40, 80, 28, 13, 43, 18, 185 and 270 petitioners respectively. Praying that policies be implemented to increase Australian aid, fight poverty, protect the environment and promote human rights. By the members for Bruce Holt, Werriwa, Kuyong and Cunningham from 110, 24, 20, 74 and 20 petitioners respectively, praying that funding of abortions through Medicare cease and certain other action be taken to protect the right to life of the unborn. 
by the members for Bruce, Bendigo, Maribyrnong and Goldstein from 14, 43, 23 and 61 petitioners respectively, praying that the national flag not be changed except by a referendum. By the members for Indi, McEwen, McMillan and Holt from 309, 999, 121 and 73 petitioners respectively, praying that the abortion funding abolition bill be supported. By the members for Sydney, Wide Bay and Ryan from 1370 and nine petitioners respectively, praying that an international earth repair action decade begin on 5 June 1990. By the members for Charlton, Petrie and Hindmarsh from 31, 18 and 72 petitioners respectively, praying that support for the capital gains tax be maintained. By the members for Deakin and Goldstein from 178 and 10 petitioners, praying that proposed legislation which would require companies to assess their taxable income within 15 days of the end of a financial year not be passed. By the members for Richmond and Parks from 973 and 1,128 petitioners, praying that the emphasis on monetary policy be replaced by a lower government expenditure, microeconomic restructuring and reform of the taxation system. By the member for Deakin from 121 petitioners, praying that the excessive reliance on high interest rates cease. By the member for Bernathan from 75 petitioners, praying that all advertising of alcohol on radio and television be banned. By the member for Richmond from 17 petitioners, praying the provision of an adequately funded pharmaceutical benefits scheme, which ensures availability of pharmaceutical benefits through local pharmacies, be guaranteed. By the member for Bradfield from 59 petitioners, praying the restructuring of the pharmaceutical benefits scheme be reconsidered. By the member for Macmillan from 124 electors of the Division of Macmillan, praying that a breast x ray program for Australian women be implemented as soon as possible. By the member for Maribyrnong from 15 petitioners, praying that action be taken to amend laws which permit discrimination on the basis of age. By the member for Maribyrnong from 11 petitioners, praying that the dedication of the teaching profession, its interest in the welfare of its students and its loyalty to the community be recognised. By the member for Melbourne Ports from 102 petitioners, praying that action be taken to phase out the consumption, production and export of chlorofluorocarbons and halons. By the member for Benelong from 420 petitioners, praying that steps be taken to maintain both high quality health care for the community and equity for community pharmacists. By the member for Gilmore from 273 petitioners, praying that the allocation to roads from fuel excise revenue be increased by 10 cents per litre from existing taxes and continue at that level for the next decade with adjustments for changes in fuel prices. By the member for Moncrief from 12 petitioners, praying that legislative action be taken to encourage the use of recycled materials, minimise the use of new materials and prevent the generation of toxic wastes. By the member for O'Connor from 181 petitioners, praying the continued viability of neighbourhood pharmaceutical services be guaranteed by an adequately funded pharmaceutical benefits scheme. By the member for Lowe from 191 petitioners, praying the abortion funding abolition bill be debated and voted upon during the current sittings of the House. By the member for Lowe from 60 petitioners, praying that certain action be taken to ensure the viability of community pharmacists. The terms of the various petitions will be recorded in Hansard and copies referred to the appropriate ministers. The chair will be resumed at 2 p.m. I, I, yeah, I might 
The Honourable the Prime Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a matter of courtesy, I inform the House of the Minister for Land Transport and uh, Shipping Support, the Honourable Bob Brown, will be absent from question time today, attending the Australian Transport Advisory Council meeting. Questions uh, for Mr Brown should be directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications, Mr Willis. I also inform the House that the Minister for Telecommunications and Aviation Support, Mrs Kelly, is on leave. The Minister for Science, Customs and Small Business, Mr Jones, is overseas on government business. Questions normally directed to Mrs Kelly should also go to Mr Willis and questions for Mr Jones should go to Mr Kerrin. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Gippsland. My question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware of the open conflict between Senator Button and the Minister for Science over the effect of funding cuts to CSIRO's capacity? Further. Is the Minister aware of a letter dated 20th of November 1989 from the Minister for Science to Mr Ben Bremner, policy consultant to Senator Button, regarding the CSIRO's submission to the Australian Science and Technology Council on Environmental Science, from which I quote, If you want to give directions about how CSIRO's material is presented, I suggest that you start with me. I don't quite understand what you think is to be gained by lying about the organisation's capacity. This is, uh, Mr. Order. The Mr. Speaker, uh, question. this is from uh, the Minister for Science. To continue, um, I don't quite understand what you think is to be gained by lying about the organisation's capacity. I don't appreciate you throwing your weight around the CSIRO offices. If I thought you had something to contribute, that would be another matter. <laughs> End of quote. What steps will the Prime Minister take to resolve this conflict between his two ministers? The Honourable the Prime Minister. The answer to the first question is no. The answer to the second question is no. The Honourable Member for, the Honourable Member for Gippsland on a point of order. Speaker, I seek leave to table the letter whereby one minister accuses the senior order. staff in other ministers' office of lying. Order. The Member for Gippsland will resume his seat. Is leave granted? Leave isn't granted. The Honourable Member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Order. And as the Prime Minister be aware, there have been a number of demonstrations in Romania in recent times and of the violent suppression of those demonstrations in Romania. What is the government's response to uh, the situation in Romania at the present time? The Honourable the Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable uh, Member for his question. The latest information available uh, to the government suggests that hundreds and perhaps thousands of Romanians were killed at the weekend following the violent suppression of demonstrations in Timisoara. The regime's tanks on Monday mowed down a group uh, protesting in Timisoara against the government's refusal to allow them to bury those killed earlier. According to reports, tanks ploughed through the demonstrators, rolling over the living and the dead and splashing their blood on nearby buildings. As a result of this horror, between 50 and 100,000 people took to the town streets again yesterday. Further demonstrations have since taken place throughout the country and have spread beyond uh, ethnic Hungarian areas. In the past few hours, troops have been uh, pulled out of Timisoara, but major cities remain encircled by tanks. Ceescu has blamed recent events on, quote, 
international terrorism and remains unrepentant so the danger of further brutality and more deaths remains. Mr Speaker, what we are witnessing in Romania is ageing rulers trying to protect an outdated and undemocratic system by turning their tanks upon their own people. The bloody suppression of dissent and the slaughter of demonstrators may work for a time. But Mr Speaker, 1989's great lesson to the world has been that repression in the end cannot prevail against the innate and simple human desire to live a decent life in freedom. That is why the dissidents in Romania will finally win, and it is why those who have murdered their own people will find no peace. Australians join all the civilised world in condemning these atrocities. We have protested in the strongest terms to the Romanian authorities. We are consulting our friends in both East and West Europe and elsewhere to examine what other options might be available to register our outrage at these events. We are continuing to monitor events in Romania very closely. Mr Speaker, may I say in conclusion that I'm sure all members of this House and all Australians will join me in offering our profound sympathy to the relatives of those Romanians who have died as a result of their peaceful protests against a tyrannical regime and our admiration for those who are continuing to struggle. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Not a question, uh, Mr Speaker. With your indulgence in 10 seconds, I simply wish to associate the Opposition with the remarks of the Prime Minister, uh, remarks with which we would totally concur. The people of Romania have had to endure too much for too long, and the swirling winds of change that are now occurring uh, will bring about the sorts of change which have unravelled elsewhere. The Honourable Member for O'Connor. Thank, uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, and, and the question relates to the administration of the Higher Education Administrative Charge. And I ask, is it a fact that absolutely no refunds of this charge are paid by universities unless the student concerned formally withdraws from the course prior to the commencement of the first term? Is it also a fact that the 1988 term at Murdoch University commenced on the 22nd of February, but, the, but that formal withdrawal by a student on the 3rd of March was approved for refund of $236 by the process of backdating the application to the 21st of February? Is it also a fact that this student is the minister's wife, Maggie Dawkins, and if so, what influence did the minister exert to cause the university to provide this preferential treatment? The Honourable the Minister. I have uh, no idea of the particular circumstances to which the, Order. To which the Order. Um, <coughs> member relates. The, the, questions the member for Mayo will cease interjecting. In relation to the higher education contribution scheme, the scheme which is now in operation, questions of refunds or exemptions are matters for the secretary of my department. In relation to the higher education um, administration charge, my recollection is, and you've got to recall that this scheme no longer operates, and 1988 was the last year of its operation, but my recollection is that matters relating to um, giving exemptions or, or refunds were matters for the, institution, the institutions themselves and not matters which were referred to the government. But um, if the member wants to uh, raise this matter with me, uh, I'd be happy to look into it. The Honourable Member for Lilly. Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Having noted the massive increase in the year 12 retention rate in Australian schools for some seven years now, I would ask the Minister to report on the reasons for this phenomenon. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for her question. She would be well aware, as, uh, of, as uh, the uh, chairperson of the caucus committee, which examines these matters of employment, education and training of the spectacular improvements in retention rates in Australia since 1983. It's a matter which I've referred to before. It's a matter which the Prime Minister has referred to as well. 
And what we now know is that we have uh, achieved a figure of 61% in, in, in relation to uh, this year in terms of retention to uh, year 12. The major reasons for these, I think, uh, relate to the fact that more young Australians are keen to remain in the schooling system, recognising that it gives them the best opportunity to get the best kind of employment once they have left school and also to uh, equip them to fully participate in society as a whole. But I think it's also worth looking at the particular contribution that the Commonwealth has made over the last few years to the support of uh, schools and to the support of school students. If we look at the funding for, government, uh, for the funding of schools for all school programs, we find that in 1990 there will, be, will have been a 15.5 per cent increase, real increase, in terms of what was provided before we came to office. In relation to government schools, the, gr the grants will be 26 per cent higher, and in relation to non-government schools, they are estimated to be 44.8 per cent higher in real terms. So that's uh, a very clear evidence of the additional funds that we are now providing to support schools, both government and non-government schools, uh, in terms of trying to provide higher quality education for a larger number of Australian students. As well, there has been the major overhaul and expansion of Ausstudy, where we now find that the number of people receiving, the number of students receiving Ausstudy has doubled between 1983 and 1989. And that, of course, has come at a very, at a very uh, great cost, where the cost of Ausstudy in total has gone up from $268 million to $774 million, a massive uh, increased investment in young Australians in terms of their, in terms of their future. We're, there has also been not just an increase in the number of uh, the money going to non-government schools. As a result of the new schools policy, which came in in 1986, we find that there have been 189 new non-government schools established, 118 schools have been extended, and 103 have had uh, re reallocations or sorry relocations approved by the new schools. Uh, committee. And if we are to just examine the cost of these new schools operating at their maximum enrolment, that represents an increased cost of $81 million in terms of federal contributions to non-government schools. And this uh, is of course because, or well, this is all part of the, the context in which this government has been able to support all schools. We've been able to settle the otherwise divisive state aid debate We've provided uh, security and certainty in terms of the funding for the non-government uh, school system, and uh, that is a policy which we intend to support uh, into the future. Essentially, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Commonwealth is uh, concerned about equity, is concerned to provide a quality of opportunity for all Australian kids regardless of whether they go to government or non-government schools. We want to see more and more of them completing the full 12 years of, uh, of schooling and then as many of them continuing in some form of post-secondary education and training. This is not only good for the young people themselves in terms of uh, providing a better future for them, but it's certainly very much in the interests of the country as we need to have more modern skills and a higher and a greater degree of schools generally as we confront uh, the changes going on in our economy, which of course will continue into the future. The Honourable Member for Parks. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. In view of the evidence before the Winchester Coronial Inquiry, I ask the Prime Minister, can he give the people of an Australia an unequivocal assurance that he has never participated in gambling or other illegal activities at the former Pine Lodge or any other casino or gambling joint in Canberra. The Honourable uh, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, I uh, treat that question with the uh, total contempt that it deserves. And uh, I, I merely make the observation, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, these matters are uh, before the courts. The uh, source of the allegations, uh, I should think, would, uh, would of its order. Mr Speaker, I would have thought that the source of the allegation is sufficient uh, of itself to uh, answer the uh, 
answer the question, but uh, for what? Oh, just... oh, yeah. Wait your miserable little turns, will you? Oh. And uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, oh, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, if it's a matter of any interest uh, uh, to those opposite, and if it is, it's a reflection upon them. Uh, I can uh, give the assurance that's uh, requested. The Honourable Member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I address my question without notice for the Minister for Defence. <coughs> and I ask, uh, can the Minister advise the House what support the RAAF provided to the Australian public during Operation Immune? What was the cost of that support and will those costs be recovered? The Honourable Minister for Defence. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Of course, since uh, this Parliament last met between the uh, beginning of December and now, the uh, government, in consultation with the airlines, uh, determined that a sufficient level of service had been reached for uh, us to no longer need the very excellent service that had been provided by the RAAF and the RAN under Operation Immune. And therefore, the Prime Minister was able to farewell the last, uh, or welcome home, I should say, the last flight on December the 15th and uh, uh, preside over the sending of the pilots and air crew and maintenance people to a well-deserved Christmas holiday. I think I can speak uh, on behalf of all the government in thanking the RAAF and the RAN for the excellent services they provided over those several months when they were in operation. Some 224,000 uh, seats were provided uh, on its highest day, 3,071. The RAAF and RAN carried 175,000 passengers. They serviced 17 locations, in particular maintaining air links between Tasmania and the mainland. Up to 300 RAAF and 32 Navy air crew were involved and over 600 maintenance personnel. The squadrons concerned were 32nd, 33rd, 36th and 37th. The maintenance squadrons at East Sale and 486 RAF Richmond, that's the 32, 33, 36 and 37 RAAF and uh, the RAN HC723 squadron, and a very effective service they provided uh, for our people in that period of time. In recognition of the public service the ADF was providing, the government decided that the airlines would not be charged any of the ADF's fixed costs, such as salaries, capital depreciation and overheads. The marginal costs of spares and contractor maintenance were largely dependent upon the hours flown by the aircraft involved. For this reason, actual marginal costs could not be determined with any precision until the end of the ADF assistance when hours flown were known. The difference between the ADF's actual marginal costs and cost recoveries from the airlines amount to $816,000, $884. Defence will be seeking supplementation for this amount in the 1989-90 additional estimates review. So I think one can see from those statistics that, in fact, very close to the uh, cost of the operations of the aircraft were in fact uh, obtained uh, via the payments made by the airlines to the RAAF. And that additional amount, as I said, and as I foreshadowed in this House, when we knew the actual costs of the operation at the conclusion of the operation, uh, we would be putting that to government and that, of course, will be raised, uh, raised uh, with, them, uh, with government next year. I might say that, by and large, the activities of the RAAF have been, and the RAN have been welcomed in our community and well supported by our community. They have uh, provided, been provided with an opportunity to show what all of us who are involved with the Defence Forces one way and another have known for a very long time, and that is the Defence Forces of this country provide a dedicated service to this country and uh, can be relied upon in all circumstances where assistance is required to provide that assistance. I was uh, pleased to note uh, that uh, a number of members of the opposition were able to find themselves it in themselves to themselves congratulate the RAAF in the final analysis <laughs> after the conclusion of those flights on the work that they had done. But uh, one can't help commenting on one or two of these particular comments that uh, an element of hypocrisy can be foreseen can be seen in what was said. The leader of the National Party, for example issued those words of uh, thanks to the RAAF when uh, those flights concluded. Only a few weeks previously, he was joining these uh, late and totally unlamented 
Premier of, uh, then Premier of Queensland in taking on the RAF for allegedly unsafe op operations and calling into question in detail their professionalism. That is a stand that nobody on this side of the House could uh, agree with. And if the statement of the leader of the National Party represents in some shape or form a mea culpa for his efforts in that regard, uh, we, can, uh, we can only welcome that. But they have uh, uh, covered themselves, I think, with, uh, uh, with a, uh, a degree of public regard over the last few months that should stand our armed services in good stead for a very long time. Our people know, now know of the professionalism of our armed services and their capabilities. And we do, uh, on this side of the House, all thank them very much for the tasks they've performed. The Honourable Member for Mayo. Uh, Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the fact that businessman Mr Eddie Kornhauser has been charged with the paying of bribes in Queensland to obtain assistance in getting official approval Order. for Order. the Paradise Centre development at Surfers Paradise. Will the Prime Minister outline to the Parliament the detail of any direct or indirect financial or in-kind assistance he has received from Mr Eddie Kornhauser since he became a member of parliament. Order. The, quest the question is out of order. It doesn't come within the purview of the Prime Minister's portfolio. The Honourable Member for Kingston and, uh, is also to the Prime Minister on a much more serious subject. And uh, I preface it by saying that people on both sides of this House— Order. Order. I preface it by Kingston. saying that people on both sides of this House would have uh, welcomed the initiative the government has taken to bring an end to the bloodshed in Cambodia and to bring about peace in that uh, troubled country. Uh, I ask the Prime Minister what reactions has the government received in discussions with other countries to our proposals for a UN interim administration in Cambodia? The Honourable the Prime Minister. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, question, Mr Speaker. Um, a Deputy Secretary in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, Mr Michael Costello, has discussed our proposals uh, in Hanoi, Beijing, Phnom Penh, uh, with Prince Sihanouk uh, and uh, with other interested parties in Bangkok, and he will discuss them uh, tomorrow in Jakarta. Now, of course, Mr Speaker, this is not the time for me to give the House a detailed account of uh, Mr Costello's discussions. Honourable members, I believe, will understand the uh, sensitivities uh, involved in exploratory discussions of this sort. The government will also want to take stock of the situation after Mr, Co uh, Mr. Costello returns and give us a, gives us a detailed report <coughs> on the weekend. But I can say at this stage to the honourable member that uh, we have been very encouraged indeed by the interest that has been shown in our proposal by all the parties principal uh, to the dispute and, of course, also by all those outside countries who have been involved over a period of time in a search for a settlement to the tragic situation in Cambodia. This interest that has been shown, Mr Speaker, is uh, sufficient, certainly, to encourage us to proceed with further consultations, and I would expect Australian ministers and officials to continue these discussions in the new year. As the government has said before, of course, Mr Speaker, we don't pretend to have all the answers on a Cambodian settlement. It would be absurd to make any such suggestion. We certainly don't uh, expect a solution to this uh, so far intractable conflict to be easily or quickly achieved. But I think we are in a position to say, Mr Speaker, that the government's latest initiative Order. has the, the opened up of the uh, important... The uh, I can say, Mr Speaker, that the government's latest initiative has... Uh, opened up important new avenues for negotiations and, as I've said, we will uh, continue to pursue them. I can assure the honourable gentleman who asked this question, who we all know has a particular interest in these affairs, but I also assure all honourable members that we will continue with these discussions for as long as they seem useful uh, to try and find a workable end to the suffering which I think all Australians agree the uh, Cambodian people have already endured for far too long. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is also to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister, given the fact that he has now publicly stated in the age on the 9th of December that there was, quote, no adverse recommendation, unquote, by the Foreign Investment Review Board against the Herald and Weekly Times takeover by News Limited, 
Will he release the Foreign Investment Review Board's reasons as to why a foreign citizen owning 70% of the print media was not contrary to the national interest, and if not, why not? The Honourable well, Prime Minister. It's a good idea if the Honourable Member for Goldstein got his portfolio is right. The Foreign Investment Review Board comes under the, uh, under the uh, portfolio responsibility of the Treasurer, and I think the question should be addressed to him. But as, uh, as, uh, far, as, I'm con Order. as far as I'm concerned, uh, the decision that has been taken in uh, this regard is acceptable and will stand. The Honourable Member for Chifley. My question is directed to the Minister for Social Security. Is the minister aware of claims based on a paper by uh, Rob Dimplesman of the Parliamentary Library that living standards in Australia have fallen since 1983? Uh, can he advise the House whether these claims are accurate? And if not, what is the true position? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. <laughs> oh, uh. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the Honourable Member for his question. Uh, I am uh, aware, uh, Mr Speaker, of claims made by the member for Wentworth uh, based on the paper referred to. It is, uh, I guess, uh, a paper that uh, the honourable member for Wentworth uh, might come to grips with. To quote the paper itself, uh, it is a narrow economistic perspective. Living standards are defined here in terms of income. It is a narrow, I'm quoting from the paper, it is a narrow economic, economistic perspective and does not purport to represent welfare or quality of life. And that's uh, what the paper itself says. Again, it says data shown here exclude the value of government provided services, the social wage. Mr. Speaker, uh, it is uh, important uh, when seeking to analyse a question like uh, the quality of life or living standards that one does take uh, a broader perspective. One doesn't simply look, uh, as the paper does, to uh, particular uh, budgets and results of budgets, for example, uh, the April statement this year, which uh, showed uh, a remarkable uh, improvement in terms of living standards as a result of tax cuts uh, and wages, or that it simply look, as the paper does, at particular types of families, such as the model family of a male breadwinner with a dependent spouse and two dependent children, which represents uh, only a small percentage, about 9 per cent of Australian families. So that uh, we have no argument, uh, Mr Speaker, with the paper in the sense that uh, uh, its writer suggests uh, the need to look more broadly uh, than uh, simply at uh, such a narrow economistic perspective. I would uh, suggest, uh, Mr Speaker, that while uh, the honourable member is uh, making statements and assertions in this particular area, he might go, for example, to the work of uh, Bradbury, Doyle and Whiteford of the Social Policy or Social Welfare Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. They point out, Mr Speaker, that real household disposable income per capita has risen since 1983. They point out that the median income of all families have risen about 5 per cent in real terms over that time. They point out also the very marked improvement in incomes of sole parents and low-income families and farming families under labour. They point out that if you allow for higher labour force participation rates for women, the real increase in medium income for families is of the order of 6.5 per cent. The government, uh, Mr Speaker, has to deal with the difficulties of real families working hard to bring up their children. That's why, Mr Speaker, we have delivered the largest increase in family allowances in this country's history. It's why we've implemented, Mr Speaker, the family allowance supplement providing increases in real disposable income for the lowest uh, quartiles in terms of the Australian income, 50 75 per cent uh, of uh, around 20 per cent real in terms of gains. It's why we've indexed uh, the family allowance, the dependent spouse rebate and the sole parent re rebate and entrenched our benchmarks for the family allowance supplement. Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of uh, social reform, one will look to this period as a period in which the social wage has never played a more important role in terms of the maintenance of real living standards. And of course, the indexation of those uh, various payments and tax uh, allowances is a crucial element in those reform, which is one of the reasons why, Mr Speaker, uh, one finds the opposition, and indeed certainly the member for Wentworth and Senator Stone, very silent 
on indexation of family allowances. Mr. Speaker, I just uh, mention uh, by way of passing and in conclusion that uh, Australian families, understanding Labor's commitment, uh, recognise the importance of these payments. And I would simply mention to those listening to this broadcast it's important that review forms be returned as soon as possible. Oh, Thank you. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Treasurer, in view of the answer the Prime Minister just gave, I ask, as the Prime Minister has asserted that the advice from the Foreign Investment Review Board was that there were no reasons why the takeover of the Herald and Weekly Times by News Corporation should not proceed, will he now release to the public, which is so obviously and vitally affected by the takeover, the advice that was in fact given to the government by the FIRB? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, the answer is no, Mr Speaker. Uh, the uh, Order. Advi advice to the government on all of these many takeovers affect the public, obviously, and advice to the government is the government's advice. But I notice that the Honourable Member for Goldstein has been beating a drum about this matter now for, has, for the time that has elapsed since uh, News Limited took over the bulk of the Herald and Weekly Times newspapers. And we now have this constant parroting of this statistic that News Limited has 58 per cent, I think from memory, or 56, of the uh, print media, print interests of this country. But we never heard from the Honourable Gentleman when he was a minister or since the statistic in relation to the Herald and Weekly Times group when it held 52 per cent or 54 per cent from memory of the media in this country, of the print media. So, 54 per cent in the hands of the Herald and Weekly Times was, of course, not even worthy of mention. But 56 or 58 in the hands of Murdoch is a national tragedy. And of course, plus, yes, plus I was coming to that, plus TV. And of course, in those days, the Herald and Weekly Times had HSV7 in Melbourne and uh, another television station, I think it was in Brisbane, but my memory may not serve me, in Adelaide. Plus a group of, uh, uh, plus a group of um, country radio stations and a stack of provincial newspapers, naturally, with the capital city press. Now, in terms of national, national concentration, we've heard much about that. There is not now a print owner who owns any television. Television is divorced entirely from print and both are divorced from radio. But that was not the case when the Herald and Weekly Times held the show for all of those years when, of course, the Liberal Party was the very happy and quiet recipient of the joy coming from the Herald and Weekly Times in Melbourne. And it only became an issue when Rupert Murdoch had the temerity in what was basically a transfer of assets from one company to another to buy it, but in doing so shed the television interests which were held by that group. And since then, we've had all of these uh, uh, people with uh, so much umbrage about the state of the media. I mean, the one that brings, I mean, apart from the Honourable Member for Goldstein, who did nothing about it, about the concentrations when he was a minister and was silent about it, uh, I, if I might interpose, the one that really makes me giggle is the former editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, David Bowman, who's now talking about plurality of the media and a sensible and balanced media when he was the dreariest, most conservative right-wing editor in the country, when he ran the Sydney Morning Herald, I might add, into the ground in those years. And all of a sudden, this conservative, this conservative, boorish, right-winger, ideologue, decides he's now some sort of media libertarian, <laughs> arguing for a free and, and moderate and plural press. I mean, what a joke. That's all right for people that don't have any memory. And I used to, in those days, run the New South Wales Labor Party. And I used to just occasionally talk to Dr. Bo Mr Bowman about, about, uh, about uh, the state of the Sydney Morning Herald. And I, and I wouldn't bother you with the replies. So, and yet we've been joined. I mean, all the, all the media do-gooders, Bowman, uh, the, uh, yeah, well, uh, I wasn't even going to bother with Tui, but uh, uh, the, uh, he's of course 
the principal advisor of the member for Goldstein, <laughs> and the member for Goldstein, who, uh, who was, uh, well, mate, one Order. of your members has been quite happy to be run by him for years, the member for Goldstein, so I wouldn't be too cocky about that if I were you. And here's the, mem here's the member for Goldstein, uh, here's the member for Goldstein now saying that the government, by implication, has sort of, you know, slipped the Herald and Weekly Times to Rupert Murdoch, and why can't all this documentation be made public? The fact of the matter is, in this country, we now have a diversity of media ownership, which we never had when the coalition ran. No, you, you laugh, but you were quite happy. You were quite happy Order. with the old, with the old Frank Packer rags, Henderson rules, put together by Menzies. The fiction that two television stations, McKellar. two television stations, Sydney and Melbourne were the same as Mount Isa and Broken Hill. That was the fiction you put together. Two television stations. You can own two TV stations. I'd say you had Frank Packer sitting up with Sydney and Melbourne, and. Uh, and Rags Henderson sitting up with uh, Melbourne and Brisbane, and that was the same as Broken Hill and Mount Isa. Now that was media equity in your terms, in media equity in your terms. Now we've got now we've got television divorced from the print, and print divorced from radio, and radio divorced from television. And you've all got the hide to say. But as well as that, in the 54 per cent, which used to be in the Herald and Weekly Times, it also the member had, for McCallum will cease it also had. It also had the West Australian, another capital city newspaper. That is now removed from the Herald and Weekly Times. It's in the hands of Bond Media. It's not in the hands of Rupert Murdoch. So the fact is that the 50 odd percent you're talking about has an entirely different character because it's now not covering one state. And given the fact that the, that the West Australian is an important newspaper, particularly in the state of Western Australia, and Western Australia happens to be one of the Australian states, or haven't you noticed? The fact of the matter is that the character of the 50 odd percent in the hands of the Murdoch group is nothing like the character it was in the hands of the Herald of Weekly Times. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party had this nice thing going for them for a couple of decades. But in the end, uh, the, the, uh, the Conservatives who ran the Herald of Weekly Times ran it into the ground like you ran Australia into the ground. And the public changed you as the equity owners, the Herald and Weekly Times changed them. The Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question without notice is directed to the Minister for Social Security. Is the Minister aware of proposals, proposals to abolish the capital gains tax at a cost of $450 million? If that were to be implemented without damage to fiscal policy, what would need to be done in cutting social programs? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. <coughs> Order. Mr Order. Uh, Speaker, the uh, figure that uh, the Honourable Member gives is uh, equivalent to what the opposition uh, uh, costs its own proposal. Of course, those costs would increase for many years after that because of ret the retrospective gift to the wealthy. You could pay for this gift to the wealthiest of course, in a range of ways. Well, the honourable member laughs, but the fact of the matter is that finding $450 million is no easy business. And finding $450 million in terms of the social security portfolio would mean making some politically pretty tough decisions. I mean, if you come up front and you say we want to find $450 million off the capital gains tax, we want to take $450 million and look after our friends, and we're going to uh, find that $450 million out of the Social Security portfolio. Very simple. Well, of course, you could look first of all, and I suppose the easiest uh, place to look would be, would be the index question index of indexation index. itself. Because the cost of indexation, I'm not talking just about the age pension, but the cost of indexation overall is something of the order of $1,300 million a year. And the cost of indexation of age pensions would exceed uh, $450 million. And uh, in terms of, well, you've done it before, you're in government, and uh, uh, you know, that was no concern. You suspended indexation for a year. And you could suspend it again, and at least for that year, you would save $450 million. But of course, that's not the only way you could save it. And uh, let me just refer to some of the other areas that one could look at. You could, for example, uh, dismember income support for people with disabilities. 
You could look at abolishing the sheltered employment allowance, the rehabilitation allowance, mobility allowance and the child disability allowance. And if that uh, didn't give you enough uh, savings, you could throw in as well the uh, double orphans pension and abolition of income support for people under the age of 18. So that uh, by that kind of uh, clustering of savings, of course it is possible uh, to achieve uh, very significant uh, savings indeed. We've heard uh, from the opposition from time to time concern about uh, what might be saved in relation to sole parent pensions. And of course, uh, for those uh, uh, widows over the age of 50 who were saved uh, when we moved uh, to a different uh, situation with a qualifying age of 16, then there are significant, uh, there are significant uh, savings there. Indeed, if one were simply uh, trying to look after the $17 million that's to be uh, directed the way of John Elliott, then uh, by denying over 4,000 widows any income at all, one could simply uh, fix up John Elliott alone. <laughs> or one can deny 20,000 young Australians order, any income order, support. Order. The minister might resume his seat. The member for O'Connor on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I refer you to section 144 of your standing orders and the reference to the fact that questions must not seek or contain hypothetical matter. The matters to which this minister is now treating in a hypothetical manner are all written down in the opposition's order. economic action order. plan. There, there, it is not for order. you. There is he, no he, point of order. The they are covered, sir, in, in, already, and he will is being. Well, on a further point of order, sir, point of order. I remind you of your responsibility to keep the standing orders going. And this minister the is abusing the order. standing order. The member for O'Connor will resume he is, his seat. He is treating the, the member. For, I warn the member for O'Connor. The honourable minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, there's nothing. Order. There's nothing hypothetical about uh, savings of $450 million. It goes to people, and I've simply referred to some of the people that you can withdraw money from, because you don't go out there and save half a billion dollars without touching people. And if you're not going to knock off your 4,000 uh, widows, then you could go to, say, 20,000 16 and 17 year olds. Look, no one believes that particular, uh, that, that, uh, particular document. No one believes that, not even, not even the member for Wentworth. Because the member for Wentworth made it very clear that he would make those savings work, and he would make those savings work, uh, I would argue, Mr Speaker, by going to uh, some of the issues that I've gone to. Or you could, uh, Mr. Speaker, you could withdraw. You, you could withdraw, Mr. Speaker, uh, 20,000 Australian families their allowance for their children with disabilities. Again, to find that savings of the order of 17 million dollars, equivalent to the savings that uh, are in fact being paid or would be paid to John Elliott by removal of the capital gains tax. Mr. Speaker, no. Well, look, uh, look. Uh, order. Order. There is far too much noise. It's interesting. Uh, Members on my left will cease interjecting. The leader of the opposition will cease interjecting. The honourable minister. Well, it's interesting, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that uh, members of the opposition should regard it as a waste of time to talk about savings. After all, uh, the honourable member for Wentworth indicated that uh, the uh, savings that uh, he thought he might be able to make through the economic action plan, so called. Uh, were only the beginning, only the beginning of savings that would flow uh, from the economic pol policies of the opposition. Now, the fact of the matter is that to save $450 million requires questioning, laying open to question the security of the uh, millions of people who, are one way or another, are dependent on the social security system. And so, you can't avoid. Order. You cannot avoid, Mr. Speaker, the question of. Uh, indexation, and that's why whenever the question of indexation is raised, you get three or four different answers uh, from the opposition. Senator Cheney, only the other day in the Senate, Mr Speaker, uh, made it clear that his position on indexation was right across the board, absolutely rock solid, even given uh, commitments made by the government that were not legislated. A very different position that, uh, than that put forward by the honourable member for Wentworth. Mr Speaker, the reason that uh, the opposition are not uh, 
uh, are obfuscating, who are not prepared to, uh, to come out and indicate where these savings are, is that those savings affect uh, people and sensitive interest groups. The honourable member for Fadden. Order. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. Has Australian Airlines now hired contract crew enough to man their entire Airbus A300 fleet? Have the pilots been hired from Japan Air Services, formerly Toa Domestic Airlines of Japan? Have official protests been received from Japan Air Services at this action or from the Japanese aviation officials at this action? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I understand that uh, Australian Airlines now does have a full complement of Airbus crew and that uh, some of those uh, cr crew were, were obtained uh, from Japan. I understand that the nationality of the pilots involved is American rather than Japanese. As uh, regards to any official protests having been lodged about that, I'm not, I'm not aware of them. The Honourable Member for Port Adelaide. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Community Services and Health. I draw the Minister's attention to a statement by the Leader of the Opposition on the 7.30 report on the 14th of December, where he blamed the government— Order. Order. The member for Morton on a point of order. Any statement by a member of this side of the House is not a matter for a minister of that the side of that chamber to be responsible order, for order, in we have, with standing We orders. will hear the question and then I will decide well, whether it's in order. Where the Leader of the Opposition blamed the government for the ongoing delay in the release of the Opposition's seventh health policy <laughs> and stated that we're having great difficulty extracting the costing from the government and to get the costings right we need their costings and they're not making them available at the moment so I'll certainly hope we'll be able to and I'll hope you'll have the government's costings too. Can the Minister advise the House as to whether the government regularly publishes the real costs of the Medicare program. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Order. Order. I... The member for Morton, by way of interjection there, at attempted to suggest that by allowing members to have a preamble on their question, then I should start to rule those preambles out of order. I'd be quite happy to adopt that proposal it would mean, however, that most of the questions that are asked would be out of order. And I think that the House has accepted that the House would prefer that members provide ministers with some information on which ministers can answer the questions to them. So we won't have any more of those interjections from the member for Morton. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Port Adelaide for his question. And yes, uh, I. Uh, have had drawn to my attention the rather extraordinary statement by the Leader of the Opposition uh, about this problem of costings. It does seem to me the latest in a long series of excuses as to why this now, I suppose, the most awaited health policy in this country's history uh, is still not uh, before us. Uh, in answer to the Member for Port Adelaide, let me point out that uh, those figures as relates to the government costings uh, appear in the budget papers, they appear in my department's explanatory notes. They appear in the Departmental Annual Report and the Health Insurance Commission Annual Report, so that uh, if you put all of those documents together, it does require a little work, but if you put all of those documents together, you can be very clear indeed about the costing of the government's Medicare program. Indeed, it is uh, extraordinarily open. But not only have they that resource, because uh, quite constantly, departmental and HIC officers appear regularly before the Senate Estimates Committees and where they've answered regularly questions about the costing of the Medicare program. Uh, it does seem to me that uh, despite the uh, opposition leader's claim that the government's refusal to assist with costings is delaying his scheme somewhat, they've certainly never approached us for any costings. And I must say we'd be extremely willing to comply. But uh, I know that uh, the leader of the opposition's statement, as usual, is open to several interpretations. But certainly I can say that uh, nobody from the opposition side has approached the government uh, to help in relation to costings, uh, we of course would be very prepared to help them. It's clear they need help and uh, we would be uh, quite eager uh, to supply it. So when all that's put together, all one can say is either the statement of the Leader of the Opposition 
uh, means that he hasn't read the budget and hasn't read those papers, or he's providing just simply another excuse for the non-release of this policy. Now, of course, the opposition has had uh, five health shadow spokesmen and six health policies already, and uh, we have been waiting for this seventh health policy for some 18 months. Now, we do have the good news that it's likely, likely to be released in February or March, though I've got to say, I've got to say that the member of Ta for Tangney, the shadow spokesman for health, does cast some doubt on that when he said on the 21st, and I quote him, he told the West Australian newspaper on November 21st, my own view is that it will be released before the next election campaign. <laughs> so, though we're given, the, though we're given this uh, promise of... Uh, <laughs> Order. Though we're given this uh, promise uh, for February or March, uh, there is in the statement for the shadow spokesman himself a remaining sense of uncertainty. Now, it is becoming very clear to the Australian people that the real reason the uh, policy is not being released is that there is a significant division within the opposition ranks over the health policy. Between the economic rationalists who know, who know that you can't sell a soft policy and the wet shadow minister who wants that kind of policy. Uh, what we can say now... What? Order. I, I know that he... I know that the honourable shadow, I know the honourable shadow minister is supposed to be a dry, but uh, his performance on the pharmacy issue was described by one commentator as very wet indeed. So that he'd certainly, uh, he certainly moved over to that end <coughs> of the spectrum. Uh, the reason, of course, the basic reason, of course, this policy uh, has great problems in being released is that. It is obvious to the Australian public that uh, if you carry through the sorts of ideas that have been leaked by the Shadow Minister, then for lower and middle income earners you will pay more, even if it's possible, as it may well be possible, to reduce some of the costs to the better off. It's exactly the same policy that uh, we've had with the capital gains tax. It's got exactly the same uh, effects, uh, an opposite form of redistribution, that is easing the burden on some of the better off and increasing the burdens on the middle and uh, uh, less well-off in our community. Now, all I can say in response is that I am perfectly willing to provide all of those documents to the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Health Minister, and to facilitate that task, I'm even prepared to mark in red all the immediately relevant pieces. <laughs> the Honourable the Prime Minister. Ask a further question to be placed in the last time. <coughs> the Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Uh, Mr Speaker, I just uh, wish to add to uh, an answer that uh, was asked of me by the Honourable Member for O'Connor. And I, I have um, the report of the monitoring committee uh, that looked at the administration of the HEAC arrangements. It was chaired by Hugh Hudson, who was then chairman of the uh, Commonwealth Tertiary Education Commission. And in relation to, I think the honourable member's question went to uh, the time at which payments should be made and the circumstances under which refunds should be made. I just uh, refer to a couple of extracts from the committee's report, and they say that deadlines for payment of the charge varied from institution to institution, ranging from late January to mid-May. 37 of the institutions which have replied to the commission's letter to date, that is at the date of publication of this report, said that payment of the charge was a precondition of formal enrolment. It then goes on to say that the legislation provides that each institution will determine the date by which a student shall be formally enrolled. This acknowledges the variation in enrolment dates and procedures in various institutions. It goes on to say in relation to refund arrangements, almost all institutions indicated that they had made provision for refunds, although under strict guidelines. Most would only refund if the student withdrew before the deadline for payment or commencement of the sem semester, while some stated that they would only refund the charge if the student accepted a place at another institution. So uh, it confirms, I think, uh, what I said, and that is that the matter of the payment, the particular arrangements for payment and the particular arrangements for refunds were matters for institutions. And when, when students approached me as minister 
are seeking a refund, I referred them back to their institution because that's where the matter lay. Now, the uh, honourable member referred to the circumstances of a particular student. Uh, I don't know of the circumstances of every student around Australia. And although the honourable member is an incorrigible busy busybody and loves to know the personal circumstances of everybody, I think the, the, uh, the, rela the relationship between a student and his or her university should be a matter of confidence between them. Order. Order. The, order. the member for O'Connor will withdraw that remark. What's that? Even if he got her a refund? The member for O'Connor will withdraw the remark. I'll read. I don't have the, the member. I've called upon. I have called upon the member for O'Connor to withdraw that remark. Will the, the member for O'Connor withdraw the remark? I withdraw the remark. The member for O'Connor resume his seat. <laughs> I have. I present the annual report by the Auditor General of the Australian Audit Office for 1988-89. I also present the following audit reports of the Auditor General for 1989-90. Number 23, aggregate financial statements prepared by the Minister for Finance. Number 24, the Department of Employment, Education and Training. Number 26, the Department of Community Services and Health. And number 27, the Parliament House Construction Authority. The Honourable Minister. Leave of the House to move a motion to authorise the publication and printing. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. The Honourable Minister. I move one. This House, in accordance with the provisions of the Parliamentary Papers Act 1908, authorises the publication of the annual report of the Auditor General of the Australian Audit Office for 1988-89. An audit reports numbers 23, accompanied by the aggregate financial statement prepared by the Minister for Finance for the year ended 30 June 1989. Number 24, 26 and 27, the Order of the General for 1989-90. Two, that the reports be printed. And three, that the report number 24 be referred to the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training. And report number 26 be referred to the Standing Committee on Community Affairs. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. I present the, re the following report of the Joint Standing Committee on the new Parliament House. The second report relating to a community-based childcare centre in the parliamentary zone incorporating a dissenting report. The Honourable Minister. I move the report be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Pursuant to section 9b of the Public Service Act 1922, I present the annual report of the Joint House Department for 1988-89. The Honourable Member for Fadden. No, um, no the Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, papers are tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in Hansard in the votes and proceedings. I ask Leave of the House to move a motion to authorise the publication of the report of the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Is leave granted? <coughs> leave is granted. The Honourable Minister. That this House, in accordance with the provisions of the Parliamentary Papers Act 1908, authorises the publication of the report of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody with the inquiry into the death of uh, Jimmy Njanji. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Fadden. Mr Speaker, I wish to make a personal explanation. Does the Honourable Member claim to have been misrepresented? I do, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Member may proceed. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister, in his speech at the um, Richmond RAAF base last Friday, the 15th of December, in which he thanked the RAAF for their service during the present airlines dispute, in his speech said, and I quote, in expressing that widespread gratitude today, I don't want to spoil the occasion with undue political partisanship, but I cannot let pass in silence the amazing hypocrisy of the opposition spokesman on aviation, one David Jull, in attempting to add his voice to the national expression of thanks to the Defence Forces. After spending the last few months doing nothing but support the Pilots Federation, including questioning the safety of RAAF flights, which led to a specific repudiation of it by Air Vice Marshal Radford, Mr Joel issued a press statement yesterday vouching for your professional and dedication. If you think that's breaking a U-turn, you're right. Mr Deputy Speaker, I have gathered together all my public statements, transcripts and press releases since the beginning of the airline dispute. On not one occasion have I mentioned the operations or the safety of the RAAF. I deny that. I have never been repudiated by Air Vice Marshal Radford and I uh, would table those documents for the Prime Minister to clean his mind on the matter. Is leave granted to table? Order. Leave's not granted. <coughs> the Honourable Member for Goldstein. Order. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. The Leader of the Opposition will behave himself. The Honourable Speaker, Member for Goldstein. Uh, 
I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Has the honourable member claimed to have been misrepresented? I do, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member may proceed. In his answer to me, the treasurer said that Brian Tui runs me. That is not true. Indeed, the very reason why I've been a thorn in so many political sides is that nobody runs me. I'm generally regarded as being too independent for my own good. And if you look at today's notice paper, you'll see examples of questions which embarrass the government come from many sources, none well, of which I, is Brian Tui. I think Tui. the member's gone to the extent to which he needs to. I've received a letter from the Honourable Leader of the Opposition proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the failure of the Hawke government's economic policy, which is having a devastating effect on the living standards of Australian families. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Opposition uh, takes the opportunity of the Parliament resuming to move uh, this matter of public importance, the failure of the Hawke government's economic policy, which is having a devastating effect on the living standards of Australian families. And I'll substantiate just with one quotation that motion that we put forward contained within the uh, matter we wish to discuss. Taken from the document headed Living Standards, edited by uh, and prepared by Rob Dippelsman of the uh, Legislative Research Service of the Department of the Parliamentary Library, a person, a section and an institution that is respected by all, save and except after today, from the Minister for Community Services, Social Security. Who came in and bagged it and why? Let me read just one salient quotation from it. Referring to Australia's performance in terms of living standards, the statistics group of the uh, Legislative Research Service says the following. Our performance in the mid and late 1980s has been especially poor for wage and salary earners. After tax average weekly earnings in 1988-89, and listen to this, bought less than they did at any time since 1973-74. In other words, in seven years, we've gone back 17 years, prepared by the most respected institution in this parliament back to the beginning of what was what they inherited, the beginning of the Whitlam years, back 17 years, the extent to which uh, the parliamentary uh, library's analysis on living standards indicates the effect of high interest rates, high taxes and high inflation. And if you take a line through what that is for the future under Labor, the future is bleak indeed. This government is out of ideas, it's out of integrity, it's out of touch and it's unquestionably out of time. And it will soon be out of office, as the honourable member says. The reality is, in the period since they've uh, come in, they've quadrupled our net foreign debt to approximately $110 billion. They've raised the home loan interest rate to 17 per cent and above. They've delivered a rate of inflation stuck at about 8 per cent. They are the highest taxing government in post-war history, and the research bears out just how they have crushed the living standards of Australian families. All this and more. And when you ask them what their economic policies are for the future, they can is only indicate more of the same. This overt reliance on monetary policy and high interest rates, and a marked contrast to the coordinated program brought down by the opposition in the Economic Action Plan. Now, I want to come back to the living standards, which is the essence of the matter. But much of it, of course, relates to the sorts of things that were touched upon by some ministers in the parliament today. Mr Howe is talking about Labor's capital gains tax. The minister was talking about Labor's capital gains tax. This, you'll recall, was the tax they were never going to introduce. You'll recall the words there will be no capital gains tax. There is an interesting journal which is published um, in the US Journal of Accountancy in December of this, month, uh, of this year, has uh, done a comparative chart on capital gains tax around the world. And the longest line indicating the heaviest impost in the world of any capital gains tax is no other 
than Australia. Australia. And they seek to represent the capital gains tax that they vowed never to introduce, and they seek to represent our undertaking to abolish that capital gains tax as having some effect on the so-called social wage. Well, let me tell the House that in the most recent figures that are available for financial year 87-88, just have a look at who paid that capital gains tax under Labor. Where were the wealthy in paying it? Well, let me tell you what the figures show. Of firstly the individuals and then the companies that paid the capital gains tax, 85 per cent, pretty high percentage, 85 per cent of the individuals who paid capital gains tax in 87, 88 earned less than $50,000 income, but more to the point, nearly 70 per cent had an income less than $35,000. And of the companies who paid capital gains tax, 87 per cent had a taxable income under $100,000, and 65 per cent of those companies earned less than $50,000. Now you tell the 750,000 small businesses why you want to levy this impost on them. Or to the working man who has a small amount to invest, perhaps to save for a rainy day, and it starts raining like hell under you economically, and he's forced, in fact, to liquidate that asset and pay the sort of capital gains tax you impose. You know that small business is so undercapitalised that it is constantly, constantly foregoing so much of its profit just to put it back into the business to keep going. And in the case of many, in the hope that at some point there will be a reasonable capital gain on which they will get a reward for all the effort and the investment that they've put in. And that's why we're abolishing the capital gains tax and replacing it with a speculative gains tax instead of the levy that you, will, you have been and will be imposing. That's the sort of thing. And that's why, I think, this government has been forced to attack us on a capital gains tax. Because the other sorts of measures that we are pointing out for most Australians in the Economic Action Plan and the Tax and Expenditure Statement, they've not been able to grapple with. I make, I'll be quite frank with you. I think uh, just about everyone on this side would agree that when we looked at many of the areas to cut back expenditure, we expected that day after day, some of those massive savings that we're making, we might be belted about on. We showed a fair amount of guts in approving in the party room $2.7 billion in expenditure savings. In expenditure savings. And we thought they'd be up each day attacking us. You know why they're not? Because they can't because the overwhelming majority of the Australian people say that savings such as what we are going to save on the unemployment relief scheme, where we say to Australians, if you've got the capacity to work, you damn well ought to get out and work. Damn well ought to get out and work. And in the fair policies we're pursuing, we're seeking to be fair to all those people in the workforce who are paying the taxes to provide those sorts of payments. And that we execute our duty for compassion by saying to those who can't get a job after nine months, there are, in fact, special provisions for you and there will be a training scheme attached to the unemployment relief plan. Where have you been in here day after day attacking us on that? You can't because you know we're right. And don't give me the hypocrisy on living standards of listening to some minister come in here saying because we're going to abolish the capital gains tax, the social wage will go down. The fact is, although he hates this report, he was unable to dispute the figures in the paper that relate to living standards. And just remember, when you hear this waffle about a social wage that he was going on with, that social wage is paid by high taxes, which are paid by the great bulk of Australians who are out in the workforce. Certain fundamental points that have to be remembered. Now, the reality is that uh, we've been called back here spent most of the morning discussing a travesty of justice in the way in which the Privileges Committee operated this morning. But this government, at the same time, comes in here and talks about things like the capital gains tax and the like. 
Well, what's the reaction out in the community, the way in which they're conducting the economy? Let me just read uh, two elements of Business Review Weekly. Two quick polls. Foreign exchange poll. The uh, Business Review Weekly published earlier this month their poll, their Forex poll that they do annually. And Treasurer Paul Keating was given scores of three to six out of ten for his performance in 1989, which they say, well, I would think it's too generous, but at least the, at least the BRW says was a lot worse than Forex dealers scored him a year earlier. This year, just over 50 uh, respondents gave Keating a quote pass mark of five or better, compared with 79 who failed him. 79 who failed him. And as one said, and I quote, I feel morally responsible and embarrassed to be working in an industry that's been so duped by a man who has obviously treated us as morons. And so you could go on. Modesty prevents me from, modesty prevents me from reading all the details on this week's BRW poll, but I will. Well, I'm tempted to read just a little of it. The opening paragraph, the opening paragraph is two thirds of the chief executives of Australia's top companies expect Andrew Peacock to lead the Liberal and National parties into government at the next federal election. And the, it goes on to say, it goes on to say, the po well, you can join with the minority, but it'll ju be just that, the minority. It goes on to say, the poll reveals that business is disenchanted that business is disenchanted with the Labor government and the release of the economic action plan shows that 63 per cent of the chief executive officers are, quote, favourably influenced by the plan. Of those who regard it unfavourably, the figure is 3 per cent. 3 per cent. Not bad. In terms of the government, in terms of the disenchantment, it says, the disenchantment is there. Nearly two out of three chief executives, 62 per cent, rate the Hawke government's performance over the past three months in relation to business as, quote, bad. The government's good rating has slipped from a poor 10 per cent in September to an even dismal, more dismal, 7 per cent in December. Now, notwithstanding that, notwithstanding that, this government has a treasurer, let me tell you, that attended a meeting of the Business Council of Australia the week before last, and after a long monologue on the economy, then told them, and I quote, listen, listen, he said to the Business Council, the time, no, he left that out this time, listen, the time for maturity has come. If you don't publicly support our policy on capital gains tax, we won't deal with you if we win government. Now, the arrogance we see in here is the sort of arrogance it's not put up with by people outside, let alone the business community. And it's not surprising that this arrogant, poorly read, ludicrously self-confident, uh, vacuous man should then get on the phone the weekend after that ridiculous statement of berating uh, the executives and uh, apologise to a range of them. And this is the reason that we bring this matter before the parliament today. It doesn't matter whether it's high rates for a dark decade warns Button, Keating cool on interest rate fall, berating of the Business Council, the berating of the parliamentary research that's done on living standards. The reality is this government is on the nose. And it's on the nose for reasons that I've put before and in coming to a conclusion for the year remind you that I said to you that I felt there were five steps that were behind the policy paralysis of this government. One was the politics of the big lie. One was the politics. Second was the politics of the quick fix. Third was the policy, the politics of the personal abuse. Fourthly, the politics of hypocrisy. And fifthly, the politics of confusion. And we substantiate these with the following. One, the politics of the big lie. Quote, there will be no capital gains tax, end of quote. Quote, no child will live in poverty by 1990, quote. quote interest rates will fall, end of quote, or the classic of all, the pilot's dispute is over. That's the politics of the big lie. Now the politics of the quick fix, race Kodak, Coronation Hill, bank interest subsidy, 
And this Social Security Minister comes in here and says, what are we going to do if we lose 400 million? I'll tell you what we do. We won't have to pay Kodak, we won't have to pay compensation to the banks, and we won't have to do that deal on bank interest, for starters. Yeah. Yeah. Or the airline. Well, yes, sir, I, I, I should have left the uh, airlines in there in a previous one, I think, uh, added up there. A matter of great substance. Then there is, of course, the politics of the personal abuse. Elliot, Parbo, the Pilots Federation, and of course, as I said, after the, after the pensioner, pensioner Bell was abused as a silly old bugger, no one deserves to be Prime Minister of this country who calls an aged pensioner a silly old bugger. And then the politics of hypocrisy, Keating's rorts, the exclusion of trade unions from cap capital gains tax, the politics of confusion, Blewett and state against Staples, Howe against Keating, Keating on enterprise unions, Richardson versus Karen, uh, Keating and Button versus Hawke on interest Order. rates. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition's time has expired. You have no substance the Honourable Leader of the Opposition's time has expired. I'll ask the member to resume the seat until uh, members of my left of uh, The Honourable Member, the Honourable Member for Ford. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It is most interesting to hear the Leader of the Opposition talk in a, a cynical and transparent attempt to cloak a veneer of concern for Australian families. Quite an extraordinary uh, to hear him speak about disarray and confusion when we have in today's Australian coalition disarray on interest rates deepens. Where do we stand? What is their policy? Who do we believe? And what is going to happen? The only person we can believe, of course, is in fact our own people. It is expect also extraordinary to look at this question of concern for Australian families when we see the Leader of the Opposition and the former Treasurer and Member for Benilong preside over a doubling of unemployment in 1982-83. And what was their concern for the 600,000 families who were breadwinners and thrown out of work? We hear again today the Leader of the Opposition tell us people should go out and get jobs. We're not paying them for that. The same kind of treatment which he dealt out to the 600,000 families in 1982-83. And let me assure you, Leader of the Opposition, those families have not forgotten that, and they know when you say you will cut them off benefits, that is exactly what you will do. They also acknowledge that the work that this government has done in creating one and a half million jobs means that they are not going to have to make that kind of decision. Those Australians have been given dignity, have been given the opportunity to work and, I might add, the opportunity to participate in the economic life of this country, not only for themselves but for their families. That's what care for families is. That is what giving families part of the Australian way of life is about. It is not simply throwing them on the economic scrap heap. Uh, life for families in Australia is also about having a home. And to hear the Leader of the Opposition speak today, we must ask, what about those thousands of Australian families who were denied the opportunity to build a house when the houses built in Australia in 1982-83 fell to a mere 105,000? We might also ask how many families had to struggle to make ends meet when their teenagers uh, were put on the unemployment heap, denied even a start in life denied an opportunity to remain at school until year 12 and so enter our expanded tertiary institutions. The kind of bleating that we hear from the Leader of the Opposition is simply that. It has no substance. And today, of course, we hear about the so-called Economic Action Plan, in which he describes, in which describes absolutely and explicitly that they will use high interest rates as, the chief, as their chief economic weapon. We must ask, what are they going to do in order to assure that Australian families will not be hurt? We know, of course, they will. The Economic Action Plan is decidedly anti-family. Indeed, it cites whole ranges of families. If one is a migrant family, an unemployed family, an Aboriginal family, for a start, you are not counted as families under the guise of the, econo of the uh, opposition's Economic Action Plan. Indeed. In total contrast to this, the government has consistently implemented pro-family policies. I have mentioned the one and a half million new jobs in which breadwinners 
have again been given an opportunity to provide for their families. The halving of teenage unemployment, which indeed has removed the stress for those families where their teenagers are not on unemployment benefits but are in fact participating in the educational and economic life of this country, to which they are entitled to a real chance in life. The fact that the school retention rate has doubled from a third to two thirds has, is in fact a very real demonstration of this government's commitment to our young people in Australia. We as well see increased family allowances, indexed for the very first time in our history. We also see landmark family allowance supplement, which, is which lifts children from poverty. Housing construction, risen from 930,000 homes, uh, risen to 930,000, which are homes which have been constructed in Australia since March 83. 50 per cent higher, ensuring that 150,000 families per year have the opportunity to own their own home. And indeed, home ownership has gone up from 71 to 73.4 per cent. We also see a, uh, an expansion in the number of childcare places from 46,000 to 114,000, with a further 30,000 promised, places promised. That is about treating families as a total. That is about recognising the needs of all families in Australia, not simply the rich families. It is about all families. We, of course, have also seen small business and farmers benefit from these advances. In particular, the small business tax rate from a prohibitive 78 cents in the dollar is now 40, which was 40, uh, now. Uh, to 47 cents in the dollar. We are always interested to hear uh, the opposition speak about their high our high taxes when, in fact, it was they who, who had and maintained that very high 78 cents in the dollar tax. Surely that is anti-small business. What this government has done is bring down those taxes to 47 cents in the dollar. This is indeed what we are talking about. Commentators on the economic action plan see it simply as a recipe for slow growth, weak investment, rising unemployment, falling real wages, high interest rates and an overvalued dollar. The Australian people, however, are not going to be misled. They recognise the opposition parties for what they are, the same as they recognised them in the recent Queensland elections. And they understand exactly what they stand for. They have no capacity to deal with the Australia and the Australian family, and also to deal effectively with interest rates. It seems that simply the only thing we hear from the opposition is in fact to make statements and to scaremonger in an irresponsible way. What, in fact, we see from our government, and which has been placed on record and as part of the process already, is, in fact, a process and a new fair deal for all families. These were brought, uh, the tax cuts which were brought in with the April statement, which has been, have been adjusted and to make a more progressive uh, delivery for those families. What, in fact, means is that families now have a system of taxation which is acknowledged to be fair and to be just. Indeed, the Australian Institute of Family Studies sees the package as appears to redress the erosion of family income since 1976. The indexation of family benefits is an historically significant feature which will ensure that these payments will not be eroded in the future. Indeed, the Institute's analysis believes that 70 per cent of families will gain and are gaining more than $1,000 per annum under the current tax scales, as instituted under the April statement. Of course, 48 per cent of the cost of this package goes to the 30 per cent of households which have dependent children. This new fair deal for Australian uh, families is implemented as part of an agreement between the government and the ACTU on wages and taxes. We hear the derision of the opposition in terms about our, uh, our ability to work within the wages concord. We also hear uh, derision 
from the opposition in terms of the social wage. But let me assure you that very many of our Australian families understand exactly what is meant by the social wage. They know because they are living out there and they are enjoying the benefits of that social wage, which is not just limited to those people who are rich and powerful or hope to be powerful in our community, but in fact the social wage is a wage that is for all families in our community. Indeed, we, we see while the uh, government's strategy has been to assist low-income families, there are a whole series and range of programs which address all issues for all families. And of course, one has to mention the historic Medicare. Indeed, without Medicare, very many of our Australian families, women, children and all, would not have access to healthcare in our community, which we see as the right of all Australians uh, to have proper health care. And indeed, as we have heard the minister here on a number of occasions say, Australians now recognise and value that program for what it is, a fair and just program of health for all Australians, not people who can merely afford private health insurance and who's, who have an ability to pay, but quality medical so, uh, services regardless of means. And let me assure the opposition that any attempt to tamper with Medicare is in fact right striking at the fabric of our Australian families and children. Indeed, we have also seen the revived housing industry so that housing levels are now at a record level. We have talked about childcare and indeed the way in which the, uh, the way in which childcare places have been created so that what people have is is quality affordable childcare for those people who are going to work. We also have created opportunities for the excluded and disadvantaged, and those figures which show us that in fact we have double school retention rates also mean that very many of those people who are our poorest and most disadvantaged are now part of the system. Indeed, I, have seen, I only recently was at a graduation for part of a, a program which uh, acknowledged those people who were disadvantaged and gave them the benefit of 12 months study at a higher education institution to enable them to move into the tertiary sector which is something which is the right of every Australian, not simply the right of those people who happen to have money. Indeed, the days of the opposition believing that they are born to rule are well and truly gone. At the heart of all of this economic action plan is a return to the privilege of the 50s, a return to the kind of society in which the rich had and the poor had nothing. And, and, and Australia will not and will never buy that kind of process. And indeed, the economic action plan and the kind of bleatings that we see here for families are known and recognised for what they are, a demand for a return to privilege. And it will not happen and it is not going to happen. Another group in our community who have been who, whose needs have been addressed are those of sole parents. And we see, in fact, a whole number of programs in which not only has the sole parents' benefit been indexed, but a number of programs which have ensured that sole parents have an opportunity to get back into the workforce through the provision of training, through the provision of childcare, and also now through the provision of child support. One of the most dramatic reforms within Australian society in which we as a government have challenged the community to pay and to accept financial responsibility for those children which won parents. Surely it is not asking too much of the community at large to suggest and to uh, acknowledge that we must accept financial responsibility for one's own children. That is what child support has done and in doing so has meant that a quarter of a million of our children now have received and are receiving maintenance for the first time in their lives. And maintenance at a level which is meaningful, which does not involve long and, courtly, uh, long and costly court cases and battles, but is in fact part of their right and their heritage. Indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, a whole range of uh, family allowances, family assistance have all been part of our whole program. And indeed, uh, in January this year, we will see a further rise in indexation for the family allowance, which will be uh, indexed on, uh, as it continues. 
And those al indexation covers not just family allowance, but it covers the mother's guardian's allowance. It covers the child disability allowance. It covers a multiple birth payment, and of course, it covers the double orphans pension. These are benefits which, in fact, are part of a total program of this government in recognising the needs of a whole range of individual families. And just as, in terms of our ta the tax measures and the reforms within the taxation department, whereby we have taken money and ensured that those people who were not previously paying tax are now paying tax. We have redistributed that money to our families through family allowance and, and through family allowance supplement and through other benefits. That is what this government is about in caring for families. It is a commitment which is pro-family, which ensures that all families in Australia are part and share in the economic growth, vitality and development of this country as a right. The honourable member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Let me begin in bipartisan spirit and congratulate uh, the member for Ford for the style of what will be her final address in this parliament. Not in the substance of that address, of course, but on the style of the address. I felt sorry for you, Mary, because uh, you had to make a desperate attempt. You had to make a desperate attempt to defend to defend the indefensible, the failure of the Hawke government's economic policy which, as our matter of public importance says, is having a devastating effect on the living standards of average Australians. And there's no way you could defend that, no matter how hard you tried. It is a despicable record, a grossly inadequate record of economic management over the last few years. Let me not concentrate too much on that record. I think what we should do in the final parliament of, uh, of, this, uh, of the 1980s is to focus on where we're going over the next five to ten years or so. We really should have had a debate today on alternative visions for this country going into the 90s and then beyond the year 2000. And as is so typical of this government, those that ought to be here, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, are nowhere to be seen. One's probably gone back to his holiday at Kirribilli House and the other one is probably still studying Economics 1. But there's no no contribution by the leaders of this government as to uh, where this, they would like to see this country go in the course of the next 10 years. And the people of Australia will have a very clear choice in the early part of next year between two quite different economies. On the one hand, we can uh, continue on down the path that we've seen this government follow towards what Rod Carnegie has described as becoming the white trash of Asia, or we can uh, Look forward to this country emerging as a major economic and political force in the Asia-Pacific region over the course of the next uh, 10 years. Now, I think it's disturbing when you look at the run of the last two Labor governments, but there is an important similarity in their attitude to economic policy and economic management. In both cases, they developed what could only be described as a handout mentality. In the first period under Whitlam, of course, Thousands and thousands of people in this country were introduced to the welfare mentality, a concept where you came along and put your hand out rather than determine what contribution you could or should make in this country. People started to act as if the country owed them a living before they asked themselves the question, what sort of living should they be making on behalf of this country? And of course, under the Hawke government, We've had the internationalisation of that handout mentality, where we've now taken the view that we should borrow and borrow incessantly to sustain our domestic lifestyle, to put our hand out in the international community, to act like the world owes us a living before we ask ourselves the question, what sort of weight and what sort of role should we be pulling in the international economy? It's interesting that Labor governments have traditionally have some similar features. They always end up in debt. They always end up with high interest rates. They always end up with offering no way out of the mire, no hope, uh, just more of the same. And what we observe these days is the Treasurer and the Prime Minister wandering around this country in their own fictional world. It's a world where there aren't any economic problems. You don't have any debt problems. It's all private sector problems. Indeed, the Treasurer goes as far as to say it's a good thing that some of these entrepreneurs are getting into trouble. It's going to reduce our debt. Fictional world, no balance of payments problems, 
They'll duck the one coming on Friday. No inflation problems. We don't suffer from any lack of exports or lack of productivity. It doesn't matter that our credit rating has been downgraded twice in the last three years by both major international rating agencies. We aren't, aren't difficultly exposed to the international economy. We're not vulnerable, they say. We're not uh, subject to falling commodity prices or slowing world growth or a flight in the debt markets. There are no children living in poverty in Australia. At least we have about a week to go before we can determine whether that commitment was met. Australia's chemists, of course, well, they're just a greedy and stupid bunch. They've got nothing to contribute to this country. The pilots dispute, well, that's, that's over. That ended some weeks or months ago. The business community, it's got no reason to complain. It's done very well under this government, they say, and so they go on. And, of course, most importantly under this government, interest rates are always about to fall. The fact that they've gone up so massively in recent days, over the last 20 months or so, gets buried in the argument they're always about to fall. And I'm fascinated in the media in recent days asking us what's going to happen to interest rates under us? And they forget to focus on the fact that it's this crowd that has put them up and put them up massively in recent months as an outright admission of total policy failure. And the Treasurer and the Prime Minister are now running around the country trying to create the impression that, of course, if interest rates come down, then they've been successful. Their policy is working. What errant nonsense that is. Of course interest rates are going to come down because the level to which you've put them will stop this place. This country will slow down dramatically in the course of the next few months and interest rates will of course come off. They will of course fall under the weight of a very, very significant slowing of activity and the possibility of a recession. But what else? What else is there to offer beyond that? What hope do you offer beyond that point? And the answer is nothing. We have to sedate the economy, you say, to slow down demand and to get interest rates down. And then what? What do you do next? How do you get the economy to pick up again without interest rates going back up? And the reason is, of course, you haven't solved any of the basic problems. The debt problem is still there. The balance of payments problem is still there. The inflation problem is still there. There's this fiction going on around the place that we'll get interest rates down and therefore our strategy is working. Well, nobody out there is going to believe you because everyone knows that you've got no policy solution to keep them down and to keep them going down in a sustainable way over the course of the next several years. Now, I'm fascinated how in recent days the Treasurer and the Prime Minister have both sought to mock me as I've suggested that there is a clear-cut alternative that would see this country emerge as a major economic and political force in the course of the next few years. We can do it. We can boost our production. We can boost our productivity. We can boost our exports. We can start to save more. We can build the right sort of country, but it will take some decisions, decisions that you have consistently refused to take, principally because you've turned up and saw Bill Kelty and he said no, no in every single case. You'll need decisions about smaller government. You'll have to cut government expenditure. You'll have to reduce government regulation of business and the rest of us. You'll have to lower tax significantly. You'll have to change the capital gains tax. You'll have to develop a simpler and a flatter tax system. You've got to have a system where there will be fewer business enterprises run by government and many more business enterprises run by the private sector. You will have to have a policy of privatisation. You will have to see the process of wage determination shifted from the smoky back rooms of Canberra, meetings between Kelty and uh, Keating and others setting wage rates, to where those negotiations take place at the workplace level on an enterprise basis where, where wages can move more in line with productivity rather than simply in response to the exercise of industrial muscle. You can build a world where there'll be much more stable interest rates and much lower interest rates than has been a feature of this government and of course you can have a world where there will be much more stable exchange rates. There'll be lower protection, lower input costs to business and, of course, importantly, significant changes in a, the nature of our transportation and communications and other parts of our infrastructure that will give you significantly lower costs in most of those areas. If you clean up the waterfront, you can get significantly lower waterfront costs. If you inject foreign competition into coastal shipping, you can get significantly lower shipping costs around the coastline of Australia. If you inject competition into the airline industry now, for example, if you allowed interlining, you would have significantly lower airfares in this country. You can have significantly lower 
rail costs and more efficient road and rail systems, significantly lower telephone charges, and so I can go on. There is a different world. There is a world that will give this country a chance of emerging as the major economic and a major economic and political force in the Asia-Pacific region by the end of this, uh, this uh, forthcoming decade, but it will require those decisions to be taken. It will be a world where there will be lower inflation and lower interest rates and lower tax and more and sustainable growth and higher wages, of course, through higher productivity. And the Prime Minister has said many times it can't be done. We'll look around the world. We have been the exception of the 1980s. That's the story. Look at the United States in the early 1980s, for example. They got much stronger growth, much lower inflation, much lower interest rates, no increase, indeed a fall in unemployment, moved into the longest period of sustained growth in the post-war period. Everyone else has been working towards this different sort of world. This is the only country which has been out of step in the 1980s, and it's not going to be in the Order. 1990s. The want to make the sure that's the case. The honourable member's time has expired. The honourable member for Petrie. The, speaker, the um, opposition has raised the matter of public importance today, which, which uh, goes to the matter of living standards. And it seems to me that there are a number of components of this thing that we uh, call this construct called living standards. There are wages, for instance, which are an important part of determining anyone's living standards. There are interest rates, which may at the same time impose a burden or a cost on a family. But of course, for those who save and invest, high interest rates can be uh, uh, advantageous to an income. And of course, there are those public goods and services and transfer payments, things that we call on this side the social wage, Medicare and family allowance, family allowance supplement and so on. And I don't think you can have an intelligent debate on living standards unless you canvass all parts that make up the living standard, wages, interest rates, transfer payments. And I want to pose one simple question to the opposition. If, if wages are such a large component of Australians' living standards, why do they consistently argue before the Industrial Relations Commission that there should be no real wage increases amongst the workforce? Why is it for the last six years that the opposition says at every national wage case, do not raise wages? Are they suggesting in that instance that wages have nothing to do with living standards? No, they don't. What they argue before the Industrial Relations Commission is that they should lower the real wages of Australian workers and, by implication, lowering real wages lowers living standards. So it's a nonsense to suggest that the opposition has any prescription or, indeed, any desire to raise living standards, at least in so much as wages are concerned. The same is true for interest rates. The, uh, the Leader of the Opposition, of course, has got into all sorts of muddles recently by being unable to explain how he believes interest rates will vary in the, next, in the life of the next government. And I'll go into that point in a moment. The point is that they don't have a sufficient prescription to bring about a sustained fall in interest rates, which are currently a real burden on especially young families and homeowners. We understand that. The question is not uh, the flick of a switch to bring interest rates down, it's how do we manage to get them down. The opposition spokesman on Treasury matters described an, an, another world, a world where all was wonderful. This is a serious debate. This is not something you put up in, a, in the schoolroom on a blackboard to say, wouldn't we like this shopping list of things? High wages, low interest rates, no industrial conflict, terrific. How do you get it? How do you get it? That's the question. We've already delivered most of it on this side, but in the context of this country earning its living, you have to have a process to deliver these things. Now, the wages accord, that is the agreement that the government and the trade unions have held for the last six to seven years, has delivered these sorts of things. What we've delivered is a trade-off. It is true that that nominal wages, sorry, money wages, nominal wages, have fallen behind inflation. There's no doubt in the world about that. No one would suggest that that is not true. But what are the trade-offs? The trade-offs have been an enormous increase in the number of jobs that people have. There are studies that suggest 
that today there are something like 300,000 Australian earners who would not be in the workforce if we did not have a social agreement between the trade union movement and the Labor government that would hold down nominal wages, not massively reduce them as the opposition wish, wish hold them down to reasonable levels so that we might compete with the rest of the world. One of the outcomes of that prescription on our part has been 300,000 jobs, more than would otherwise have been the case created in the last six years. 300,000 earners, main breadwinners and of course uh, their partners and the children they support. Perhaps a million Australians today would be in much poorer circumstances had we not have an agreement with the trade union movement over the setting of nominal wages. That's one of the greatest outcomes of the Accord. And of course, the Accord brings to government a whole new instrument of government. If you had no agreement between the trade union movement and the government, you would have to rely on other measures in order to control the general level of wages and costs in this country. And those other measures, of course, are government expenditure or monetary policy the cost of borrowing, interest rates. So if you don't have a wages accord which is able to deliver to you lower nominal wages and deliver to you an extremely high level of job creation, what's the alternative? The alternative is that you have to cut back demand in the economy in the current circumstances only through the public sector. Now it's pretty difficult to cut more severely than indeed the opposition and the government would wish, because you then have to go to substantial monies or monies that make up a substantial income of people in this country, pensioners and low-income families who receive income from family allowance and family allowance supplement. So you have to decide, don't you? It's not all win or all lose. It's not zero sum. The, you have to decide, do we keep as many people in work as possible and give them a reasonable income and a reasonable chance to get a house and to educate their children, or should we simply throw a large swathe of people out of the workforce, take the demand pressures off the economy and let the rest get on down the road? That's not fair. It is not fair. We've been able to keep the highest proportion of people in work, at the same time, look after those who are either unemployed or beyond work, that is, they've retired. So the people who are on pensions in this country are receiving, in historic terms, their highest income ever, their highest real income ever, because we've been able to devote sufficient resources to the public sector to pay for those pensions and then also to, to pay for the, for the children's payments, the family allowance and family allowance supplement. So in essence, we've reached an historic agreement that's able to, to deliver all round a better deal for Australian families. Now, the alternative, of course, is to suggest that you will screw a great deal more out of the workforce, that is, that you will only give wage rises according to increases in productivity that the workforce can generate. Well, that's good in theory, but it's very difficult, for instance, if in the one factory you have workers who are represented by six or, six, six or seven different trade unions and who in fact may work on different machinery and that if you're lucky enough to be assigned to a certain machine that increases the, increases the productivity and output of your factory, then the deal is that some of the workers in that factory will be assigned higher real wages because of the investment of the boss in a new machine, in effect, but not all can share in that. It is simply unrealistic to suggest in the real world where workers are unionised according to their skills and, in fact, you can pay some workers in a factory higher productivity and not others. We exist in the real world. What we're attempting to do through this thing we call award restructuring is one, to recognise that workers of different skills do work together on the same factory floor. Two, though, they should be recognised 
for the improvement in their skills and productivity. But not totally out of line or not totally out of hand with their fellow workers. So we come to a situation where, where the airline pilots in this country saw themselves as being different and beyond all other workers in this same industry. There are 21 different unions in the airline industry, but only one wanted to be treated differently. Only one wanted a 30 per cent increase in income with no productivity trade-offs. It's a nonsense. But they could have received, as did the Qantas pilots, I think 12 or 15 per cent real increase or, or increase in money income if they'd stayed within a system which said we are prepared to reward you for productivity increases, provided that you can show the trade-offs in productivity and provided that you don't overstep the mark so that other unions in that same industry can also seek to gain some of the productivity increases. So that by and large, almost in a shuffling way, the Accord can to deliver to all workers in this country the ability to receive Order. real increases the in wages through productivity rights. The time rise. has expired. The debate is concluded. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Remuneration Tribunal 1989 Review Report. Okay. Uh, Mr Speaker has received messages from the Senate. Uh, a. Returning 28 bills without amendment or requests. B. Acquainting the House that the Senate has granted leave to the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade to meet during the sittings of the Senate on Monday 11 December 1989. And C. Acquainting the House that the Senate has, agreed, has granted leave to the Joint Select Committee on Migration Regulations to meet during the sitting of the Senate on Thursday 7 December 1989 from 3 pm to 4 pm for the purpose of considering its draft report. I do not propose to read these messages, which will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. Retrospective. Mr Speaker has received 12 messages from His Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to 23 bills which were passed by the Parliament in the last group of sittings. I do not propose to read the titles, which will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend laws relating to community services and health and for related purposes and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the next schedule in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. Okay. The Honourable Minister. The Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, aye. no. I think the ayes have it. Committee Chairman required. Mr Mildren. Minister. Mr Chairman, I'd like to indicate to the committee that the government proposes that amendments one to four, six to nine, 11, 13, 15 to 18 and 20 to 23 be agreed to, and that amendments 5, 10, 12, 14, 19 and 24 be disagreed to and amendments made in place of each of them. I suggest therefore that it may suit the convenience of the committee to consider amendments 1 to 4, 6 to 9, 11, 13, 15 to 18 and 20 to 23 together, and amendments uh, 5, 10, 12, 14, 19 and 24 together. Does the, the Minister's suggestion share the convenience of the committee? Does the, the procedure may take place? Uh, I move that amendments 1 to 4, 6 to 9, 11 to 13, 15 to 18 and 20 to 23 be agreed to. The question is that they, the amendments be agreed to. Those that are, the, the Honourable Member for Dawson. Yes. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in uh, Speaking to these amendments, um, as I would understand it, uh, these only came into our hands, or into my own hands, about an hour and a half ago. And I must say that we are taking things uh, completely on trust, but our uh, review of what has been put before, uh, forward to us uh, appears to us to uh, achieve the objects that the amendments did as they were presented to this House earlier in the first debate. 
and also in the Senate to fulfil the uh, requests or the uh, requirements at that time. Um, I do have some comments to make as far as just uh, questions to ask, and I'm just wondering if it's the appropriate time to ask them now. There's just some questions I have. Uh, while we have no intention of uh, disagreeing with the amendments, it will be important when they get to the Senate that we should have uh, some idea of what might happen in the procedures and as far as precedents being offered to the debating or the raising of motions in this regard. I'm just wondering if it's the appropriate time to talk about that now. Yes. Yes, if, if, if the, <coughs> the questions are relevant to the amendments, uh, the, 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 uh, the Honourable Member may yes. proceed. Um, there are two things that uh, come to our uh, notice just on the reading of these, is that uh, this procedure, as we envisaged, was going to be a fresh procedure that's uh, never before been adopted within the uh, Houses of Parliament in uh, Australia, within uh, this Commonwealth House of Parliament. And it just gives rise, rise to the question because what we had was a system before of uh, disallowable resolutions. In other words, resolutions could be put to this House and they had to be, uh, you had to disallow them in full and not in part. What we're doing at the moment is proposing a resolution or principles or uh, uh, statements being made uh, to this House uh, to set the guidelines for the charter, the contract and the principles. Now, because it's a new procedure, I notice that the uh, amendments indicate that uh, the, uh, the matters can be raised on notice of motion. In other words, uh, that if they're laid before the House for 15 days, uh, that a notice of motion can be given. I'm just wondering if there is uh, sufficient in the standing orders to provide for that, you know, that within those 15 sitting days, the opposition can raise a notice of motion uh, on this and what the form might be, and also, if it is to be debated, particularly within the 15 days, if precedents will be given by the Parliament so that those can actually be debated within the 15 days span. Now, uh, that's the question I ask, and uh, while the Minister may not be uh, familiar with it now, I would be happy if we could get some uh, type of indication on this before it goes to the, uh, the Senate, because as I realise, there is a need for action. We don't intend to... Uh, to delay it at this stage. Uh, all I can say is that uh, while these uh, resolutions take over from the amendments we proposed, and we did go into them with a great de deal of detail and uh, we understood them to be constitutionally correct, uh, I just uh, again hope that the resolutions or the amendments we're uh, debating now and will be agreeing to uh, do have the same constitutional effect of what it was before because the particular bill has been uh, dogged by a certain amount of rush and haste and cobbling together. Uh, as I understand it, there might have been other things the Minister might have wanted to amend in it himself, but uh, we just want to be given the assurance that in the course of preparation of these, while they seem to follow very closely our amendments that we prepared, that uh, they have uh, not had the same rush treatment as the Bill had on its introduction and uh, the uh, uh, the matters might have had over the last 24 hours. But uh, we are prepared to take it on that basis. And could I say to the Minister that uh, we do appreciate uh, the efforts he has made in this regard, even though they did come a little bit late, in approving of what basically are our amendments in an area where there is a lot of concern outside. I must say that the initial press releases that came from the Senate, or after the Senate debate, did cause a lot of concern out amongst the aged uh, people to the uh, situation where we have been as an opposition. I think the Democrats have been lobbied rather uh, heavily in this regard as indicating we were not in favour of the basic thrust of this report. We just go on record and say we never opposed it. We, uh, we submitted the amendments on the basis that would be full consultation with the industry and they'd be brought back before this House so that the Parliament itself could eventually approve the, uh, the contract and uh, also the, uh, the principles and the charter. So uh, we're quite happy to accept it. And uh, also uh, we uh, want to know that if there are any future amendments that may yet be necessary, uh, you know, g can give the assurance of this House that this is all the amendments you uh, propose at this stage and that uh, any of the other amendments that might be necessary, and I just mentioned one of them, it appears that in the community visitors aspect, um, 
that while this, if the bill itself applies to the nursing homes, the uh, hostels are omitted. And uh, we thought it was the government's intention of bringing, you know, of having the community visit apply to hostels as well as to uh, the nursing homes. So we'd like the assurance that uh, there will be no further amendments at this time. And if those other amendments uh, he deems necessary, uh, will they be uh, given uh, plenty of opportunity for consultation with the industry and also ourselves? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Chairman, in response to the uh uh, Member for Dawson, uh, first of all, let me say that I appreciate the, uh, uh, the spirit in which uh, he is, uh, is, has approached this uh, uh, stage of the, of the, of the uh, legislation, and I can certainly uh, uh, give him, in, in while I cannot obviously speak for the, uh, the Leader of the House and, and, and so on, I think it's uh, quite evident by the fact that the government uh, is, uh, is committed to this uh, bill going through. Uh, in, in this session, that uh, we have every intention of moving as rapidly as possible, uh, should there be, uh, in terms of the consultation uh, that will be required, and uh, particularly through the parliamentary break, to ensure that uh, uh, while respecting as much as possible the, uh, the, the extensive need for further consultation with industry, with uh, uh, both management and worker, as well as obviously uh, uh, with, the, with the consumer, that uh, we will act as quickly as possible to ensure that uh, uh, the legislation is not delayed in any way, shape or form, and because uh, as it's been our intention all along. And I think the, the process of this House, and I would uh, hope the Senate would uh, facilitate that. Uh, as far as uh, the prospect of any further amendments uh, to the bill, uh, the, the government has no intention of uh, any further amendments at this stage, and I can assure the member for Dawson that there will be plenty of uh, uh, opportunity, uh, should there be amendments to the bill, that they would be taken into account in the, in the, in the normal way. As far as community visitors are, are concerned, uh, the government's, uh, it is a new area of, of, age, of, of the, the aged care process uh, that we're, we're coming involved in, and for that reason the government uh, has decided to uh, initiate it and evaluate it in, in two states uh, on a trial basis to see to to make sure that we get it right. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, a lot of the that any pot potential problems uh, can be addressed at a, at a relatively smaller scale than rather than have to uh, address them right across the nation. And for that reason, there will be a pilot process in in those two states. And that, in that regard, that's why one of the major reasons why is being restricted to the nursing home uh, here at this stage, but uh, uh, in future, uh, subject to budget and, uh, and other aspects of its operation, uh, there is no necessarily, not necessarily, any, any restriction on the operation of the Community Visitor Scheme, subject to those uh, uh, conditions. Sorry? It will only apply only in nursing homes now. The question is that the motion or the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member Dawson. Uh, Mr. If you could also give me a response sometime this afternoon in connection with the manner of precedence in applying the uh, debate on the resolution for an affirmative vote and uh, an amendment, and also the manner in which uh, these uh, notices and principles and statements will be brought to the attention of the House. Member Dawson, that uh, sure. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those that appear say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. Uh, I move that uh, amendments 5, 10, 12, 14, 19 and 24 be disagreed to and amendments set out in the schedule circulate to honourable members be made in place of them and uh, give a brief explanation that uh, uh, discussions have taken place between the government and the opposition, and I understand that these, uh, this process is acceptable to the opposition, but uh, we'll very, very quickly uh, give reasons for offering the alternatives and that they provide a maximum time limit in which a notice of amendment may be moved to the Charter, the Agreement and the Principles uh, for Approval of Nursing Home Operators, that the time limits ensure that where members of Parliament have no problem with the wording of the Charter or the Agreement or the principles, these documents become, can become effective without the requirement for a full parliamentary debate. And these alternative amendments do not remove the intention of the Senate that the Parliament has the right to debate these 
documents. The question is that the amendments be agreed to, or at least that they be disagreed to. The honourable member. The question now is that the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report, a res report resolutions to the House. Those that depend say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Okay. The Honourable the Minister. Yes. Uh, you, you, I'm asking the Honourable Minister to move the report be adopted, and then on that question I'll call the Honourable Member Fatangi. I move the report be adopted. The question is a motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member Fatangi. Mr Deputy Speaker, there's just one point I would like to raise in relation to this bill, and that's the question of the new definition of the term proprietor of a pathology laboratory. And if I could make this request uh, through the Chair of the Minister. On several occasions, both in this House and in the Senate, we've asked the government for clarification on this matter. And uh, if the minister is not able to respond to me immediately, if he could take it on notice and perhaps drop me a short line this afternoon. The explanatory memorandum to the bill argues that the corporate structure of some pathology laboratories currently makes it difficult to identify who's the operator of the service. This amendment is said to be intended to overcome this problem. However, in spite of this explanation, it's still not clear to the opposition and not clear to the industry what the amendment can be expected to achieve. In cases where a laboratory is operated by a corporation or a number of equal partners, it's difficult to see how any one person can be made more responsible than another person for the operation of that laboratory. And therefore, I ask for the minister to explain precisely what the government intends to achieve by this amendment and how it will deal with the situation in which a pathology laboratory is operated by equal partners or by a corporate identity. The question is the report be adopted. The Honourable Minister. Uh, in, in brief response to the member for Tangney, uh, what I'll do is, is this area is in the, uh, under the administration of the Minister for Community Services and Health. I'll, uh, I'll request him that he uh, respond to you uh, this afternoon as, as you request it. The question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I advise the House we are now moving on to primary industry. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to provide for the undertaking of research and development relating to primary industries, energy and natural resources and for related purposes, and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the next schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable Minister. Yeah, thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole House forthwith. The uh, question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Committee Chair required. Mr Mildren. The Minister. Uh, Mr Mildren, I move that the amendments be agreed to. Questions of the, the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Murray. Mr Chairman, the opposition is pleased that the government has accepted a considerable number of amendments which we believe do improve legislation which we basically support, that is setting up an omnibus type or general structure for research and development corporations for primary industry and in particular the industries to begin with, the dairy industry and the grain industry, and also for the government to acknowledge that its attempted inclusion of the coal industry in a similar type structure was not appropriate, because unlike the primary industries where there is a dollar for dollar industry and government contribution for research and development, there is no government allocation for coal and therefore the 
industry, the coal industry, believed that it was completely inappropriate to have this type of structure forced upon it. And I do seek the acknowledgement of the Minister to the comments, to support the comments made by Senator Cook, the Minister for Resources, when on two occasions in the Senate, first of all on Tuesday when the bill was debated for the first time and secondly on Wednesday when the committee stage occurred in the Senate, the Minister said, and I quote here from one of those two times, however, what we are proposing and what I now categorically state is that these amendments be carried, he's meaning there the amendments to include coal within the, the general structure. And I, but I go on to quote, if they are, we will not act on them until such time as we have had further consultations with the coal industry and obtained agreement that we should proceed with this corporation for the coal industry. I will say more of that later, but I can give that assurance to the Senate. And he does repeat that same assurance in even greater detail on the, uh, the following day, that's yesterday, when this came up in the committee stage. And on that basis, we, the opposition, would not want to continue with the amendments to delete coal, the coal industry, from these arrangements, because if that assurance is given in good faith, and I accept that it was given in good faith by the minister on two occasions, that the industry, that is the coal industry, would only be included if it gave the indication and I think the minister indicated he would use the Coal Industry Association as the determining body for that inclusion, that until such time as he gave that uh, or obtained that approval, then nothing would happen. And that is a very, an important point from our, from our situation because it means we won't try to pursue with those amendments again. And on that basis, could I say, I believe that is a sensible attitude to have that if an industry really doesn't want to be included and it doesn't have the requirement to be included because there's no government dollar for dollar for money, then it shouldn't be. And the other point I want to make briefly, Mr Chairman, is that I am pleased also that the government has accepted the amendment to include the dairy cooperatives, that is the cooperative dairy companies, in the dairy arrangement in the way that any contribution made by those dairy companies is considered for the purposes of dollar for dollar money, the matching contribution between the industry and the government, as if it was farmers' contribution. I think that is sensible because the cooperatives are owned by the dairy farmers, who are the suppliers, that if that company was not putting money forward for research, that would be money available to be returned to the farmers. It does strengthen, I believe, the overall coordinated way for dairy industry research. And there has been a precedent, or there is a precedent, with the Horticultural Corporation, where the cooperative, certain cooperative factories have been included for the same reason. And I believe that is a sensible arrangement. I acknowledge that those dairy companies can't have it both ways. They can't have the 150% deductibility for contributions they make for, or provisions for research, if they are, if the government is taking into account their money for the matching grants from the, the general uh, treasury, the general budgetary contributions. And in the discussions I've had with the dairy industry, there is the belief that it is a better way to have the incentive and to have a, a, an overall coordinated approach to dairy industry research. Now, there's been a number of other amendments also accepted. On some occasions, the government has used its own wording, and if that's the more appropriate wording, we have no problem on the opposition side in relation to that. <coughs> in all of them, there is an attempt a positive attempt, and I believe that has been accepted in good faith by the government, to improve the accountability of the expenditure of that research money and plans for expenditure 
back to the industries in concern because after all, they are the ones that have put forward half of the total research finance. The discussions that took place over many, many hours following the passage of the uh, legislation through this House, those discussions between the Minister's office, my office, Senator Lewis's office, the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Dairy Industry Council and the Grains Council uh, have ebbed and flowed as to what would be accepted and what wouldn't be accepted. But the overall result, I believe, is positive and I commend the government for accepting not all the amendments but most of them. I commend all of those people who've been involved and particularly I do want to commend Senator Lewis and his office because of the work they had to undertake on behalf of the, the coalition opposition parties in the presentation of this legislation and its debate in the Senate. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Milden. I uh, just would like to say to the uh, Honourable Deputy Leader of the National Party that uh, I'm sure those assurances that were given by the Honourable Minister, Senator Cook, in the Senate, he uh, would honour. I have no doubt about that. I uh, thank him for his remarks and I will certainly uh, ensure that Senator Cook and uh, uh, Mr. Karen, the Minister for Primary Industries and Energy, uh, get a copy of what you've said. And uh, I'm sure if you want any other assurances, uh, they will probably be happy to give them to you in writing or whatever you require. As you can understand, I can't give you that on their behalf today. The question is that the, the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Wakefield. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr Chairman, I simply rise to support the member for Murray and the comments he's made, and I welcome the minister's reassurance, the minister at the table's reassurance, that Senator Cook's uh, comments in the Senate will, will in fact uh, ensure that the government is as good as its word. I too want us to uh, pay a word of commendation to Senator Lewis and in fact to the staff of the member for Murray's office for the work that's been done in ensuring that these amendments were both presented to the Senate and adequately negotiated so the amendments currently be con being considered by the House of Representatives largely, not entirely, sir, but largely reflect what was sought by the opposition when first this legislation was considered in this chamber. As the member for Murray has said, the legislation before the House allows the establishment of a research and development corporation, which will be an omnibus corporation embracing a, a number of industries, but initially taking in the dairy and grain industries. And the amendments that we have before us are largely the result of diligent work, I must say, without any sense of self-congratulation, because I can't claim to have been directly involved, of diligent work by the opposition, the opposition spokesman, um, by Senator Lewis, and by representatives of the dairy industry, the Grains Council and the NFF. I rise, Mr Chairman, because a particular concern I have is a concern that agriculture ought to see in place adequate research and development facilities. I'm very much aware of the fact that if we look at Australian export industries, it's been the agricultural industry that has pioneered efficiency in export production. If you look, sir, at the number of people currently employed in agriculture relative to the number of people who were employed and the production of agricultural produce, then the point I make is graphically illustrated. I want, sir, just briefly to refer to yesterday's Australian newspaper, where on the front page the, the uh, writer, Mr Paul Downey, a rural writer, referred to the fact that the farmers in Australia are facing a bleak future with a predicted 33 per cent of fall in the net value of rural production in this financial year. I think, sir, that in itself underscores the need for further diligent research and development funding and work by government and industry alike. And I rise to uh, thank Senator Lewis for his work in ensuring that the amendments that this chamber is now considering are amendments that the opposition can largely endorse. Order. The question is the amendments be agreed to. Those that appear say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that appear say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that the report be adopted. Question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. The Minister. You're going on with the next speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the Overseas Students Charge Collections Amendment Bill 1989. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Overseas Students Charge Collection Act 1979. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move that the second reading be made in order of the day for a later hour this day. The question is the motion be agreed to. Leave. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the second reading be made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Question is, the motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary now, I think the ayes have it. Got to read this out. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're right. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Well, Deputy we'll, Speaker. We'll, we'll just reverse that. Uh, okay. <laughs> the motion. The we only got it all through, Mr. To Deputy Speaker, before allowing the honourable minister. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The purpose of this bill is to amend the Overseas Students Charge Collection Act 1979 to enable payment of the overseas students' charges to be made in two equal instalments each year from the beginning of the 1990 academic year. The charge is payable by overseas students enrolled in Australian education institutions under the subsidised program to which the Act relates. The overseas students charge was, was expected to raise $51.449 million in 1989-90, based on the full payment being made by the 1st of May 1990, with the second of the two instalments due for payment after the 30th of June 1990. Revenue in 1989-90 is expected to be reduced by up to half. In addition, administrative costs associated with the collection of the charge may increase by up to $30,000. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the explanatory memorandum. Could I ask the Minister to formally move the second reading? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I move that the bill be narrowed a second time. Right, the honourable, uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to move that the second reading be made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Leave granted. May you move the next Formally point? put. Question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, now I think the ayes have it. The honourable the minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the second reading be made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Yeah, I've just carried. I've just carried that. Sorry. I've just carried that, uh, Mr Minister. I suppose it's wrong too. We're presenting the second bill. I thought Cathy wanted to talk to you. No, no. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the overseas students instalment. Payments charge bill 1989. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on certain non-citizen students choosing to pay charge imposed under the Overseas Students Charge Act 1979 by instalments. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of this bill is to provide for an instalment payment fee which will be in occurred where the overseas student charges is paid by two instalments each year from the beginning of the 1990 academic year, as provided for in the Overseas Students Charges Collection Amendment Bill 1989, which is being considered cognately with this bill. The charge is payable by overseas students enrolled in Australian education institutions under the subsidised program to which the bill relates. The amount of the instalment payment which will be payable at the time of the second instalment of the charge will be calculated pro rata on the basis of the three-year indicator Commonwealth bond rate for a period between the two instalment payments. The instalment payments will cover the public debt interest revenue foregone as a result of the introduction of the arrangements for the charges to be made 
by instalments. I present the explanatory memorandum. The question is that this bill be now at a second time. I ask leave of the House to move that the second reading be made in order of the day for a later hour this day. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the no, contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Order of the day, Overseas Students Charge Collection Amendment Bill. The Honourable I understand it is the wish of the House to debate this order of the day concurrently with the order of the day for the resumption of debate on the Overseas Students Instalments Payments Charge Bill 1989. There being no objection, the Chair will allow that course to be followed. The question is that this bill be now at a second time. The Honourable Member for Moncrief. Thank you very much, uh, Mr um, Deputy Speaker. Um, the uh, opposition is agreeing to give this um, bill speedy passage. Uh, the, um, earlier in this uh, session, the, um, we debated a number of education bills, including the Overseas Students' Charge Amendment Bill 1989, uh, which was uh, passed by the House of Representatives. When this uh, bill was being debated in the Senate, Senator Baden Teague drew to the attention of the Senate the fact that the Minister had not met an undertaking that he had given 12 months earlier that students affected by this bill be able to pay their fees in two instalments. The right to pay fees uh, in education by instalment is one which is essentially available to all other students in uh, whatever category that charge may be. The um, matter of extending the opportunity to overseas students of paying their fees in uh, instalments, two equal instalments, had previously been raised and 12 months ago the Minister gave an undertaking to provide in legislation for that ability. However, um, it was overlooked or, or some other matter arose and, it was, um, and Senator Teague had uh, subsequently pursued it with the Minister. In debate in the Senate, he uh, read to the Senate uh, some uh, legislation that he had had with the Minister. And he, uh, I refer in particular a letter to Senator Teague from the Minister dated the 7th of December, in which he says that I undertook that payment by instalments would be introduced in 1990 when additional resources and new administrative computer systems were expected to be available to deal with the considerable extra administrative burden that instalment payments will impose on my department. My department has already arranged administratively for payment to be made in instalments by students whose payments were found to be in arrears because the OSC liability had only recently come to my department's notice. Most of these students are temporary residents or their dependents. These students have been permitted to pay the arrears by instalments, but have been required to pay the overseas student charge for a course taken in 1989 in one payment. Unfortunately, it appears that only OSC liabilities and arrears can be paid by instalments under administrative arrangements. The Attorney General's Department advised that because of the particular wording of the relevant provisions of the OSC legislation, current OSC liabilities cannot be discharged by instalments. The legislation must therefore be amended if payment by instalments is permitted. By the time that advice was received, it was too late to have the appropriate legislative arrangements drafted and passed by both Houses of Parliament in the 1989 budget sittings. I therefore propose to have a bill prepared for introduction to the Parliament in the autumn sittings. Um, the um, uh, uh, undertaking, of course, of 12 months earlier was thereby going to be avoided. However, the opposition was not satisfied with that and whilst not denying the, uh, that bill in question, the Overseas Student Charge Amendment Bill to second reading, it has been delayed in the Senate pending le this legislation which enables the government's undertaking to be uh, put into effect. And uh, these are the two bills. We're informed that uh, uh, two bills are necessary for the following reason. <coughs> Firstly, the um, payment by instalments means, of course, that the Commonwealth foregoes a little revenue and also extra uh, costs are incurred, extra administrative costs are incurred. So it is a pro a proposed that there will be a, um, an extra charge uh, levied for those who choose the uh, route of paying by instalment. <coughs> the opposition uh, is not uh, opposing uh, that charge being uh, imposed. The, um, uh, 
I note from the bill that the payment of the charge, um, if the sorry, if the first instalment is not paid by the first payment date, the right to pay by instalment is forfeited, and uh, the opposition um, accepts that uh, arrangement for the time being, but assumes, of course, that the uh, department will uh, be sympathetic where there may be uh, unusual or um, uh, unavoidable delays, for example, in transfer of money from overseas to students, which might uh, slightly delay a payment, provided uh, the payment is made reasonably expeditiously. I want to take the opportunity in speaking on this just to uh, extend a little further a concern that the um, opposition has already expressed in relation to payment of fees by overseas students. In the second reading of the um, original bill on the 1st of November, the Shadow Minister raised the uh, question of payment of charges for primary school education. And I want to put on record here in the House that these uh, charges to overseas students can cause considerable difficulties in a way that I don't think has been paid attention to and the government ought to be paying some attention to. Uh, it has risen in my electorate for a very particular reason, and that is Bond University is attracting quite a number of postgraduate overseas students. That university is, of course, aiming to provide courses and training that are not available in um, other universities in Australia. And difficulties are being created and will be created not only at Bond, of course, but at in, in, uh, for many overseas postgraduate students in particular, that they tend to be older, are married and have families and come here on scholarships and on a very low income. And the requirement that they have to pay full schooling fees for their children is actually deterring a number of overseas students from undertaking postgraduate training in this country. I consider that to be extremely unfortunate. It may be that when diplomats are posted here, the um, governments which those diplomats represent understand that the schooling of the children of the diplomats or the diplomatic staff will have to be paid for and the government is prepared to accept that as a cost in this country as it undoubtedly is in other countries. To however have this effect is one that I think uh, should be paid urgent attention to. The matter of availability of education in Australia to people from overseas and particularly from underdeveloped countries is something that is very important to those countries, to those students and to this country. Um, Education and training made available, albeit with the payment of a fee, uh, in Australia has, is something that has generated um, a lot of goodwill for Australia and very valuable relationships with people, many of whom become key people when they return to their own countries. Uh, these students now are facing the prospect of either they have to leave their families behind for two or more years uh, and be separated from their families whilst they're undertaking the uh, overseas course or they simply cannot come at all because the cost has become prohibitive for them um, by the imposition of school fees. The fees are high. Um, they uh, seek to recover the full cost of educating a, uh, a school student and they have added enormously to the cost. Not surprisingly, uh, many people who are organisations who, um, who provide scholarships for um, students from those countries to come here are not prepared to pay the very high cost that uh, is entailed. It's a cost that uh, they would not have uh, been uh, taken into account when they embarked on the um, whatever policy it is that means they, uh, they give scholarships. For example, it is uh, quite common for postgraduate students from uh, underdeveloped countries uh, in uh, studying in Australia to be here on uh, scholarships provided by private enterprise in other countries. Uh, the, uh, one of the great risks is, of course, that if those scholarships are to continue, if the training is to continue to be undertaken here, that those who provide the scholarships will deliberately avoid selecting students who have children of school age. Um, so that they avoid the difficulties created. And I, I do urge the government to um, think again about this policy of imposing uh, schooling fees on uh, students from overseas, uh, particularly where it involves the children of 
a student undertaking study at um, one of our institutions um, of, uh, of learning. Uh, the um, imposition of the fee, as I understand it, was fairly unexpected, and whilst it might have been uh, had some sort of announcement, certainly a number of students um, or people intending to come here have been caught by it because they were unaware that this was uh, going to be imposed on them. In conclusion, uh, Mr uh, Deputy Speaker, I would like to congratulate Senator Teague for the tenacity that he has shown in this matter. It has uh, been largely through um, his uh, very considerable exertions that we have been able to reach a satisfactory conclusion of this matter for the overseas students affected this year. And um, the government uh, is now in a position to keep a promise that it made some time ago to that effect. Um, as I said at the beginning, the opposition supports and indeed uh, welcomes the arrangements made by these bills. The question is, this bill been now at a second time. The Honourable Member for Lilly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I also am very happy to support the implementation of the two bills under discussion, the Overseas Students Charge Collection Amendment Bill 1989 and the Overseas Student Instalment Payment Charge Bill 1989. As has already been indicated, the purposes of the bills is to, is to amend the original Act to enable payment of the overseas student charge by two equal instalments each year from the beginning of 1990 and to provide for an instalment payment fee where an overseas student chooses to pay the OSC by instalment. And uh, in, in supporting the bills, I feel that this will indeed uh, alleviate students sometimes placed in uncomfortable circumstances and will uh, extend that right for payment by instalment to overseas students. But in speaking to the bill, I want to put the topic in its social and ideological context. It's very easy to criticise various aspects of an individual program, and in fact the original bill did attract such uh, criticism in a minor number of cases. But in the national sphere, it is most important that our comments are sit, set in a comparative context and that we are cognizant of the human implications of our policies at home and abroad. The basis from which this government views the overseas student program is that it bears an important relationship to our vision of a multicultural Australia and to our policies on foreign aid for developing nations. In this context, while welcoming the valuable economic contribution the Overseas Student Program is making to Australia, we also embrace to at least as great an extent the immense social, cultural and economic benefits flowing through not only to overseas students but also to Australian students, Australian education institutions and in fact to the entire community. But support for a program, no matter how great, should not be so un unthinking as to become blind support. A government which takes no cognizance of changing social and economic situations and priorities is a bad government. The Hawke government has taken note and has introduced changes to ensure that this important program against a backdrop of turning a domestic deficit into a domestic surplus is both cost effective and targeted to need. It is this aspect which some members appear to overlook. This government's changes to the subsidised student segment of the overseas student program do not, do not denote reduced support for or lack of compassion towards overseas students in need. They denote that a long and thoughtful look at the guidelines has revealed that an equity and merit scheme based on educational promise and economic need of students from developing countries would tap a deeper and a broader area of need than that which is now being met by the program. For this reason, the government is now phasing out that segment of the program which is in fact affected by the amendment made in the House today and channeling that funding over into another program which we believe will be more cost effective and will in fact reach more people who really need it. The government is introducing 
the Equity and Merit Scholarship Scheme, which will commence in 1990. To understand the transition, it is necessary to understand the structure of the overseas student program. The federal government's OSP comprises three major segments. One segment sponsors students from developing countries funded through ADAB, the Australian International Development Aid Bureau. Another segment is the full fee segment, where students actually study full time in Australia and meet the full cost of their education. This federal government responded to growing demand from overseas students for Australian education courses by introducing the full fee overseas student program in 1986. Foreign exchange er earnings have been estimated at about $240 million in 1988, with the possibility of growth to $500 million in the near future. This means that Australia's education export industry is becoming one of the nation's biggest export earners. But the third segment, which we have also seen as most important, is that of subsidised students, the cost of whose educational place in Australia is shared by the Australian government and the student. It is in this last area of subsidised students that the government has made major change. The last intake of subsidised students is 1989, this year, and the government is in fact phasing out this segment between 1990 and 1983 in order to channel that funding into the segment which helps students from developing countries funded through ADAB. So I'd like to make it clear today, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the government is not killing off the subsidised student program, but rather is exchanging it for something which we think is better. The Equity and Merit Scholarship Scheme for students from developing nations and a smaller scholarship scheme for overseas postgraduate research students from developing countries will be commencing from 1990. All of the money recouped from the phase out of the subsidised student segment of the OSP will be used for the Equity and Merit Scholarship Scheme plus additional funding from the government. So it's not a back down, it's a build up in a most important area. These scholarships will be targeted at priority countries with individual country locations, which will provide tuition fees and in most cases travel expenses, living and other allowances. It's going to be administered by ADAB as a major part of Australia's aid program. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is an important initiative and one which in promoting human resource development in relevant countries by focusing on individual need, with emphasis on awarding scholarships on the basis of individual merit, is getting in fact the most out of the tax dollar and assisting those who really need it. And that is what we on this side of the House are all about. I also note the concern of the Honourable Member for, Concre uh, for Moncrief, I'm sorry, for the plight of women in developing countries and the situation in which they're placed and uh, certainly will hold that in mind for the future. But the third segment, that of subsidised students, is the basis of the bill we are debating today. The bill is offering options for subsidised students to pay their share of the, the cost of educational places <laughs> by instalments. <coughs> the OSC was expected to raise $51.449 million in 1989-90 based on the full payment being made by the 1st of May 1990, with the second of the two instalments due for payment after the 30th of June 1990, revenue in 1989-90 is expected to be reduced by half. The instalment payment rate arrangements for the OSC would result in a loss of public debt interest revenue of about $1 million in 1990. The instalment fee will recoup the public debt interest foregone. Administrative costs associated with the collection of the charge may increase by up to $30,000. Another important aspect of this uh, amendment bill is that of Clause 5, which provides for the uh, payment of the charge to be made in the two equal instalments. The point to which I refer is that the first instalment, if not paid by the first payment date, the right to pay by instalment is forfeited. And uh, I accept the Honourable Member, <coughs> Con Member for Moncrief's acceptance and support of that particular clause. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, there has been a certain amount of mythology attaching to overseas student, uh, student program in the past. Quite a large amount of misinformation, or rather no information, has been circulating. Questions that I have heard is, who is the program really assisting? Are foreign students taking the places of Australian students? Are Australian taxpayers assisting overseas students to their own to the detriment of Australians? Should the government be looking after our own backyard? Or to the other extent, are needy overseas students getting a, new, getting a raw deal? Certainly such questions should be answered, but interested members of the public should ensure that they have information on the program from their Department of Employment, Education and Training or from their local member so that when they speak, it is from a basis of information. What is the program? A major way in which a nation such as Australia can assist people in less fortunate societies is through offering educational processes and training. The government's overseas student program has partially fulfilled the need for skills training and education within developing nations, working in with other grants and programs, of course, from the Department of Foreign Affairs. Not only the Labor government, but Conservative governments have had an overseas student program, which has made a valuable contribution to people within developing nations. But this is not all. There has been immense social, socio-cultural and economic benefits flowing through to Australian students and to the community. While Australia has recently strengthened its overseas student program, it has tapped into a burgeoning demand for educational services, courses and expertise. It is no secret that the Australian government has been de dealing in recent years with an economy which requires spending cuts in the short term in order to maintain economic viability in the long term. With this background, any reasonable, thoughtful program must look closely at expenditure on programs to see that the, these programs are meeting the desired need. In this context, the government has looked at the OSP and has decided that within our financial constraints and given our ideological commitments, it's important for us to make certain changes. I think these changes have been very practical. It has been within, under this government that uh, a program which, which indeed needed tightening up in different areas, needed channelling off to see that the money expended was meeting a real need in overseas students, at the same time recouping and tapping into a potential export industry in Australia, were made. We certainly have broken new grounds, and I, as a government member, are very proud, am very proud of the achievements of this government. For, inst the, for instance, the introduction of a code of conduct for institutions made this program and the expansions to it made by us not only effective but accountable. Through the Australian Education Council, a national code of conduct for the overseas marketing of Australian education as services has been introduced. It was done to safeguard the interest of overseas students and to maintain the sound reputation that Australian education services now had. A code of ethical practice has also been adopted by higher education institutions. In August of this year, the government announced new entry criteria for overseas students wishing to undertake short English language courses in Australia. The new measures will help to ensure that overseas students comply with the terms and conditions of their visas and to protect the reputation and viability of Australia's burgeoning education export industry. Another fine initiative is that of the Australian Education Centres. The government has appointed a joint industry-government panel to consider proposals to set up and manage Australian education centres in a number of overseas locations. The centres, in providing an identifiable Australian education presence in up to 10 countries in the region, is, f is filling a very strong need. The centres will offer information, counselling and advisory services to overseas students. It's expected that the first centres would be in operation by early 1990. I think the final point that I would like to make regarding the effectiveness 
of programs for overseas students and the changes made by this government must come from the people affected themselves. I was very pleased to see the report exporting Australia's tertiary, tertiary education services. When research was done into the actual effects on students, on institutions, on our society of the programs and specifically of uh, extensions and improvements to educational services which have been made by this government. I mentioned that tertiary education services have become a major export industry and this report sets the basis for further planning and further policies regarding this export industry. The report attempts to provide some statistical evidence concerning the extent of economic benefits of, us, of Australia's export of tertiary education services and, as, and an assessment of the impediments facing tertiary institutions in expanding such ex export activities. It's based on an in-depth in study of the tertiary education in industry with the purpose of investigating the factors affecting the demand for and supply of Australian educational services in overseas markets. It gives some interesting answers to the questions asked and it gives them from a primary basis. For instance, the survey finds that the two most frequently cited reasons for overseas students choosing to study in Australia were the acceptance by Australian institutions and by the comparatively low cost of studying and of living in Australia. Most students, respond, most respondents stated that their decision to study here was correct and they were answering this question at the conclusion of their study course. Looking back, about half of the respondents claim that the cost of living and studying here was about the same or lower than, others, than other countries. On this basis, they felt that they had indeed done the right thing in coming over to Australia. The survey found that the average expenditure incurred by overseas students in 1987 was almost $10,000. Full fee-paying students spent an average of nearly $14,000, while the average expenditure for full fee students enrolled in short courses was about $5,600. Mr Deputy Speaker, the facts speak for themselves. The improvement, the changes made by this program by a government that is giving equal billing to cost effectiveness and to extending those educational skills, that training expertise, which we most definitely have in Australia, into the developing world, particularly in our region, have certainly shown that the targeting is spot on and that, in fact, Australian, Australians, Australian institutions and people from the developed nations will be, uh, will be advantaged by the changes particularly the new scholarships under the Equity and Merit Scholarship Scheme, are designed to strengthen the quality and delivery of educational aid to overseas students, as well as improving the export competitiveness of Australian higher education institutions. Equity and Merit Scholarships will be awarded to higher education students from the countries in our region. Half of the scholarships will be awarded to women, Equity scholarships will be awarded to students who meet country-specific equity criteria, that is, to students who are disadvantaged in some way. Merit scholarships will be awarded on the basis of academic merit alone. So what we're really doing as we look to the future of this program is not merely to extend to the students now in Australia the ability to pay their <laughs> sector of a subsidised program in instalments. We want to go further than this. This will ease people over the next year or two, those who are now studying. But for the future, there will be an expansion, which will mean that our neighbours, those who have the promise 
and those who have the need will be up front in acceptance into our institutions in Australia. And in doing that, will also put into this country the benefits of people living overseas and dollars in the form of a new export industry. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable Member for Deakin. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, the purpose of this bill is to provide for an instalment payment fee which will be incurred where the overseas student charge is paid by two instalments each year from the beginning of the 1990 academic year. And uh, in its companion bill, the instalment payment will cover the public debt interest revenue foregone as a result of the introduction of arrangements for the charge to be paid by instalments. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I think one observation that we should make about uh, this modest contribution to Australia's uh, balance of payments difficulties is that uh, we have seen over the last seven years our gross external indebtedness as a result of uh, the government's uh, mismanagement of our economy rise from about $30,000 million to around $120,000, $130,000 million. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we are selling less to the world than we are buying from the world. And we will have later this week another example of uh, the economic difficulties in which Australia finds itself uh, with the publication of the balance of payments number for, uh, for the month of November. So this situation, our external indebtedness situation, which has been growing apace under this government, uh, as I say, quadrupling over the period that they've been in office, has given us a very serious, a very serious economic uh, problem. And uh, until this government introduces policies that do something to overcome that difficulty, Australia will drift more and more into a situation where more and more of its exports are needed to pay the interest and the capital repayments which fall due on our external indebtedness. Uh, this situation is uh, unsustainable. Uh, Australia's external indebtedness uh, as a percentage of its gross domestic product is one of the highest, if not the highest, in the OECD nations. And it is simply a situation that has to be faced up to if we are to, uh, if we are to regain our place as one of the countries in the world with the, one of the highest standards of living. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, we have endemic inflation as another problem in Australia that prevents us being more externally competitive and more productive, and the government has to face up to all the problems that are associated with uh, an inflation rate that on average is twice that of our major trading competitors, and uh, now seems to be on the rise again rather than falling as it should be in the current uh, situation. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we all know that the government is trying to force a recession on Australia in order to slow down uh, its imports. Um, there are those around who uh, would point to the fact that a fall on interest rates would mean that the government's policies are working. In fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, any policy that has the deliberate objective of inducing a recession cannot be a policy that is working. And so, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, against that background, I think we see uh, um, the importance of making sure that we do something to boost our exports and to, uh, to the extent that overseas students uh, pay for their education in Australia, some contribution is being made. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, this, these bills have been a, a long time coming. Uh, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, the, member, the Honourable Member for Moncrief, has paid tribute to the work of uh, yeah. Senator Baden Teague in the Senate on this matter. In fact, uh, Senator Teague extracted an undertaking from the Minister 12 months ago to provide legislation the ability 
to pay the overseas student charge in uh, two instalments. This bill has been a long time coming. The fact that it's a long time coming, I think, is indicative of the fact that this uh, government is uh, tired, uh, inefficient, arrogant, lazy, out of touch. And uh, yes, it is. As the member for Moncrief says, it's time for a long, long holiday, a long spell over here, a long spell over here. And, um, and, when, and, uh, and, even, and even the runway won't save you. Uh, it's time for a long spell uh, for the government on the opposition uh, on benches. Uh, and this, this bill, these bills have been a long time coming, Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, even then, the minister didn't get it right. Uh, in his letter to Senator Teague, dated the 7th of December 1989, he, uh, he says, and I quote, I undertook that payment by instalments would be introduced in 1990. Uh, and as Senator Teague has pointed out, uh, that failed to deliver against the undertaking that the uh, minister had made to the senator. And uh, the senator... Uh, raised the matter with the minister again um, and he said, uh, Senator Teague recently said that the, the legislation that's before us tonight does not affect what I'd sought in terms. Um, however, um, the, uh, the minister then wrote a further letter to Senator Teague uh, giving an undertaking that the appropriate legislation would be introduced. This is 12 months later after they'd got it wrong, after they'd got it wrong uh, once. And uh, that is the legislation that is before us uh, tonight. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I referred earlier to Australia's economic difficulties. I think the fact that, uh, that a relatively simple piece of legislation like this uh, has taken 12 months to come from the government, and even then uh, the minister didn't get it right, is indicative of the way that the, the government is running this country. They are simply too tired, too out of touch, and too incompetent and too inefficient to be able to carry that job on anymore. The opposition does not oppose these bills. The yeah, question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Overseas Students' Charge Collection Act, 1979. The Honourable Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Overseas Students' Charge Collection Act 1979. Clark. Order of the day, Overseas Students' Instalment Payments Charge Bill. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on certain non-citizen students choosing to pay charge imposed under the Overseas Students' Charge Act 1979 by instalments. Uh, Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on certain non-citizen students choosing to pay charge imposed under the Overseas Students' Charge Act 1979 by instalments. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Industry, Technology and Commerce Legislation Amendment Bill number two, consideration in Committee of Senate's Amendments. Committee Chairman, Mr Milgram. The Minister. Mr Milgram, I move that the amendments be agreed to. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, may I um, move this debate be adjourned?
the I'm for the, the uh, Or that, that that isn't a motion that the member can move at this stage. The state of the house. Is quorum required? Ring the bells. The question is, the amendment be agreed to. If those of that opinion say aye, and the contrary no, I think the ayes have it. The question is now that I report a resolution to the House. If those of that opinion say aye, and the contrary no, I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to establish an industry commission for the purpose of holding inquiries into matters relating to industry and for related purposes, to make other provision in connection with industry, to repeal the Industries Assistance Commission Act 1973 
and parts of the Interstate Commission Act 1975 and to make provision for related matters and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annexed schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Minister. Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The committee chairman, Mr Milton. The minister. Thank you, Mr Mildren. Mr Mildren, I move that the amendments be agreed to or taken separately if desired. The question that, uh, is that the, the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question now is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The following message has been received from the Senate. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act relating to therapeutic goods and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable Minister. I move the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I right. think the ayes have it. Committee Chairman, Mr Mildren. The Minister. I move the amendments be agreed to. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. The report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to impose an annual charge on the registration and listing of therapeutic goods and on the licensing of manufacturers of therapeutic goods and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendment indicated by the annexed schedule, in which amendment the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable Minister. I move the amendment be taken into consideration in the committee of the whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The committee chairman, Mr Mildren. The minister. The amendment be agreed to. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Minister. I move the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.
following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend legislation relating to customs and excise and for related purposes and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable the Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move the amendments be taken into consideration in the Committee of the Whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. Committee Chairman, Mr Mildren. The Minister. I move that the amendments be agreed to. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Minister. The schedule of amendments passed proposes a total of 13 amendments, amendments to the bill as originally introduced in this chamber on 2 November 1989. The proposed changes retain the bulk of the existing scheme for granting commercial tariff concession orders as set out in Part uh, 15A of the Customs Act 1901 whilst allowing for some reforms in areas such as the refusal of commercial tariff concession orders on national interest grounds and the granting of specified period concessions. The government, whilst opposed in the other chamber of the amendments made to the bill, is prepared to accept them on the grounds that certain other reforms in the commercial tariff concession scheme which the bill proposed have been accepted, and on the grounds that the other substantive uh, elements of the bill, notably the termination of manufacturing bond and the new requirement that imported spirits be packaged in licensed premises prior to entry for home consumption, for which there is no opposition, will therefore be able to be implemented. I commend the amendments to the House. The question is that the, the amendments be agreed to. Those that have been say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that have say aye. On the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Minister. May the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Two sales, please. Two sales, please. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the law relating to sales tax and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable Minister. Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in the Committee of the Whole House forthwith. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Committee Chairman, Mr Mildren. The Minister. Mr Mildren, I'd like to indicate to the Committee the Government proposes that uh, Amendment Number 1 be agreed to and that Amendments Numbers 2 and 3 be disagreed to and an amendment made in place thereof. I suggest, therefore, that it may suit the convenience of the committee to consider amendment number one. When that amendment has been disposed of, consider amendments number two, number three. Does the minister's Do recommendation suit the convenience of the House? Mr. Minister may proceed. Mr. Milder and I move that amendment number one be agreed to. The question is that amendment number one be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Mr Milton, I move that amendments numbers 2 and 3 be disagreed to and an amendment set out in the schedule circulated to honourable members be made in place of them. Mr Milton, the object of the first and third amendments of this bill that were made by the Senate was first to make clear that the proposed exemption for certain paper products applies to goods only if all the paper in the goods is wholly recycled paper and second, to define what is meant by the term recycled in relation to recycled paper and cardboard. The second amendment made by the Senate was intended to extend the proposed exemption 
so that the use of recycled fibre and not just recycled paper would qualify. The Government, in now not accepting the second and third amendments made by the Senate, is not disagreeing with the principles behind those amendments. The amendment the Government is now moving is to replace those two amendments, will re-express the Senate amendments, and in so doing, and consistent with the definition of recycled in relation to recycled paper and cardboard accepted by the Senate, we extend that definition to fibre. This new definition specifies that for the purposes of the proposed exemption, the recycled test will be satisfied only where all the fibre in the cardboard or paper has previously been used as fibre in the manufacture of other goods, for example, cotton lint from shirting material and hemp fibre from rope. I commend the proposed amendment to the committee. The question is that the motion be agreed to the Honourable Member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr Chairman. <coughs> This is a point that we raised in the second reading debate as to the nature of that, uh, uh, the drafting of that first amendment. And I think we're on about the third cut of that amendment at this point, which um, you know, is just indicative of uh, the haste with which this legislation was drafted and the shoddiness with which uh, it has been drafted. And uh, you know, it is indicative of the basic thrust of a whole host of this legislation. It could, uh, couldn't be better described than having gone off half cocked. I hope you got it right this time. Well, do the question of the motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report resolutions to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. And the contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. Deputy Speaker, I have to report that the committee has agreed to resolutions. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the report be adopted. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no, I think the ayes have it. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the law relating to sales tax and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendment indicated by their next schedule, in which amendment the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendment be taken into consideration Committee of the Whole House forthwith. question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Committee Chairman, Mr Milgram. Mr Milgram, I move that the amendment be disagreed to and an amendment set out in the, circular, in the schedule circulated to members be made in place of it. Mr Mildren, uh, honourable members will recall that the Sales Tax Laws Computer Programs Amendment Bill proposes the removal of sales tax on all computer programs other than those on microchips. The bill as introduced would have resulted in sales tax continuing to apply to games and educational programs on microchips which were placed inside cartridges that are for use with basic personal computers or with games consoles such as the Atari Video Computer System and the Nintendo Home Entertainment System. In some cases, however, the same program is also available on floppy disk, and the government moved an amendment in the Senate that removes this distortion. The Senate agreed to that amendment. Since the passing of the Senate amendment, the government has received suggestions for improving the amendment and has had time to give it more detailed consideration. The further amendment now being brought forward is a result of that. The new amendment I've just moved differs from that made by the Senate in a number of significant ways. Firstly, the nature of the programs that qualify for sales tax exemption has been extended to include those marketed as being exclusively for both educational and entertainment use. Secondly, a similar change has been made to the cartridges affected, extending the range of cartridges to those marketed as being exclusively for use with either a personal computer or an acceptable home electronic device. The third significant change made is to replace the term visual display unit with the description a computer monitor or a television screen. This will remove any uncertainty as to what is a visual display unit. It's possible that a television screen falls outside the current conception of a visual display unit, although the government intended that such a screen be included. On the other hand, the term visual display unit in the bill could have resulted in any LCD or LED display, no matter how small or how limited its display capabilities, being classed as a visual display unit, contrary to the government's intention. The inclusion test in the Senate amendment could have opened up the exemption sought to be granted to a wider range of devices than the government intended. A further change will therefore ensure that the home electronic devices that include a computer monitor or television screen are excluded from the range of acceptable devices. 
However, personal computers that include a screen will remain acceptable. Finally, the substituted amendment in specifying what are unacceptable home electronic devices includes articles that are a combination of a number of devices and that include one or more of the devices specified. This will reduce the frequency with which regulations might otherwise need to be made to extend the list of specified devices. I commend the amendment to the committee. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. Now, thank you, Mr Chairman. Look, this is just another example of exactly what we talked about in relation to the other piece of sales tax uh, legislation. That is a capacity to rush things into this parliament on the part of the government before they've thought them through. And in fact, in the minister's own words, he just said that on the passage of more time, they'd come up with a better way of specifying the amendment. I wonder, and it boggles the mind how many more versions of the amendment you might have come up with if you'd taken a reasonable amount of time to do the thing in the first place. And I'm fascinated at the way you have now uh, come up in the drafting of this amendment to specify under the heading Home Electronic Devices what it doesn't include. And given the pace of technological development in this area, it won't be long before that list is an awful lot longer than from A to E as specified. When we raised this point in the second reading debate, we were very concerned as to the nature of the exemption that was going to be granted and whether it could be contained when we moved our initial amendment. And all you've done is prove to us how difficult that process is going to be, uh, not only has, has been, but is going to be in the future in order to, uh, to ensure that the, uh, that the change under this legislation is actually directed where it's supposed to go. And I think the government should just stand condemned on what, the, what has been an unduly hasty and shoddy exercise in legislative drafting. Order. The question is order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those that appear and say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that appear and say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the report be adopted, Mr Deputy Speaker. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that opinion, please say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Just hang I, th on. I think the ayes have it. Order. Order. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Minister. Uh, right. <laughs> I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in the House forthwith. The question is in the committee the, of the whole. The question is that the amendments be considered in committee. All those out of opinion, please say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Committee. Committee Chairman, Mr. Mildred. The Minister. I move that the amendments be agreed to. The question is the amendments be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. I move the report be adopted, Mr Deputy Speaker. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that opinion, please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act 1976 and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill 
with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. The Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in the Committee of the House of, of the Whole of the House, forthwith. The question is that the House resolve itself into committee. All those that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman of Committees, Mr Mildred. Uh, just to take a few brief moments of the House. Sorry, the amendment moved the amendments be agreed to. The question is the amendments be agreed to the Minister. Just to briefly take a few minutes uh, of the House's time, because uh, <coughs> it's not often that uh, uh, both uh, the Shadow Minister and myself get the opportunity to talk about our particular portfolio here in this Parliament. However, it would be remiss of me not to again repeat uh, a couple of points uh, about this legislation. and. Uh, the reasons why these amendments have been accepted uh, by the government. Firstly, they were put uh, by the government in the Senate uh, at the specific requests uh, from the Northern Territory uh, government in line with the memorandum of agreement between uh, this government uh, here in Canberra and the Northern Territory government. That memorandum signed by the uh, Prime Minister and by the uh, Chief Minister. This is an example the acceptance of these amendments of the desire of this government, uh, led by our Prime Minister, to uh, uh, facilitate and uh, reach agreement uh, with the NT government on uh, this particular piece of legislation. The legislation deals with the provision of land for Aboriginal people, the most deprived people uh, that we have in this country, these people living on, uh, in the most appalling of conditions and on these pastoral properties through the stock routes and excisions, that, uh, excisions and reserves that will, be, uh, uh, as, that will be handed over to Aboriginal people resulting uh, from this legislation, it is in the fact very historic. It would be remiss of me, and time precludes me, from addressing some of the more outrageous comments that were made in the Senate. But I do refer to one or two uh, points. Firstly, I'd like to place on record the uh, cooperation that I've had in this uh, whole exercise uh, with uh, officers of my department who have worked tirelessly, the Land Council, and uh, the discussions uh, that followed the meeting of the Prime Minister, the Chief Minister and myself through the various officers of both governments and also the, the Shadow Minister at the table. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for one of his colleagues in the Senate, Senator Tambling, and I'll say this that I've never met a person who has the ability to distort the truth in the way in which uh, Senator Tamling has during the course of this debate. I know it is not the views of the overwhelming majority of his party. It goes without saying that his attempts to uh, denigrate people who have worked very, very hard in trying to reach a settlement on this uh, legislation, uh, I think, are rejected by the overwhelming majority of, of members of both, both sides of the chamber his constant uh, misrepresentation of the government's position, his constant uh, interference uh, in this whole area, I think uh, he will be judged by the words uh, that he's uttered out of his own mouth in terms of the Senate uh, handsaw. Now, I was going to address each and every one of his comments, but I would suggest to the NT government that they could not have a worse advocate in this place than Senator Tambling. The people of the Northern Territory would do well to look at, at his performance. And the interesting thing is that with all of his uh, comments about uh, this particular policy, with all of his comments about uh, uh, Aboriginal affairs, I would get more representation from members of the opposition who represent uh, uh, areas that aren't necessarily known for their Aboriginal uh, uh, constituents in terms of numbers than what uh, Senator Tam Tambling does. He seems not to be interested in their welfare, but to in be interested more in point scoring against the government or against some well-known Aboriginal people. And for that reason, I condemn him for his comments. The legislation is historic. The legislation will go a long way to uh, silencing a number of our critics uh, internationally who have constantly pointed the finger at Australia for not being able to provide proper living conditions for Aboriginal people. It is a piece of legislation that arises out of work done since 1971 
by all uh, uh, governments in that period. And I think it does well for the House to reflect on that, that we now have a historic opportunity to provide living areas and the facilities that go on those living areas for people to enjoy the sorts of life that most Australians have become accustomed to and expect. And it's with that uh, philosophy and that uh, uh, commitment to achieving that that I stand here very proud on behalf of this government that we have fulfilled one of the most far-reaching pieces of legislation uh, that have been introduced in this parliament for a long, long time. And I ask people to reflect on the period of Whitlam and the following up work done by the Fraser government on land rights in the Northern Territory. And this proposal has picked up and uh, provides an opportunity for people who were bypassed by that proposal, through no one's fault, but perhaps through an oversight, uh, the opportunity to gain proper areas to live on. And I can assure the House uh, that I will be having the proper types of discussions with the uh, pastoralists that are required. It was always my intention. Uh, they were aware of it. I repeat, however, that it was the pastoralists that withdrew from the discussions, for the record. The pastoralists withdrew. The pastoralists withdrew from discussions set up by the Chief Minister Hatton and myself back in 1987. So I have bent over backwards to involve them and give them the opportunity. And I say to them publicly here on the record, I intend to make myself available to discuss those issues of concern that they have with them again. But the overriding thing is that we are providing areas for Aboriginal people to live with and live with those sorts of things that we're, uh, as I said, we expect uh, them to be able to receive in terms of proper living uh, uh, conditions and, and infrastructure that goes with those uh, living areas. So that's our overriding uh, concern and I understand it to be the overriding concern, as I said, of the overwhelming majority of uh, those members opposite. The question is the amendment we agree to. The honourable member for Bass. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chairman, in speaking uh, in the committee stages to the amendments, and uh, as I understand it, there are basically three amendments to clause 5, 9 and 14 that are proposed. As the minister knows, the opposition in the Senate accepted these amendments that have been moved by the government, as they in effect um, have already been agreed to between the government and the Northern Territory government in that historic agreement that was reached between Mr Hawke and uh, the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, Marshal Perrin, some little time ago about the issue of living areas for Aboriginals in the Northern Territory. When I spoke on this debate uh, some time ago, and if I recall, Minister, it was very early in the morning, um, I did at that stage indicate that the opposition supported this legislation and we were pleased to see it finally come to the parliament in the final form that it did reach the parliament and uh, we had pleasure at that time in endorsing it and again I do so today. It is historic legislation. There has been an extremely long gestation period for it to reach this place and perhaps in looking at all the legislation that's before the parliament today, uh, later this morning and possibly tomorrow, I would think in terms of uh, historical importance, this piece of legislation would have to rate first, in my view, and I think that any thinking person um, who knows the history of this legislation would come to the same conclusion. So in that sense, I uh, join the Minister in recognising the importance of the legislation, and uh, I think it reflects well on the Parliament that it's finally got here. There has been a tortuous path for it to reach this stage. Much of that has been subject to a heated political debate. The Minister has made reference to that. I don't make any apology for that, and neither should anyone. These are contentious issues. They will, I'm sure, continue to be contentious issues, but progress has been made with this legislation and with these amendments, Mr Chairman. There are perhaps two points that I would want to mention. The first is that we did propose some amendments in the Senate which weren't successful and didn't enjoy the support of the Democrats. They were uh, quite straightforward amendments. Details were given to the Minister well in advance and they were one to give effect to the legislation which was proposed by the former minister that awaited proclamation to hope that the stock routes and reserves would be excluded. I understand and uh, from the speech by Senator Tate on behalf of the minister in the other place that that would take place in any event. I certainly hope that would be the case. The other related to that contentious issue about the scheduling of areas 
in the Act as it affects the rights and interests of pastoralists. The pastoralists have agreed in the main for this legislation to be able to come forward and have been represented in part by the Northern Territory Government, but they did have the view and still do have the view that their rights and interests need to be protected. The minister has again said today, and I'm pleased to hear him say it, that he will be consulting with them. I think that is a fundamental requirement. What our amendments sought to do was to set in place a formal mechanism for review so that where people's interests are affected, they do have a right to have that uh, decisions um, reviewed under the judicial processes. And I'm uh, grateful to the intervention during that uh, Senate debate by my colleague, Senator Alston, who I thought made a, uh, a principled uh, position in support of the amendment that we were putting forward, and that was that there needed to be an arm's length judicial review mechanism. Unfortunately, that uh, provision didn't uh, go forward, so uh, that's to be regretted, but it was put forward, uh, as the minister knows, uh, in, uh, in a sense to try and achieve uh, something that uh, could be broadly accepted and I think had merit. But with those uh, words, uh, Mr uh, Chairman, I'd want to conclude my remarks. Perhaps uh, the minister wouldn't be surprised that I would want to defend my colleague, uh, Senator Tambling. Senator Tambling is uh, from the Northern Territory. He is one who uh, deals with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. He did take the debate for the opposition uh, in the Senate. In my view, he did a good job. He did uh, canvass the issues broadly. He's been one who's had a very active interest in Aboriginal affairs. I feel that he is constructive uh, in his contributions. Uh, whilst the minister might disagree, I can accept that, but uh, he has a job to do and he does it well. And uh, I think that uh, the minister perhaps ought to be a little less sensitive and uh, perhaps uh, then the intensity of the remarks that he's made uh, uh, I don't uh, be, order. be order. I don't order. think uh, that order. I don't think the that the Minister contribution order. by way of interjection uh, adds anything to the debate minister but let it rest where it does rest and let us recognize what's happening today and that is that this legislation is historic it does achieve something for the most disadvantaged people in this nation the aboriginals those that are in remote areas that are on uh, in living areas that I think uh, need to have title and this legislation achieves that I welcome it on behalf of the opposition and, uh, as I said, each and every member of this House, if they fully understood the implications and what's being achieved here, would also welcome it. But I just make the plea to the Minister that uh, when other senators uh, and other members perhaps uh, are critical, um, that uh, he perhaps not be quite as sensitive and, and look at the end result. I think the end result is what's important in this area and I think we've achieved something today. With those remarks, Mr Chairman, I support the uh, amendments as proposed. Right. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Northern Territory. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to firstly share the Minister's pride in the fact that uh, this government was able to get successfully uh, have this legislation addressed after what, uh, as the Member for Bass quite rightly pointed out, was a very tortuous path. I do not concur, of course, with the comments that the Member for Bass has made about uh, the contribution of Senator Tambling in, this pla in the other place. But uh, I do want to just concentrate just very briefly on the historic nature of this legislation and uh, in terms of the amendments which have been put up, um, say that the negotiations which took place around this legislation were extremely important, not only because uh, they showed the goodwill of uh, this government and being able to reach compromised positions with people. But at last, the Northern Territory Government came to its senses and recognised that it had within its power the capacity to negotiate with this government a reasonable outcome for some anywhere up to 6,000 people who live on pastoral leases or on around pastoral leases in Northern Australia. I just uh, want again to congratulate, as I've done previously in this place, the Minister for the work he put in in uh, ensuring that this, this uh, uh, legislation came to fruition. Congratulate the Prime Minister for his initiative in talking to the Chief Minister of the Northern Territory, Mr Perrin, and indeed Mr Perrin for the response he made in the first instance to that, that initiative. It's uh, an issue which is extremely close to me, Mr Chairman, because uh, prior to coming to this place, I worked, uh, in fact, on this legislation for the Central Land Council and was involved in uh, putting positions both uh, to the Northern Territory Government and to the pastoralists 
around this issue, solutions which I might say could have been reached some years ago had there been the intent of the Northern Territory Government. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And I might say that uh, one can only hope that we don't see a repeat of the negative attitudes that have been, been perpetuated previously by Northern Territory administrations in relation to advancing the interests of Aboriginal people in, in the Northern Territory, but indeed by Conservative parties about the uh, advancing the, uh, the interests of Aboriginal people throughout Australia. I welcome the member for Bass's support for this legislation. I do hope that he's able to uh, um, ensure that those people in his party or on the opposition benches, both in this place and the Senate, who have uh, made quite derogatory and outrageous remarks about prominent Aboriginal people desist from doing so, and indeed that they see that the goodwill of this government's approach this legislation and support it in its entirety, and indeed support any initiatives which are taken by this government to ameliorate the poor living conditions of Aboriginal people in Australia. Question of the amendment be agreed to, the Honourable Minister. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, Mr Speaker, I was going to, in my summing up, uh, thank a couple of other people too uh, that I uh, had not overlooked but was keeping the, the good wine to last, if one can use that term, and that's uh, Senator Collins, who's in the uh, gallery, and uh, the Honourable Member for Northern Territory uh, for their contribution. Uh, and in regard to the comments uh, of the uh, shadow spokesman about uh, the good senator in the other place, I have here a fairly well prepared speech by a hard working uh, person who I yet again are probably not going to get around to use but file away for future reference. And I tell you what, you want to read it because it really gives your mate over there a decent old rev up. What I would say is that the tragedy of this debate is that since 1971, Aboriginal people have been living in car bodies and all sorts of appalling conditions while people down here uh, have carried on and argued about whether they ought to get a few acres of land or a few square mile of land to build a, build a, build a house on or build a, a place of living on and uh, they've, they've lived in these terrible conditions and I suspect died in these terrible conditions while we have carried on like that. The legislation is historic and I'm sure I speak for both my colleagues from the Northern Territory uh, Senator Collins and uh, the member for Northern Territory in uh, their joy at now being able to get on with the job of delivering the services which are needed, which are needed. But the tragedy is that you get people like Senator Tamley who expressed no outrage when the Northern Territory government withdrew from the discussions at one stage. When the cattlemen withdrew, no outrage, no outrage yet further attacks on land councils or any prominent Aboriginal person has stuck their head up and said anything. Now that's what my argument with him. I got the thickest hide in the caper in terms of people having a go at me because a few have had a go. So that don't worry me not, at all. What I ask people is, is to tell the truth. The problem with the colleague in the Senate is he can't tell the truth. Now, the problem is that we oughtn't spoil today by getting into that, uh, into that scrap with him, and I won't. No. What I will say is that this is historic legislation. My colleagues here from the Northern Territory and you, Shadow Minister, worked hard to try and bring that about, and we've been successful. And it's a proud day for this government that we were able to overcome what was a very difficult situation. And uh, as the member for Northern Territory said, it couldn't have been done without the leadership uh, of the Prime Minister on the, or the involvement of the Chief Minister. Well, the question this amendment must be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. I move the report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The following message from the Senate has been received. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for your help. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to provide for the regulation of the export and import of hazardous waste and for related purposes, and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annex schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. Minister. Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken into consideration in committee of the whole house forthwith. 
Questions that the House be resolved in committee. All those out of opinion, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman of committees, Mr Mildred. The Minister. Milton, I move that amendments be agreed to. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All those that opinion say aye. Aye. Oh, oh. Oh, the Honourable Member for Bass. Mind if I speak? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. The Minister at the table, I don't think, is, is speaking, so I don't know if he's going to be summing up, but I thought I might take the opportunity to just uh, say a few words about this legislation. It's the Hazardous Waste Regulation of Exports and Imports Bill. It comes back to this place to uh, give effect to an amendment that's been moved in the Senate. The opposition, uh, as was uh, indicated by my colleague, the uh, shadow spokesman for environment, Senator Public, uh, we support this amendment. And uh, as spokesman for environment matters in this place, uh, I have pleasure in doing so here. When this legislation came through this place, uh, it enjoyed uh, the support of the opposition. And uh, it's significant legislation. Those who go back to the debate will see that this piece of legislation did have a long gestation period. It does give a, uh, effect to uh, reports of uh, this parliament of some considerable time ago involving uh, members such as the member for Rawingwa and the member for uh, Petrie, if I recall, former member for Petrie. But it does more particularly give uh, effect to uh, the Basel Convention on the control of transboundary movements of hazardous wastes and their disposal, which was finalised uh, this year in Switzerland. I think that the point that needs to be made is that uh, once this legislation does take effect, it does uh, pick up a significant environmental issue, that of uh, the movements of hazardous wastes. We've seen in recent times the movement uh, across boundaries of hazardous wastes with uh, what I would call the immoral dumping of wastes in uh, poor third world countries where people have taken advantage of their economic circumstances to foist upon them uh, such wastes. We don't want that to happen in Australia and certainly we don't need that to happen in the rest of the world and that was the motivation behind putting into place such a convention to put controls on it and that the motivation and the aim of policy and the energy that's expended with regard to removal and disposal of hazardous waste ought to be towards finding sensible mechanisms and processes to deal with it. And that will require uh, a greater utilisation of scientific knowledge. And uh, with that, uh, we can then deal with these problems, which are world problems and go beyond national boundaries uh, that all of us would want to happen. So I think that this piece of legislation, uh, not unlike the last, uh, is a significant piece of legislation that enjoys the support of all members of this House and all members of the other place. And uh, it is the product of the work of both sides of the parliament over a long period of time and gives effect to the United Nations Environment Program. And in that sense, uh, I think to uh, elaborate on what we're actually doing here uh, so people can understand what's happening, even though everything's been truncated and pushed through very quickly, that we ought not to uh, avoid uh, or uh, not uh, take the opportunity to point out exactly what's happening with legislation as it comes before the parliament at whatever occasion that is. I have pleasure in supporting the amendment. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And the question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. I move the report be adopted. The question is that the report be adopted. All those that opinion please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I don't remember for Bass. Mr. Speaker, I noticed that there's hardly anyone from the government in here to, and I call attention to the state I'll go, of the I'll house. Go, I'll go. Hmm. I'm happy to go. Quorum required. I'm ready. To, what on? Um, Electoral matters. Quorum required. Ring the bells.
Quorum present. Quorum present. Would members please resume their seats? Yeah, point of order. Point of order. On Mr. Uh, speaker, or Mr. Acting Speaker, I might point out that the reason for that quorum was because there was some uncertainty, as I understand, no, on both sides there, of the there, House there, as there to what no, was going no, on. There is no, and no point no of order. Explain to me what was going on. Uh, the member for Bass, the, there is no point of order. If the well, member for Bass feels he's been misrepresented, there are other forms of the House he can use. The of the order, please. The member for Dobell has the call. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, I present the committee's report entitled "Inquiry into the ACT Election and Electoral System," together with the minutes of proceedings. And I move that the report be printed. The question is that the report be printed. All those that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The honourable member for Dobell. I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The honourable member for Dobell. I thank the House. On the 7th of March 1989, an election was conducted for the ACT's first self-governing assembly. Many features of the election were unique in Australian electoral history. Firstly, a unique electoral system known as Modified DONT was, divide, was devised by the Federal Parliament for the conduct of the ACT election. The Australian Electoral Commission described it accurately, in my opinion, as an electoral system unknown to man. Some, some of the unique features include the following. Firstly, uh, 117 candidates nominated for the single territory-wide electorate. The ballot paper was more than one metre wide. A significant number of candidates and parties were opposed to the establishment of any self-governing assembly. A number of candidates and parties were described by commentators as frivolous candidates, and I suppose the most famous was the sun-ripened warm tomato party. Finally, the Australian Electoral Commission required more than nine weeks to complete the count and, declare, and finally declare the result. The Senate referred these matters and others for inquiry to the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters in May of this year. Our first task was to obtain instruc instruction from the Electoral Commission on the operation of the modified DONT system and the eight stages involved in determining a result under the system. A video explaining the difficulties associated with counting the one metre ballot papers and the intricacies of the modified DONT system was very helpful to the committee. After advertising for public comment, the committee conducted public hearings during September and October this year. The committee reviewed evidence covering allegations that the Australian Electoral Commission had been inefficient or dilatory in the conduct of the count and had failed in its education campaign to give voters sufficient understanding of the ACT electoral system. The committee found that given the circumstances of the election, the complexity of the electoral system devised by parliament and an agreement reached with the ACT administration, criticism of the Australian Electoral Commission was unwarranted. The committee also found that the level of candidate deposit was too low and the conditions for party registration in the ACT too loose to discourage the involvement of frivolous candidates and parties in assembly elections. Accordingly, the committee has recommended that the, raising, that the nomination deposit be raised from $100 to $250. The same as now applies for the House of Representatives. In addition, it recommends that for the purpose of gaining registration for ACT elections, political parties be required to demonstrate a minimum membership of 100. The modified DONT electoral system was strongly criticised in the evidence put before the committee, particularly because of its complexity and because it lacks any underlying rationale. The people of the ACT may well ask why the parliament inflicted upon them a unique and untried electoral system. The report that I've tabled today explains in detail the many proposals, counterproposals and compromises which led to the birth of modified DONT. The, the Labor government, having a majority in the House of Representatives, wanted single member electorates. The opposition and the Democrats, having a majority in the Senate, were committed to proportional representation and multi-member electorates. The government, being unable to have its preferred position adopted by the Senate, put forward a form of proportional representation based on the DONT electoral system which is used in a number of European countries. In Europe, the pure DONT system is a party list system and operates fairly and equitably in the allocation of seats to parties. Individual candidates are elected according to their position on the party list. The government, proposed that a don't, the government proposed a DONT system where electors would be able to vote for candidates as well as parties. DONT was further modified in the Senate by the Hill amendments. These opposition amendments basically allowed the preferences of eliminated candidates to be taken into account over the eight stages of the count. One of the most complex features of the legislation uh, is the deeming provisions, which can result in a person's vote being interpreted and counted other than in the way intended. The committee has recommended that, where possible, the Senate formality rules and deeming provisions serve as a model for any new electoral system. 
Very few of the submissions received by the committee supported the retention of modified DONT in its current position. Uh, many changes were recommended. And I would point out, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the ACT Liberal Party recommended the adoption of a proportional representation based on three electorates uh, of seven members. Residents Rally wanted to remove the wrinkles from the DONT system, whatever that means. And the No Self Government uh, uh, Party was quite happy for the current DONT system to be modified in some way, but the basic philosophy of DONT to be retained. And it was the Labor Party that was arguing for single member electorates. The committee considered at length, and I would stress at length, whether it was possible to find some version of the DONT system which could now be considered acceptable to all parties, and finally we were unable to achieve that result. The Labor members of, of this committee believe that the best electoral system for an ACT assembly is one based on single member electorates. Other members of our committee have formed a different opinion, and the chairman of the subcommittee which dealt with this report will expand on that in some detail. While the Labor members of the committee had the numbers to, uh, to bring down a majority report, uh, we thought that it was much better to operate in a spirit of compromise. The committee remains divided over our preferred alternatives, that is single member electorates on the one hand, the Labor, member, the Labor preferred position, or a proportional representation system on the other, but we believed it was preferable to allow the people of Canberra to choose between these two alternatives in a referendum. The committee has therefore recommended that the Commonwealth fund a referendum offering these two alternatives. The committee has recommended that all parties agree to introduce as quickly as possible that system preferred by a majority of the ACT electors. This inquiry was conducted by a subcommittee, chaired by, very ably by the member for Chisholm, Dr Michael Woodridge, and I would like to thank him in particular and other members of the subcommittee for their efforts. Thanks are also due to other members of our committee and the inquiry secretariat, uh, headed by Mr Alan Kelly and this subcommittee inquiry uh, run by Dr Robin Seth Purdy and Helen Missa and uh, for her, her excellent assistance. I uh, would once again like to thank members of the committee for their cooperation in, in, in allowing us to have a majority, a uh, unanimous report being adopted today. Honourable Member Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. When I accepted the uh, task... The Honourable Member Chisholm, um, perhaps I should point Member for Dobell spoke on leave and... Thank you. I, I would seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Mm. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Chisholm. Thank you. When I accepted the task of chairing the subcommittee inquiry, uh, I did so quite enthusiastically. I was surprised then when, whenever I mentioned this to any of my colleagues, they looked at me and said, what on earth have you done to deserve something like that? I guess their concern came home to me after the first two days of our public inquiry, when we had 12 people appear before us and present 12 different ways of fixing the ACT electoral system. As we went through the evidence, two things became very obvious. The first was that there was overwhelming community opinion that the modified DONT system was unworkable and had to go. The modified DONT system will be remembered for two things. It will go down the record books, in the words of the Deputy Electoral Commissioner, as being a system unknown to mankind. And secondly, it will be remembered for the fact that it produced the second largest ballot paper in history only surpassed by what was called the orange blanket in an Illinois election in the 1930s. It's pertinent to ask ourselves why we got the modified DONT system. From the evidence that appeared before the subcommittee, it uh, shows that the ACT administration section of the Department of Arts, Tourism and Territories was aware that the system was unworkable prior to the legislation passing through the parliament. The Electoral Commission, in fact, wrote twice to the department and the department passed on those letters to the minister and received no reply. It appears that uh, it was the decision to have self-government at any cost and put an unworkable system on the ACT and uh, I guess history will decide whether that was worthwhile. The second thing that was obvious to all of us is the, electoral co the ACT shouldn't be used as a further experiment. And this did limit us somewhat for while we had some very novel and very well thought out proposals that may have in fact worked, we were concerned not to make the ACT another experiment. So that really limited us to the possibility of single member electorates, a Senate type system or the Hare Clark system. In the end, the whole committee wasn't able to agree on just one system, but too much shouldn't be made of that because we did propose a method of resolving the situation where there were two preferred options. And I think also on a difficult and political uh, issue like this, 
to have the Labor, Liberal, National and Democrat representatives and the independent senator on the committee all agreeing to one report is quite an achievement. The member for Dobell has uh, extolled the virtues of single member electorates as he sees them. I'll not pursue too much about Hare Clark as I believe it's been done admirably in the report. However, there's two points that I want to make. On the balance of evidence presented to the committee, it's the overwhelming wish of the people who came before us that there be some form of proportional representation in the ACT. And secondly, the uh, Hare Clark system is misunderstood, and certainly in the minister's speeches at the time, he referred to it as a system specifically designed for a House of Review, which is a bit hard to understand considering the Tasmanian lower house has used it since 1907 and the Irish Parliament since 1920. I'd like to thank uh, Dr Robin Seth Purdy, who worked tirelessly and tenaciously to get this report out, and Alan Kelly and Helen Missa on the uh, committee secretariat, and also my colleagues on the subcommittee, Member for Dobell, Member for Fisher and Senator Schott. We work very hard and in a bipartisan manner to try and produce something worthwhile. We hope it will be a lead to our colleagues in the parliament and we commend it to the people of the ACT. The Honourable Member for Bendigo. Mr Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training, I present the following reports. Uh, firstly, work in progress, award restructuring and industry training, uh, together with the minutes of proceedings. And uh, a second report, postgraduate awards, review of the Auditor General's report number six of 1989-90. And I move that the reports be printed. The question is that the reports be printed. All those of that opinion, please say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Member for Bendigo. Mr Deputy Speaker, I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the reports. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Bendigo. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Standing Committee on Employment, Education and Training, uh, I'm presenting two reports of the committee. One report is entitled Work in Progress, and it examines aspects of industry training and award restructuring in three industries the motor vehicle manufacturing industry, the tourism industry and the textile clothing and footwear industry. The second report I wish to present is titled Postgraduate Awards and it deals with the administration of the Commonwealth's Postgraduate Research Awards. These very different reports touch upon the three subject areas of specific interest to my committee. Uh, employment and training in the case of the Work in Progress report and education in the case of the Postgraduate Awards report. I'd now briefly talk about each report in turn, uh, commencing with the Work in Progress report. The title of the report, Work in Progress, is an apt one. Award restructuring is an essential feature of the progress which needs to be made to increase exports, to make Australia more competitive and hence to improve our standard of living. But the changes encompassed by award restructuring will take many years to put into effect and the process has only just begun. So my committee's report is about the achievements which have been made so far, particularly in those three industries that I've mentioned. From the visits and discussions with representatives in the industry, it was apparent that a number of positive changes have been made to the ways in which work is organised uh, in industries across Australia. In particular, we were keen to see examples where multi-skilling has been put into effect, where arrangements such as profit sharing have been introduced. Changes in work organisation and training arrangements, which are part of the award restructuring process, will certainly further improve the working environment. One of the committee's clear findings was that if award restructuring is to be successful, then those directly involved must have a full understanding of its rationale, the general process involved and its detailed application in the workplace. They must be kept informed, consulted and encouraged to participate fully in the process. However, some of the, uh, the management and the union representatives with whom we met were uh, to a degree apprehensive about translating the general agreements on award restructuring reached at peak level into practical details at the enterprise level. We found that the level of understanding about award restructuring and uh, also the degree of commitment to it appeared to decline the further removed the participants were from peak level negotiations. In general, the level of awareness also declined the smaller the firm and the further it was located away from capital cities. The committee makes a number of recommendations, therefore, to uh, improve the consultative process and the flow of information. The committee also, uh, in its uh, studies of these industries, 
uh, made a number of other observations about the award restructuring process. As I've said, we believe it has enormous potential to substantially improve the working arrangements in place in Australian industry and to substantially improve Australia's competitiveness and uh, standard of living. The committee makes a number of observations about industry versus enterprise bargaining, further observations in relation to training arrangements and the need for a paid training package to be developed. We also make some uh, observations about absenteeism and labour turnover in those three industries which, uh, as many members of this House might be aware, uh, run at uh, considerably uh, high levels, uh, some uh, 20 per cent per day for production line workers in some of the industries we visited. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, time is short today, and I do wish also to comment on the second report, which uh, is in relation to postgraduate awards. This report follows up the findings of the Auditor General's report earlier this year that the Department of Employment, Education and Training had not rigorously applied the procedures which ensure that postgraduate awards are granted only to those eligible to receive them. In particular, the department had not taken steps to verify whether award holders had appropriate citizenship or residency status or whether they were receiving any other Commonwealth financial assistance. The timing of this inquiry, therefore, is opportune. As of next year, administration of the postgraduate award scheme will no longer fall under the Student Assistance Act but will be devolved to tertiary institutions. It will then become the responsibility of the tertiary institutions to ensure that award holders meet the eligibility criteria. The committee's recommendations have been framed with these changes in mind. From the outset, I should stress that the committee has no wish to impose cumbersome administrative procedures on the operation of the postgraduate award scheme. We strongly support the scheme and commend its significant contribution to Australia's research effort. It would be disappointing, however, if instances of maladministration were to detract from the value of the scheme. The report's recommendations involve only minor administrative procedures, but they are nonetheless procedures which we believe will provide greater safeguards against erroneous payment of Commonwealth funds and also against deliberate fraud. The committee proposes that all applicants for Australian postgraduate research awards be required to furnish evidence of their citizenship or residency status. Under the devolved arrangements, it should be a simple matter for students to present their evidence, be it a certificate of citizenship or a birth certificate, in person to the tertiary institution upon taking up that award. We also recommend that all award holders should be required to provide their tax file number upon the approved application form for postgraduate awards. Such a requirement is consistent with verification procedures which are in place in other government programs. For instance, all students in higher education courses, all applicants for Aus study, and most recipients of other government benefits must all provide a tax file number. We therefore believe that this recommendation is consistent with other government programs. Mr Deputy Speaker, we believe our recommendations will improve the administrative efficiency of the Australian Postgraduate Award Scheme. May I say, uh, in conclusion, that I would like to thank uh, the many people in large and small organisations who assisted the committee in the compilation of both of these reports. I'd like to also express my gratitude to my committee colleagues for their participation in these inquiries and to the members of the committee secretariat for their research and organisational support while putting these reports together. I'd like to particularly thank, uh, in relation to the work in progress report, the work of the specialist advisor, Rod Pickett, and uh, secretarial uh, staff member, Secretariat staff member Anne Cronin, and in relation to the report on postgraduates awards to, uh, to Gillian Gould. I'd also like to thank uh, my other committee staff and the Secretary, Lindy Smith, for uh, the great assistance they've provided over this parliament in the preparation of uh, five parliamentary committee reports. I commend these reports to the House. Oh, the Honourable Member for Forest. Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker. I would also like to briefly speak uh, tonight to, to this report, to the report Work in Progress Award sorry, Restructuring. I, I'm sorry, I must interrupt the Honourable Member for Forest and point out the Honourable Member for Bendigo was speaking, having sought to leave the House, and if the Honourable Member for Forest wishes to address the House, he too will have to seek leave. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I seek leave to uh, make a short uh, statement on this uh, report being tabled. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Forest. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. <coughs> I would, uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly, like to support uh, the work uh, that we've, the committee did, the work in progress award restructuring and industry training. But firstly, I would like to join uh, my colleague uh, on the opposite side <clears throat> to express my thanks to the committee secretariat 
who greatly assisted both uh, in the draft in this report and during the uh, conduct of the inquiry. I'd like to also express my thanks to the business people who welcomed us into, our, into their factory sites and business premises and gave up their time to meet with us. The committee was asked to study industry training and award restructuring, giving particular attention to training and government training schemes, workforce flexibility and the, de and the development of career paths. We chose to direct our investigation towards three industries vehicle manufacturing, the textile clothing and footwear sectors and tourism. Today I would like to confine my comments to one particular area of investigated, investigated the tourism sector. May I say the sites that we visited involved in, in this particular part of the component were very, very impressive. The operators that, that we met with in the tourism industry constantly pointed out to the committee the difficulties resulting from national awards established by a central body. They argued that these awards did not take into account the different operating conditions of each resort. For example, hours of, op of, of opening, the location of the resort and the resulting difficulties, such as attracting labour to isolated areas or of seasonal operating conditions. Many of the operators within the tourist sector pointed to voluntary enterprise agreements as being a more appropriate and effective way <coughs> of operating their businesses. Under the Coalition's voluntary enterprise agreements, conditions of employment are determined in the workplace by employees and employers. Both parties are able to take into consideration factors which impact only on themselves, factors such as regional employment conditions, the availability of labour and, importantly, of, re of, of the recognition of skills. One large tourist operator <coughs> the committee met with accurately illustrated the effectiveness of this policy. He is currently required to deal with 15 units, unions, numerous awards and a multiplicity of classifications. His company favoured the enterprise agreement as it would enable he and his employees to take account of conditions unique to their enterprise and would be administratively simple. On the other point that came through as a result of our discussions, and which I'd like to make comment on, is that workplace negotiations and award restructuring is not a simple task. It's time consuming and, demand commitment, and demands commitments in the workplace by unions, employees and employers. It also involves a commitment from the government to see through the reorientation of our education institutions and training schemes. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to commend this report to the House. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend various acts relating to law and justice and for related purposes and acquaints the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments indicated by the annexed schedule, in which amendments the Senate requests the concurrence of the House of Representatives. Minister? Oh, I'm sorry, Deputy Prime Minister. Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be taken in consideration committee of the whole House forthwith. The question is the House be resolved into committee forthwith. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Chairman of Committees, Mr Mildred. Uh, the Minister. Uh, Mr Mildred, I move that uh, Senate Amendment Number 1 be uh, agreed to. The, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister. Mr Mildred, I move that the Senate Amendment Number Two be agreed to. I understand there's some amendments to that. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The honourable uh, member for Menzies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it must be said at the outset that this is, uh, in many respects, a wholly unsatisfactory procedure, uh, which has been embarked upon with respect to this bill and uh, which uh, we are now proceeding to embark upon again with respect to this bill. It's a very curious thing, uh, Mr Chairman, that uh, we have uh, uh, a bill called the Law and Justice Legislation Amendment Bill, which passed through this House and went on its way up to the Senate, or along to the Senate, perhaps. And uh, uh, after that, uh, when the bill was in the Senate and after members of the House of Representatives uh, had uh, adjourned, what was in effect a new bill was introduced by the government in the Senate, another batch of uh, stodge, uh, 
with uh, no notice, no consultation, uh, introduced as a voluminous uh, amendment in the Senate, uh, which now comes back to the House for consideration. So, in fact, there are two vices in it. The first is that that procedure was followed. The second is that um, you won't find in the Senate Hansard any explanation of uh, uh, these amendments or this new bill, as I call it. And uh, we now have the Attorney General moving that the uh, amendments uh, be, in effect, incorporated into the bill. Now, it really is a very unsatisfactory situation when you do not have in either House uh, anything uh, approximating a sustained explanation for the introduction of very substantial amendments to a bill. So substantial in effect are they that they really amount to a new bill. And we are now in the committee stages in the House debating in effect uh, in content and in length a new bill without there having been a second reading speech here uh, or I, in the Senate. Uh, no, no second reading speech at all, and indeed not only that, but no explanation for the opposition to engage in a second reading debate. The so, of that corporations legislation. Or, order. In, in, order. Indeed, as the honourable member says, it is a variation of the corporations legislation, and it is uh, entirely unsatisfactory that voluminous amendments of this nature should be put to the parliament in this matter, in this manner, and at such short notice. Now. I only have limited time, Mr Chairman, and I therefore won't go on in that uh, uh, vein because the harsh reality is that no matter what criticisms we may have of the procedures adopted by the government, which really are indefensible, nevertheless the House and this committee at this stage have to grapple with the amendments and uh, do our duty to the Australian Parliament by deciding whether to uh, pass them uh, or not. Now, if I had had more time, I would explain in more detail what this uh, batch of amendments is concerned with, because you won't get any explanation from the government. You didn't in the Senate, and you won't in the House, and you won't anywhere else either. Uh, so it's at least up to the opposition, I suppose, to give to uh, the readers of Hansard and the public at large at least some uh, explanation of what this is all about. And what it's all about, in effect, is to amend the Australian Federal Police Act uh, 1979 uh, so that there is some legal basis for the use of listening devices. The second proposal is to amend the uh, Australian Security Intelligence Organisation Act uh, to exempt the transfer of personal information from Commonwealth bodies to ASIO from the provisions of the, Pri of the Privacy Act 1988. And that, uh, the second amendment that I'm speaking about, means that Commonwealth agencies may provide information to ASIO without infringing the Privacy Act. The third uh, amendment, uh, in effect, uh, will, or the third group of amendments, I should say, are amendments to the Customs Act, which will alter the provisions of the Customs Act dealing with the use of listening devices in several ways. I only have time to mention the first of them that is to allow the use of listening devices in the investigation of all narcotic offences committed in all premises, even ships and aircraft. So one can see that that is a substantial, although I hasten to add, desirable amendment. The next uh, amendment uh, is one to the Judiciary Act and relates to the Australian Government Solicitor uh, and whether it can act for two government parties in the same matter and I'll say a little more in detail about that at a later stage. Then there are some amendments to the Telecommunications Interception Act, uh, which make minor amendments to terminology. Now, to turn in more detail, Mr Chairman, to the amendments to the Australian Federal Police Act 1979, what we should note is that the government is proposing to insert, in effect, a new division into the Act, which will regulate the use of listening devices by the AFP in the investigation of non-narcotic offences. The proposed amendments are in the same terms as the provisions of the Customs Act that deal with the use of those devices in the investigation of narcotic offences. Now, we note that the government says, curiously enough, that these amendments are an interim measure only, pending a comprehensive review of legislation dealing with listening devices and phone tapping devices. We take the bill, therefore, to be an interim measure, 
but we have to say that this is, as I've said already, a curious statement from the government, because the fact is that several reviews of the use of listening devices have already been undertaken. The issue of listening devices, illegally obtained evidence and infringements to privacy, all of which are very, very major matters and which deserve more serious treatment than the government has given them in this legislation, have in fact been considered in a number of reports. Let me mention three of them. The report of the Joint Select Committee on Telecommunications Interception, the Australian Law Reform Commission reports into privacy and criminal investigation, and the report of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into alleged telephone interceptions. Uh, now, Mr uh, Chairman, we say that it's curious to note that the government has chosen to select, select some of the recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission in its privacy report, but has chosen to ignore others and without any explanation. And here I repeat, because it deserves to be repeated, the comments made by my colleague Senator Hill in the Senate uh, only a couple of days ago, because Senator Hill asked there the question, why is this the case? You've got what the government says is an interim measure. They say they need more time to look at the law on the use of listening devices and bugging devices, despite the fact that the subject has been virtually done to death by the Law Reform Commission and other bodies, and they come up without any explanation and seek to implement in legislation some recommendations of the Law Reform Commission and ignore others. Now, we just don't know why the government has done that. And I could go on at great length about this, and would, if one had time to do so. But I simply say that some of the recommendations made by the Law Reform Commission, for instance, that secret surveillance uh, uh, should be prohibited and strictly regulated, but that participatory monitoring, as it's called, not be regulated. That uh, is a subject that's remained silent. And so one can go on. It's very unfortunate that one does not have time to deal with these things. But, Mr Chairman, what we can say is that it's strange that with the history of this matter, the best the government can do is to come along in the twilight hours of this parliament, and from what I hear, the twilight hours of the government, with what it calls an interim measure. And we emphasise that, so far as the opposition is concerned, it takes the view that it is quite inappropriate that legislation which deals with matters of such substance should be introduced in this way at such a late hour and without consultation and without any explanation of why some of the recommendations of the Law Reform Commission and other bodies have apparently been accepted and others have not. Now, the matter arises, Mr uh, Chairman, as to the offences for which listening devices may in fact be used by the Australian Federal Police. This is a major area of the amendments that have been inserted in the Senate, and it is an area which uh, is the subject of an amendment that I propose to move. The bill authorises a federal judge to issue a warrant for the use of listening devices in the investigation of what are described as Class I general offences and Class II general offences. And those phrases are described in the following way. As you see, Class I general offences are specific Commonwealth and ACT crimes such as murder, kidnapping and offences for aiding, abetting or conspiring to commit these offences. Now, it goes on. It goes on. Yes. Um, it goes on, the definition, um, to deal with Class II general offences, and here we have a series of specified crimes, specified by reference to the Acts of Parliament and specific sections. But the problem arises with the rest of the definition, and it must, it must be remembered that this is an important matter to the extent that what Order. is being approved... Order. The Honourable Gentleman's time has expired. I might just quickly reply uh, to one point, because uh, I understand that the debate is... You, you do. I just might reply to your... Uh, look, the Honourable Gentleman uh, made the point that he hadn't had any prior notice or hadn't been adequately consulted. I can understand that being said in, in the terms that Parliament was in session, but I'm reminded that on the 23rd of November he was written to informing him of the content of the proposed Government amendments 
and offering to make departmental officers available for briefing, and then following that his colleague, Senator Hill, uh, moved amendments which related to those matters. So I just make the point, it's not as though we want to have an ambush here. It was on the basis that we had to do something for this very reason, which he would know as a former Attorney General. Advice was given that there was no adequate protection or entitlement for a federal police to be using listening devices uh, because there's no protection for that in the law. It's a gap in the law that's been there for some time and it would be appropriate that we might try and cover that gap now rather than wait for a lengthy period of time because we're dealing with serious offences. Bear in mind we usually comply with state law but certain states don't have any law about this matter at all and the advice to us after the debate here was concluded was to do something about this matter because it appeared to be a gap in the law and it's for that reason that it was introduced into the Senate rather than wait till the autumn sittings. I take it, Mr Chairman, we have an opportunity of going on, do we? Um, um, Mr Chairman, uh, I was, um, before that period of 10 minutes came to an end, what I was doing was uh, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, clause of the bill uh, which deals with those offences, the investigation of which may be assisted by the Australian Federal Police in the use of listening devices. And I was making the point that there are some offences uh, for which loose listening devices may be used when there's an investigation by the Australian Federal Police and those offences are specified quite specifically by reference to Acts of Parliament and sections, so that everyone knows exactly what the offences are. Now, the problem is that there is then in the bill, uh, as amended by the Senate, an attempt to uh, describe other offences in a generic sense. Now, that is what we have an objection to. We want to make it perfectly plain that we are not opposed to the use of listening devices for the investigation of serious crimes. In fact, we support it. Indeed, it must be said that it is now accepted uh, as a legitimate and effective means of crime detection and prevention. And we are in favour of that and support the use of it for additional offences uh, if it is known what those offences are and if a case is made out as to why it is necessary to use listening devices in the investigation of those crimes. What we are concerned about is this attempt to uh, describe those offences in this generic way so that the precise and specific crimes are not specified. Now, in the Senate, Mr Chairman, uh, we moved uh, an amendment to leave out, in the case of uh, proposed section 12b, uh, in the definition of class two general offences, the proposed paragraph B, and that would remove the generic description that I am talking about at this stage. Now, that has not been completely successful. There was a partial amendment made in the Senate, but we want to persist with this, and we want the government, uh, if this amendment is successful, to go away and then come back when it's in a position to say what are the specific crimes for which the use of listening devices uh, is to be authorised. And I wish to move, therefore, the first amendment, which is circulated in my name, which amends proposed section 12b, definition of class to general offence, the proposition of the amendment being to leave out proposed paragraph b. And I wish to do that formally by moving that the Senate amendment be amended in the uh, way in which is described in the document which I've circulated. While I'm at it, I wish to move the second uh, amendment, which is on the same sheet of paper, and I move that the Senate amendment uh, be amended uh, as follows. That is to order, say... Order. The Honourable Gentleman needs leave. I would need leave. You're quite right, Mr it's Chairman, and I yes. overlooked asking for leave. If I may have leave to move amendments one, two and three on that document uh, together. Please. And I understand the Attorney-General has granted that and I'm indebted to him. Uh, as a matter of formality, to uh, follow that up, I move that the Senate uh, 
uh, amendments uh, be amended uh, in the second way described on that document, uh, that is to leave out the words or small b in brackets. And uh, we also, and I'll do this at the same time, having ob obtained leave, move uh, that the Senate amendment be amended uh, consistently with amendment number three on the page that I have circulated in my ma name. That is to leave out the word using. The reason why that amendment, the third one, is uh, moved, Mr Chairman, is so that technical officers uh, employed by the Australian Federal Police will be able to install uh, listening devices, because that is what the bill proposes, and will be able to take part in the incidental work associated with the effective utilisation of listening devices. But taking out the word using will ensure that they are not able to use them in the strict sense of the word, because that clearly is the responsibility of the police. So the work of technical officers should not go as far as enabling them to actually to use listening devices, but simply to assist in the installing and the other incidental activities involved in the use of listening devices. So I've moved those three uh, amendments at this stage so that they're on the record, Mr Chairman. And I would like to use uh, some of the remaining time that I have um, to elaborate on some of those matters. Um, the point uh, has been made, Mr Chairman, that the use of listening devices constitutes, of course, a serious infringement of privacy, albeit a necessary one. And because of that, the situations in which listening devices are available for use we believe should be expressed very carefully. Uh, the problem, as I have said, is that the description of class two general offences, describing those offences for which listening devices may be used when the police are investigating the commission of those offences, is really, as it is presently drafted, open-ended and it is ill-defined. And what we say is, notwithstanding the half amendment made to this in the Senate, uh, an amendment made to the original government amendments. Uh, the generic description that is still there gives us uh, concern. And we feel uncomfortable about giving uh, surveillance powers for the investigation of unspecified offences which are defined only in this broad, generic manner. Now, we know that the government will say in reply to this, yes, but there are safeguards because the judge granting the warrant will still have to satisfy himself that everything is fair, square and above board and that there's no danger of uh, infringing on civil liberties and all of the other matters that Senator Tate referred to in the Senate. Now we know that that is the uh, answer but it is not an answer Mr Chairman and we believe that the answer is uh, one that can only be uh, that the bill is amended so that uh, it is quite specific uh, as to what offences are to be the subject of the use of listening devices. It's not an answer because uh, the citizen is entitled to know what are the restrictions on the citizen's liberty. The public is entitled to know what offences are they which are to be the subject of this quite new, and it is new, and quite extensive, and it is extensive, intrusion on the rights of the citizen. That is not to say that criminals are to have an open go and are to be free from the danger of having listening devices used to detect their criminal activities. It is not to say that that will be, will be happening. And we would be, of course, strongly opposed to that. But the government doesn't seem to realise that what it is doing here is new. And therefore, there is an obligation on it to explain itself. And the government doesn't seem to appreciate this point, that if you are going to enter into this new field, then you must do it specifically so that everyone knows, both the police force and others, the police force and others, so that everyone knows what are the limits of this quite substantial invasion of privacy and liberty. And we will be the first and the most uh, uh, ardent advocates uh, of the use of listening devices where they are necessary to be used 
for the detection of serious crime and the prevention of serious crime when it is known precisely what the offences are. And we're not going to stand back and allow amendments of this sort to be made where you're going to allow offences like stealing postal articles and failing to renew an export or an import licence, uh, to have those subject to bugging uh, without some explanation given by the government as to why that's necessary. Um, damaging data in Commonwealth computers, that's to be subject to the use of listening devices. Well, it may well be that it's justified and necessary, may well be so, but there should be some explanation given for it and the law should say precisely what the offences are where listening devices are to be used. Now, I've just run out of time. It's as simple as that, Mr Chairman, and it's not possible for me to elaborate these and other arguments on this particular area of the amendments any further. Let me say that that's unfortunate, and it's really no defence for the government to say, well, look, we wrote you a letter at the end of November. You should be up to scratch on this by now. That's just no defence at all. It's no way to legislate, and uh, I can assure you that, uh, to the best of my ability, a future and alternative government will not Order. act in this the, way. The Honourable Gentleman's time has expired. The question is that the proposed amendments to the Senate Amendment No. 2 be agreed to. Before I call the, the Attorney General, might I indicate that the time has been extended, but I, I'm sure that you would agree that we don't wish to make that open-ended at this point. The Attorney General? Well, uh, because because this is uh, we, we, the reason why we extended this time was uh, because we assumed that we were approaching the, the the end of the debate, but we are now into the uh, the, the dinner recess, and uh, if if the debate is to continue for an extended period, then I think it would be appropriate for us to to adjourn this debate to report progress. To resume at 8 o'clock. With, with your indulgence, I may have misunderstood you, Mr Chairman. I understood that what you were saying before was that we would go ahead uh, without any interruption, but in the circumstances, it's going to take some time, I'd have to say that. Um, it's not a five-minute job, uh, and uh, it would seem only sensible to adjourn and uh, come back at a later hour. Order. Then the chair will be resumed at 8 p.m.
Honorable the Attorney General. Mr. Miller, in reply to Mr. Brown's uh, arguments before the gentleman in support of amendments that uh, the opposition moved in the Senate, and which we find unable to agree with, I just want to make the point that the reason why they were introduced into the Senate was because of the obvious defect in legislation which has been there for some time, namely federal police were using listening devices apparently without proper legal authority. That can be a matter of argument, but that was the reason why they were introduced there, because an opinion was given on that basis. And so one couldn't just ignore that opinion and accept that we'll wait till autumn or sometime and we might regularise it because we're dealing with crime detection in a number of ways and it was important to remedy any defect. On that basis, as I said, uh, I wrote to Mr Brown <coughs> advising him of the amendments and he was good enough to reply on the 4th of December saying that he would give consideration to the amendments and would we please let him have a copy of them, which I'm advised we did on the 4th of December. And it follows from that that his colleague, Senator Hill, <coughs> when in the Senate, being aware of those amendments that we intended to move, moved amendments to those amendments. So that's where we are at the present time. Now, the amendments <coughs> that we're dealing with at the moment are three in number, and it relates to uh, leaving out the clause 2b, which relates to a description of offences. The Honourable Gentleman makes the point they ought to be uh, not in this generic form, but uh, we make the point that we're making the issue very clear when we talk about offences which um, are punishable by imprisonment for life or for a period or maximum period of at least seven years. So in other words, they're not minor offences, they're major offences. And uh, we don't accept the view that we need to go off and identify all those offences, wherever they may be, in all the various acts so that we can be specific about them. We feel it is adequate, in fact fair, to talk about offences in the sense that they are very serious, they're punishable by imprisonment for a period of at least seven years, and we think that's a fair way of identifying these matters. It would virtually be almost impossible to go off and identify every particular offence, and for that reason that amendment is not accepted, and that basically picks up amendments one and two. The proposed amendment to 12J3, leaving out the word using, uh, does encourage some discussion as to what is meant by using. Uh, bear in mind we're talking about a technical operation. We're talking about uh, a police officer having to have a warrant to uh, listen to uh, whatever conversation is taking place. But because it's a technical operation, the bill provides for technical assistance. And in talking about that technical assistance, it relates to the question of installation, maintenance, testing, using or recovering a listening device. In other words, without being disparaging of the competence of police officers, it could not necessarily be expected they'd be fully competent to handle the equipment. Their duty is to listen and uh, make a recording, but they need a technical assistance to put the equipment in place. And that's basically what this is about. In no way does it authorise technical officers to uh, use the device in the terms of listening for the purpose of what the warrant was issued. And so it's necessary because if you didn't have that capacity to be able to use it in the sense, using the word using in the sense of using the equipment to make it available for the authorised officer, we would have a limitation on the use of that. It's for those reasons that those amendments are not accepted. That explanation as given in the Senate, but um, it is the reason why it was also rejected there. In other words, the proposition we've got to face here, I summarise it this way, 
is there was a need to introduce these amendments because of advice given that in fact listening devices were used without any proper authority. In some cases there are state laws governing listening devices, in other states there are no laws, including the ACT. And the Honourable Gentleman, former Attorney General, must be surprised to find that was the position because listening devices would have been used in their, his time without any authority. And that was a gap that we had to close. So I, I make that explanation. I can understand the argument, but it's not valid in the terms of what we're about here. We feel there's been an adequate description of the offences and it, it, it couldn't be any better in our view. We've had to accept, reluctantly we say, opposition amendments which deleted the question of using a listening device for serious fraud or serious loss to the revenue of the Commonwealth or the Australian Capital Territory. We can't press it here because we weren't successful in the Senate, and I'm not going to press it now. But it makes the point, does it not, that when we're talking about serious crime, it ought to pick up fraud, in my view. The Senate thinks otherwise, and it certainly ought to pick up the serious loss of revenue, because I think everybody else out in the marketplace there would be feeling as to why would you let criminal activity go undetected? The fear, of course, is that perhaps you're detecting somebody who's engaged in an innocent operation and you shouldn't do it, but the warrant is the safeguard for that. And there has to be some, at least a substantive sort of a allegation that would relate to fraud or serious loss of revenue. But we've lost that argument and I won't press it here, but it was forced on us in the Senate. But for the reasons that I've mentioned, I'm unable to accept the amendments one to three moved by the Honourable Gentleman. The question is that the amendments proposed to the Senate Amendment Number 2 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye of the contrary, no. I think the no. noes have it. No have it. The question is that uh, Senate Amendment Number 2 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye of the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. The, the, the noes have it? Noes. Uh, Amendment. We're dealing with amendments. That was two. That was two. That's two then, which was three amendments. I'm sorry. Yes. yes we're yes. dealing with the three together. Now we've done that. Yes. Right. Okay. So we're up to Senate Amendment yeah. Number Three. Yeah. Uh, the ayes have it. Thank you. The, the question now is that, or um, well, the minister might uh, care to move that Senate Amendment Number Three be agreed to, if that's his intention. Uh, Senate Amendment Number Three is. Take me a moment. Uh, page nine. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes, Senate Amendment Number Three. Be great to. I don't wish to uh, add to it. It's self-explanatory. The question is that Senate Amendment Number Three be agreed to. The Honourable um, Member for Menzies. Uh, Mr Chairman, um, the part of Senate Amendment Number 3 that I wish to direct uh, some remarks to, um, simply to put it on the record, is that the um, definition of prescribed defence has been expanded and the definition of premises uh, has been expanded in the manner in which it is set out in the amendments coming from the Senate. Um, now, there has, of course, um, been some concern expressed uh, uh, about the open-ended nature of warrants that are used for secret surveillance powers with respect to uh, premises. Uh, because um, the definition of premises is in fact new. Normally, of course, you would be exercising surveillance over, over persons, but there's now a new definition of uh, premises inserted and the uh, surveillance will be able to be exercised over premises, which are very widely defined, uh, structure, building, aircraft or a ship or a vehicle or other carriage, and land, whether it's uh, enclosed or not, um, and any part of premises. So that's in fact a very wide definition and although we're not opposing it, um, the House really should take 
notice of the fact in terms of future scrutiny that uh, electronic surveillance in the broad sense will now be able to be conducted over a very wide range indeed, a wide description of uh, premises of the sort that I have just read out. And that really is uh, an expansion of uh, surveillance so wide that I wonder whether members of the Labor Party in particular realise what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but that's not my problem, uh, that's the government's problem. Um, what we say is that, first of all, you should note the extent of the uh, electronic surveillance that's being allowed, uh, and secondly, uh, recognise that that is a, uh, a new area of surveillance which has not previously been allowed. Um, but uh, we just simply say that we're not opposing it, but we draw attention to the extent of it, and we say that it's something that should be noted in the future in terms of monitoring how uh, this surveillance is uh, conducted, because these are powers given under the uh, ASIO Act, and uh, usually members of the Labor Party go into orbit about the very mention of the organisation, let alone expanding the area of surveillance itself. But perhaps a new pieces descended upon the Labor Party and we're not to have those arguments on this occasion. The other aspect of uh, amendment number three to, uh, to which I wish to draw attention is the provision relating to the immunity of judges and the new clause will provide that a judge when uh, he or she is exercising uh, the function or power conferred on him or her by this division, namely to issue warrants. Uh, that the same protection and immunity as a justice of the High Court is given to that judge uh, in relation to proceedings in the High Court. Now, because of the exigencies of time and not being able to debate this in a second reading debate, I trust that I might be given some indulgence uh, when I make some remarks about both this clause and another earlier clause relating to the question of judicial immunity. And uh, the point emerges, Mr Chairman, that uh, the amendments, in fact, uh, give to federal judges uh, the power to issue warrants for the use of listening devices. Um, and as we've seen, the specific clause before us at the moment deals with the immunity of judges who are exercising uh, powers to issue warrants under the ASIO Act. And in effect, what we have here and under the provision uh, contained in uh, proposed section 12D is conferring a non-judicial or administrative function upon a judicial officer, uh, which on the surface would seem to be contrary, some people would say, to the separation of powers principle which is contained in the Constitution. However, it is, we must say, desirable that this power be vested in a person who is impartial and beyond the influence of political processes. And it's for that reason that one has this provision relating to the immunity of judges in the bill in several places. The difficulty with the separation of powers principle is apparently overcome, and I say apparently in the government's view by proposed uh, sections 12D, 1 and 2, which allow judges to consent to being nominated to issue those warrants. Therefore, the power to issue warrants is said to be vested in a judge personally rather than in a judicial officer. Now, the uh, amendments also provide that in exercising this function, the judge is to be given the same protection and immunity that a High Court justice has. Now, this would make a judge immune from both civil action and from direct judicial review. Uh, however, as the task of issuing a warrant is an administrative one, and theoretically uh, that, of course, as a result of that, should be subject to judicial review. It's curious, of course, that there are no built-in review procedures in the amendments that are before the committee now. Now, it seems that the Attorney-General and the government have been moved by the High Court decision in Hilton and Wells, uh, where there was a split decision on whether, whether Section 20 of the Telecommunications Interception Act was valid constitutionally for conferring a non-judicial power upon federal court judges, the non-judicial power being the issuing of warrants for phone tapping. Now, we just simply draw attention to the fact, because these sections are 
often the subject of interpretation uh, in the courts, and the courts these days have regard to what we say uh, in the parliament on these matters, or in the case of the government, what we don't say about these matters. I simply recorded here that uh, it's not mentioned in the explanatory memorandum, and one would uh, not have made this observation without having to research the relevant law. But what we do say is that if amendments are being made because of judicial decisions like Hilton and Wells, it would be sensible for the government to uh, acknowledge that fact. So we all know what the uh, law is now trying to provide, whether or not in fact it does provide it. Now, a further point to raise here, as well as the effect of uh, Hilton and Wells, is that decisions to issue warrants under the Telecommunications Interception Act are in fact exempt from review because of the provisions of the ADJR Act. And uh, what we would like to know is why there is not such a similar exemption proposed here. Now, um, Mr Chairman, I don't think I want to uh, take this any further, simply uh, to draw attention to the issues involved uh, concerning the immunity of judges performing the administrative functions given to them by these substantial amendments so far as issuing warrants uh, are, are concerned. And uh, that is something that may have to be interpreted uh, later on. But uh, I think that's all that there is to say with respect to uh, amendment number three. The Honourable the Attorney General. Mr Muller, amendment number three. The Honourable Gentleman raised the issue of it in respect of the customs provisions and the definition of premises. I'm advised that there have been no adequate definition of premises and therefore it's for that reason that this amendment was inserted. It was a further argument that premises only related to buildings and therefore it was necessary to talk about them also being aircraft or ships or vehicles. So in other words, it was to give a definition uh, to premises as uh, didn't apply until now, even though there had been some reference to them in the uh, customs legislation, which has been in for some time. So uh, uh, you'll notice there's a provision in that Act which talks about reasonable grounds for suspecting that the premises have been or likely to be used in connection with the commission of a narcotics offence. And the argument then took on, on the issue of did you only mean buildings or did you mean areas or places such as I mentioned, namely mobile circumstances, uh, and therefore this definition picks that up. The other matter which the Honourable Gentleman correctly identifies is the problem of, of the division of powers from judges and the immunity of judges comes into this issue. It is true we had, because of the, the doubt as to whether a court could exercise, a judge could exercise such powers without being properly designated or being able to do so, created that difficulty and therefore judges are nominated, uh, in fact nominated on that basis. Hilton and Wells, I didn't think was the issue in that sense so much as the fact that Hilton and Wells was a question of using uh, information that was, uh, was gathered by uh, an intercept. You will recall that that was a matter that the High Court was going to consider on a appeal, but uh, in the finish the case didn't proceed. But the issue certainly was that there was a virtually an unauthorised intercept and it was then uh, published and the question was whether that was an offence. And on that basis then you, uh, you didn't have uh, uh, the, uh, the problem that the Honourable Gentleman feels is the case in Hilton and Wells. I don't see any particular difficult at all about giving judges an immunity in this sense because there needs to be some definition as to who is going to use the power in respect of the warrant and further you didn't want to have the difficulty of the judges being themselves uh, cross-examined as to whether they actually when issuing the warrant had carried out procedures in the sense that perhaps a person that might want to challenge that would feel able to say, well, I'll put the judge in the witness box and I'll go through all those procedures. It's for that reason, then, that you, you've got to try and avoid the issues, the same as in contempt. You don't want to have the judiciary all the time having to 
as for cross-examinations as to whether they followed the law. And so I make that explanation because it has been effective in guaranteeing that the real purpose of, of ensuring that there's no listing devices or intercepts without proper judicial authority, the, the judge concerned will examine the issue in respect of how we have it in the law, namely is the offence serious, is it because of that being able to exercise a discretion, and I'm no doubt in some cases a judge would exercise a discretion that the warrant should not be issued, and that's the, the safety that we, we have. Uh, so uh, that's my explanation to the honourable gentleman. The question is, the Senate Amendment number three be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Minister? Number four, uh, which I have here, I formally move the adoption of that uh, amendment. Uh, the Mr. question Mr. is that Senate Amendment number four be agreed to. I think you've got one. The Honourable yeah. Member for Menzies. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, we have an amendment to move here which is on the list that has been circulated and um, I move the uh, amendment which is amendment number four. Um, so I formally move that the Senate amendment be amended as follows, namely proposed section 28B inserting proposed subsection 55E9A leave out that are not the subject of litigation and insert uh, the words that A are not the subject of litigation and B are not reasonably expected to give rise to litigation. Now, Mr Chairman, uh, this was uh, discussed in the Senate and there's no need to take um, excessive time about it, but the effect of proposed uh, section 55E9A will be to provide that when the Australian Government solicitor gives advice to two or more government bodies in non-litigious matters, the uh, AGS will not be acting in a conflict of interest situation. Um, now, for the practical administration of government, the proposed amendment should be supported. However, we, will, we wish to move, as I have now, an amendment to cover those matters which at the time of the giving of the advice could be reasonably contemplated as, having, um, as matters in which litigation may arise. And the amendment, therefore, as you would have noticed, is to add some words so that not only will the Australian Government solicitor not be able to act for both sides in matters uh, involving litigation, but also in matters which may reasonably be expected to give rise to litigation. That is the rule that applies to the private legal profession, and it is the rule which should apply to the Australian Government solicitor. The only result, of course, is that uh, the government body involved will have to retain an outside firm of solicitors uh, to uh, act for it. Now, if there is a reasonable expectation of litigation, we say, then the government will have to engage a private solicitor, as I've said. That would be a useful step towards privatisation in any event, and therefore should be supported for that reason alone. And our view is that guidelines of this type apply to all members of the legal profession who well know that a matter is likely to give rise to litigation and they then don't act for both sides. Now it was suggested in the Senate by some senators that this additional guideline would be oppressive in the sense that members of the AGS uh, may not appreciate when a non-litigious matter is likely to lead to litigation. Well in the first place I believe that they would appreciate that. If this is the case, in fact, uh, which I doubt, uh, then, uh, frankly, um, uh, one really would be concerned with whatever professional standard uh, people are being uh, told to comply with. But uh, we believe that it's only sensible to amend the uh, Senate amendment in the way in which I have described. Now, once again, Mr Chairman, because um, uh, of the problems about this debate without having any second reading debate, the amendments having been introduced into the Senate, we are of course uh, restricted and uh, I trust therefore with some indulgence I might have uh, one or two minutes simply to refer to a matter that um, is of course uh, affected uh, by the bill which is not specifically within the ambit of the um, clauses under discussion at the moment.
The Honourable Member might have hands in prospects if he didn't draw the attention of the chair of his intended business. That's Mr. right. Mayor. Well, I always think that if you, if you, if you come clean at the beginning, perhaps you might get a better run. But um, the concern is with respect to privileged evidence, um, and there was a Supreme Court decision in um, Queensland, the decision of Rackholt and Lewis, which raised the conflict between legal professional privilege and material obtained by phone tapping conversations, in fact, which take place between solicitor and client. Now, I mention it really because this matter has arisen very recently in the Winchester Royal Commission uh, inquest, and the Canberra Times on the 20th of December uh, tells us this. It might be, uh, I think, the briefest way of describing the event simply by reading this out that comes from an editorial in the Canberra Times, and it's really very hard to believe it says the sordid suggestion that police have been eavesdropping on private conversations between a crime suspect yes, and his lawyer raises as many legislative questions as it does <laughs> moral ones. The allegation raised this week during the inquest into the murder of Australian Federal Police Assistant Commissioner Colin Winchester is that police bug recorded and then transcribed conversations between the prime police suspect in the murder investigation, and then his name is mentioned, uh, David Eastman and other people, including his lawyer, Warren Donald. This, the moral implications are obvious. Professional privilege exists in dealings between lawyer and client, and there is a clear danger that if police obtained information from bugged conversations, they would be tempted to use it or be tempted to change their evidence as a result of it. Now, that's the end of the quotation from the Canberra Times, but um, it really would seem to be a horrendous and monstrous situation if this activity is being engaged in. I would hope the Attorney-General could give us a guarantee that this is not happening, or if it's not known whether it has happened or not, whether he could give a guarantee that there will be an inquiry into it. It's something clearly that does call for an inquiry. You simply cannot have the police force, or indeed anyone else, uh, intercepting phone calls uh, between solicitor and client. You simply cannot have the police or anyone else using listening devices in a clear breach of legal professional privilege because it acts very much to the prejudice of people who are presumed to be innocent. Now, that would be an outrage if that conduct were being engaged in, and I hope that the Attorney-General can uh, uh, clarify the matter for us. But it raises questions like, in the first place, can a warrant be used authorising this type of phone tapping? Um, will, secondly, such evidence having been obtained under a warrant be admissible, notwithstanding a possible claim for privilege? And one could ask the question, will it be possible for secondary or indirect evidence to be given concerning information that is obtained by this means? And for our part, thirdly, we would suggest that there is at least a prima facie case for preserving this privilege by, first of all, stating that warrants cannot be used to obtain evidence in situations where to do so would conflict with statutory or common law heads of evidentiary privilege, or secondly, by prohibiting the admissibility of such evidence. Now, our case simply is that we do not believe that this issue should be left up in the air as we've seen from the Winchester situation as described, uh, and as I've said, it's a quite disgraceful situation if in fact it has occurred. As we've seen from the Winchester situation, it is not just an academic situation. It is apparently a real case which has arisen. And we don't believe that the government can leave this sort of issue up in the air. We can understand that there was an, a need for urgent legislation because it was felt that the police force the Australian Federal Police were using listening devices without there being a legislative authority to do so. That's why this bill is here. Uh, it's why it is here as an urgent measure. And it is why, presumably, the government says it is an interim measure. Um, but it's all very well to say that it is an interim measure, but these sorts of major issues really have to be addressed and the government is not doing its job while it leaves them unresolved. So it's an important civil liberties issue, it's an important police issue, and it really should be resolved. The Honourable the Attorney-General. Well, let me say at the outset, Mr Miller, that I'm unable to 
discussed, nor would I want to, any aspects that the press have been reporting about the Winchester case because it is still before the courts in the ACT. And it could well be that a number of members of Parliament uh, had some interest in that case. I don't know. Uh, I just make the point that it's... I can understand the concern about the, the question of privilege. I agree with the Honourable Member. It certainly would be completely horrendous to think that a conversation between a client and, a, and his legal adviser could be the subject of a, an authorised listening device. The difficulty that the Honourable Gentleman properly adverted to was the reason why there was some urgency about this matter. There's no law in the ACT that prevents it, prevents it at the present time. That's the extraordinary situation, and it existed for all times. I mean, we've just come to the point that we ought to do something about it. And I think this, that's the reason why we're removing those other, other amendments, which related to the particular offences, which ought to be considered. And I don't see any, uh, any reason why a judge could consider even giving a listening device on the basis that there might be a suggestion that it could be used between a legal practitioner, and that's where it would be, the device, I would think, and, uh, and clients. So I can't see that. And if it were, the evidence would not be admissible and certainly it would be an offence, in my view, if it was done. So coming to leaving that aside, and I don't want to say any more about it, let's, we will follow the outcome. I'm aware, though, just as a matter of recollection, that Commissioner Macaulay said, I think I'm right in saying this, and Senator Tate would be better advised than I am on the matter, that he would have an inquiry made as to the allegations that the Honourable Gentleman mentioned. And as that, when that's available, certainly give it to him. The issue of the amendment, though, is to suggest that where we've got the, the, the Australian Government Solicitor having to advise a number of government departments, and the prevention is that that's not to be done where there's a subject of litigation, the opposition are not satisfied with that and want to expand it to say, which is not reasonably expected to give rise to litigation, which means uh, we can't accept it for that particular purpose because it might well mean, even though matters don't ensue to litigation, that they, we wouldn't get even started on giving advice because it might well be that there could be a view taken, well they might rise to litigation. Bearing in mind that at such time as you've had a chance to look at issues, you might not be able to form any opinion at all as to whether they're going to ri give rise to litigation or not. You'd have to get a fair way into the position. Now, the whole idea of the amendment is so that the Australian government solicitor may give advice to a number of parties in relation to the same matter. And, as you know, the Commonwealth is one entity, but it has a number of separate parts, whether it be the Taxation Department, the Customs Department, and matters of that nature. Technically, some of those departments could be seeking advice on the same matter, whether it was liable to fringe benefits tax or something of that nature. At that stage, they would not perhaps, or certainly I would say, not be able to form a view that is likely to give rise to litigation. And uh, on that basis, if they were faced with the issue that, well, they can't take it on, they can't give advice, uh, because it might give rise to litigation, they don't start. So we're de depriving the Commonwealth itself of having advice on matters that certainly could be uh, of real value. It's different when you're dealing in private practice because in private practice the individual parties have separate practitioners. There's no question of, of that. I'm not likely to run into that conflict of interest situation. But to place us in a position that, well, we can't really uh, give any advice in this matter because it may give rise to litigation is an unfair restriction on us. So for that reason, as has been explained before, we're unable to accept the proposed amendment. The question is that the amendment proposed to Senate Amendment Number 4 be agreed to. So those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The question is that Senate Amendment Number 4 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Minister? Senate Amendments Numbers 5 and 6. Amendments 5 and 6, yes, sir. Do you need leave for that? No. no. I'll move amendments 5 and 6. 
be agreed to. The question is the Senate amendments numbers five and six be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, aye. the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that I report a resolution to the House. Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable the Attorney General. Deputy Speaker, may the report be adopted. The question is the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Mr Speaker has received the following message from the Senate. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and acquaints the House that the Senate still insists upon its amendment to which the House of Representatives has insisted on disagreeing. The Senate desires the reconsideration by the House of Representatives of the bill in respect of the amendment. The Honourable the Attorney General. Deputy Speaker, I move that the message be taken in consideration at the next sitting. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Mr Speaker has received the following message from the Senate. The Senate returns to the House of Representatives the bill for an act to amend the National Health Act 1953 and for related purposes and acquaints the House that the Senate still insists upon its amendment number two to which the House of Representatives has insisted on disagreeing. The Senate desires the reconsideration by the House of Representatives of the bill in respect of amendment number two. The Honourable the Minister. I move that the message be taken into consideration at the next sitting. The question is the motion be agreed to. The honourable member for Tangney. Mr Deputy Speaker, I intend to speak very briefly on this motion. The opposition is not going to divide on it, but I wish to advise you and the House that we don't support it. We don't believe this matter should be put off to the next day of sitting, which in effect will mean next year. We believe that the government should deal with it tonight now and that the government should accept the bill as amended by the Senate. Now the sticking point the government has with this bill is the Senate's insistence on the acceptance of its amendment which revokes the August 28 determination of the Pharmaceutical Benefits Remuneration Tribunal. Now, from the outset of what is known as the pharmacy crisis, a crisis over pharmacy remuneration, the Liberal and National parties and the opposition in this place and the other place have argued that the only solution is to go back to square one and start again. We're therefore pleased that the Senate has agreed with this position, not just on one occasion but on a number of occasions. And we're not alone in having this view. In the Tribunal statement of December 4, it offered to conduct a further inquiry into the pharmaceutical benefits dispensing costs subject to the agreement of all relevant parties. This is the point I want to emphasise here, Mr Deputy Speaker. It also offered to return to the status quo existing prior to the August determination with effect from January 1, 1990. And clearly, it is now only the government which refuses to accept the logic of overturning the August 28 determination. The minister responsible for the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, the Minister for Housing and Aged Care, issued a statement on December 4 saying that the government supports the conditions laid down by the tribunal in relation to a further inquiry, including the return to the former level of remuneration. So in the light of this, 
it's hard to understand why the government will not accept this amendment, which is designed to do just that. That is, to return pharmacy remuneration to the status quo existing prior to August 28. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the conditions which the Tribunal has set in relation to the further inquiry is that, and I quote from its December 4 statement, quote, that each of the parties undertakes to take such steps as are necessary to allow the survey and subsequent consequential review to be undertaken free of duress and in a calm and proper atmosphere." End of quote. The revoking of the 28 August determination by the parliament would, in our view, make a significant contribution towards achieving a climate which is really free of duress. Because without this step, the tribunal would simply administratively lift the August 28 determination and have the right to reimpose it at any time in the future. Now, such a situation will only aggravate the instability and uncertainty which has plagued the PBS over recent times. The opposition is anxious to see stability return to the PBS in the interests of the welfare of patients who have been caused a great deal of anxiety during the past couple of months. We therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, urge the government to back its own words with action and to support this amendment so that pharmacy remuneration can be returned to the status quo, which existed prior to August 28, and any further inquiries conducted by the tribunal can then proceed with the full cooperation and confidence of all parties. The adoption of this amendment will ensure that the community continues to receive the best possible services under the PBS and overcome the problems of supply which have occurred since November 1. And finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, it will also allow the government to proceed with its plans to raise the maximum general patient contribution from $11 to $12. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable the Minister. Acting Speaker, the government cannot accept the proposal from the Senate. If one creates a tribunal for the purposes of hearing argument, judicially weighing the merits of that argument, and then making a decision, you don't interfere with that process. The chemist opted to go initially to a tribunal. They received a decision with which they are not happy. Uh, there's been a long and painful process flowing from that. But to say uh, to any tribunal, well, although you're going to hear it again, the government proposes to intervene, is an exercise by the opposition, which is not related to the merits of the dispute, which is not related to the issues that are involved, which is in no way relevant to the level of services which are being provided to the community by many pharmacists. The great majority of pharmacists have not diluted the level of service to their customers. They've been prepared to be critical of the government, as is their right. But uh, I don't believe uh, there's been any dilution of the service that's been provided. So the motivation of the opposition in this matter is not related to the merits of the dispute. It's not related to their concern that there is any deterioration in the quality of services currently provided by pharmacists, what it's related to is a cheap exercise in political vote gathering. You know it, we know it, and the fact that you have the numbers in the Senate to produce this amendment doesn't give it any more merit than, than, uh, than it requires, and accordingly we don't accept the amendment. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. The clerk.
Mr Speaker has received the following message from the Senate. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to prohibit certain advertisements relating to smoking and tobacco products and for related purposes, and transmits the same to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. The clerk. A bill for an act to prohibit certain advertisements relating to smoking and tobacco products and for related purposes. The Honourable the Minister. I move that second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The question is that the second reading be made in order of the day for the next sitting. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Just getting the pace of the pitch here, you see. No googlies tonight, no. It's Christmas. Thank you. The following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to amend the Migration Legislation Amendment Act 1989 and for related purposes and transmits the same to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. The clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Migration Legislation Amendment Act 1989 and for related purposes. The Honourable the Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time. The question is this bill be now read a second time. The Honourable the Minister. Mr Speaker, the purpose of this bill is, in, is to introduce into the review process the power of the Minister to substitute a favourable decision after the first tier of review. These amendments augment section 64U in the Migration Legislation Amendment Act of 1989. That provision allows the Minister to set aside a decision of the Immigration Review Tribunal and substitute a decision more favourable to the applicant if the Minister thinks it's in the public interest to do so. The Minister's power to substitute a more favourable decision can only occur if the Minister thinks it's in the public interest to do so. The term public interest is not limited solely to public issues. Consideration of the public interest could involve consideration of the circumstances of the particular case having regard to unusual, unforeseen or other features that are deserving of a favourable response against the background of Australia being a compassionate and humane society. Concern has been expressed at the time it will take for a case to proceed through each tier of review before the Minister can use the power contained in section 64U. The Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on Migration Regulations raised this point specifically. These amendments will meet those concerns and enable such cases to be decided by the Minister at an earlier stage of the process. The exercise of the power will be subject to an obligation to report to Parliament twice each year within 15 sitting days of the 1st of January and the 1st of July. Where the Minister has exercised the power under the proposed provision, no review by the Immigration Review Tribunal will be available. The Government will keep under review those cases where the Minister's decision is more favourable than the first tier review decision, but not the most favourable, with a view to determining whether review by the IRT should be available in some circumstances. To remove confusion as to the operation of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977 in relation to the Minister's powers after each tier of review, provisions have been inserted which provide that there is no duty on the Minister to exercise the power in individual cases. The Bill provides that the Minister's powers cannot be exercised to grant an entry permit where the grant of a visa under Section 11D or temporary entry permit under Section 11P is conditional upon the holder not being granted an entry permit while he or she remains in Australia. I present the explanatory memorandum to this bill. The question is the bill be narrowed a second time. Is leave granted? Uh, we need to have leave to continue the second reading debate. Leave is granted. The Honourable Member for Dundas. Yes. Mr Deputy Speaker, 
With some familiarity with this subject, I sat here tonight in fear and trepidation as I listened to that second reading speech. And I thought of all those at home listening to that speech and wondering what it was that we were discussing. Uh, incidentally, in relation to the uh, Migration Legislation Amendment Act, we do have a number of issues relating to migration law, one of which is being addressed in this bill that we have received from the Senate. And to understand this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not a matter of listening to the Minister's speech or reading the explanatory memorandum or looking at the bill itself to understand what is happening. I think it is important to understand what the government is doing at this time. And I intend in my comments to put this bill in context. The government has been about codifying migration law, ensuring that the parliament puts down the rules in legislation, the rules that will apply for those seeking to enter Australia. It's doing so in two ways, by general principles outlined in the uh, Principal Act, that is the Migration Legislation Amendment Act, and by regulations made pursuant to that Act. The Act was passed last May, completed its passage in the Parliament, I think in June, through the Senate, and was proclaimed law on the 19th of June. In accordance with a Senate practice, largely unknown to us in this House, a date for the commencement of the legislation was fixed at six months after the date of uh, royal assent. And that means that this legislation was to commence operation on the 19th of December past. And the government had to prepare regulations to give effect to the total legislative framework within that time. There were a number of issues that arose while the legislation was being first debated. And you may recall, Mr Deputy Speaker, when that legislation was before the parliament, its passage was very problematical. It was unlikely that the Senate would agree to it becoming law because there were issues between the opposition and the government. Amongst those issues, were these questions. First, who should determine migration policy in Australia? Should it be the government's officials, the bureaucracy, or should the government of the day determine ultimately uh, who should enter Australia? Some might argue that the government of the day can do that simply by passing legislation as we have here, and then it's up to the uh, public service to apply it. Others, such as myself, and certainly those members on this side of the House are of the view, that uh, in particular circumstances it may be appropriate for the government of the day to be able to make decisions in individual cases. And I'll come to that matter in a little while. That was a major issue between the government and the opposition. There were others at that time. We had no idea of the nature of the regulations that were to be introduced into the parliament. Uh, you know, and Mr Deputy Speaker, as does every member of this House, that regulations are largely produced uh, almost as immaculate conceptions. Uh, we don't see them before they're um, laid on the table of the parliament and we're able to consider retrospectively whether we want them to be law, we can disallow them. But in the main, the 
Parliament is not involved in determining uh, the detail of delegated legislation. In this instance, the Parliament wanted to have an idea about the nature of the total legislative scheme that the government was desirous of putting in place. And there was established a joint select committee comprising members of the House of Representatives and of the Senate to consider the detail. It was in the context of the committee review of the detail that this question of the way in which particular and difficult cases where compassionate circumstances may be involved, which are not covered by the general law, that is the Act or the regulations made pursuant to the Act, might be dealt with, and uh, that issue arose. There was a good deal of uh, discussion before the bill, which we are now debating, was ultimately settled as an appropriate method to introduce um, circumstances where a minister might well consider particular cases. In the context of the discussions that took place, members of the opposition were particularly mindful that ministers had always had discretion under the framework of law that had operated before this. And that discretion was very wide-ranging, as the minister himself pointed out in the Senate debate. In the context of uh, that particular power that ministers had in the past, where ministers were able to make decisions, we had seen the development of administrative law, where decisions of ministers might be reviewed under the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act. And the matters that ministers were required to determine in exercising their discretion were considerably widened over time, while matters were deliberated on uh, before administrative review tribunals and the federal court. I know that the minister and the government were very concerned that this had taken out of the hands of the parliament and put in the hands of the courts and administrative tribunals the question of determining broadly migrant entry. And the whole thrust of the government's program might well be jeopardised unless this matter was addressed. And it was in the context of the way in which you resolve this difficult problem, which at first instance we thought might have been able to be addressed in regulations that the Migration Committee was looking at, um, that uh, the discussion turned to a proposal whereby particular provisions in the immigration, I must use the right term for this bill, but it's the uh, Migration Legislation Amendment Act, particular provisions in the Migration Legislation Amendment Act might be modified to provide an avenue whereby the minister could, in a limited way, exercise in special cases discretion to take into account compassionate circumstances that might be put before him. There was also a concern, which I strongly had, that uh, under the arrangements that were put in place originally in section 64U of the Migration Legislation Amendment Act, the minister previously was only able to look at this question of an individual case after a particular matter had been considered by the migration, by the immigration department, by officers who were required to undertake a first tier review, and later by the Immigration Review Tribunal. And there were provisions whereby the minister could, in certain circumstances where public interest was involved, substitute with a more favourable decision, uh, a decision taken uh, in that process that I've outlined. That, of course, could take, in many cases, 
months, perhaps years, as a process. Yet the compassionate circumstances that might be raised could involve severe illness, it could involve somebody with cancer, it could involve a situation where there was death or disability. And the minister would have no capacity under the legislation as it was passed to be able to intervene and to ensure that a proper remedy was put in place. So what we have now is a further compromise, and I think it is in the spirit of the way in which this parliament operates, uh, that in this very sensitive area, uh, the government has been minded to accept suggestions, which the opposition has very strongly pressed upon it, to amend the Act to provide for a new provision whereby a minister can intervene in the process before reviews are undertaken by the Immigration Review Tribunal to determine quickly where compassionate circumstances may be involved, a, uh, a decision which is different to that which officers were able to take under the law, the specific letter of the law that we have passed. So when you look at this bill, what you have is a bill that introduces into the review process the power for the minister to substitute a decision, that is his decision, after the first tier of review has been undertaken by departmental officers. And where the minister comes to that opinion, he may set aside the decision and uh, put his own. And similarly, uh, after the more lengthy process has been determined, the former process under section 64U will in fact remain. And uh, the particular legislation that we have before us uh, asserts that once more. Now it was important that ministers be able to deal with such cases quickly, that there be a provision for a fast track which is not possible through the Immigration Review Tribunal. And the minister, I think, rightly came to the view that it would have been inappropriate, so far as the integrity of the Immigration Review Tribunal was concerned, if he were to try and press gang the tribunal to speed up its own processes in order that its decision was expedited uh, so that the minister could review it. Obviously, uh, in cases like this, it was proper, I think, that the minister also came to the view that in putting in place this amendment, people would have only two options, but certainly not both options. The two options were, if they wanted to review their uh, case, to have it reviewed at first tier and then to follow the route of the Immigration right Review Tribunal, which would review the matter on law and questions of fact, or if there were special circumstances in need of consideration, to apply separately to the minister for him to undertake the review that we are placing in the legislation tonight. But a person would not be in a position to avail themselves of both routes. And that was uh, part of the compromise that was reached. Now, the minister, in his second reading speech, canvassed a number of other questions, which I think it is important in the context of this legislation that I discuss. Uh, firstly, the minister has clarified what is meant by public interest. Under section 64U, as uh, it was uh, in place previously and as it has been reenacted, uh, or as it will be reenacted in the bill which we are considering, the minister may only set aside a decision and substitute his own where there is involved a public interest. Section clearly states where the minister thinks that it is in the public interest so to do. He may set aside a decision reviewed by a review officer. 
um, and uh, substitute a decision that is more favourable to the applicant than the decision recommended by the review officer. Now it's important to uh, then note what the minister has said in his speech because it clarifies very clearly what is meant by public interest. It makes it clear that the public interest also enables the minister to consider individual interest of the applicant as a factor in reaching his decision. And I want to read these words again. It's important that they be understood. The minister's power to substitute a more favourable decision can only occur if the minister thinks it is in the public interest to do so. The term public interest is not limited solely to public issues. Consideration of the public interest could also involve consideration of the circumstances of the particular case having regard to the unusual, unforeseen or other features that are deserving of a favourable response against the background of Australia being a compassionate and humane society. And I want to thank the Minister for making that position clear, because it was one of the very important issues that needed to, to be addressed to ensure that he did have an adequate discretion to deal in all appropriate circumstances. The second matter I want to deal with is also the way in which people are able to approach the minister. Clearly, what are reviewable by the minister and the review officers and the tribunal are only uh, decisions which are reached in relation to applications under one of the grounds set out in the Act and regulations. Now, people's circumstances come outside of any of the categories that are provided in the regulations under the Act, then on its face, on its face, you cannot get before a review tribunal, you cannot get before a review officer, and um, you uh, do not have a reviewable decision. Now, the minister has made it clear in correspondence that he sees this situation where cases may not be uh, dealt with uh, concerning a uh, particular criteria for migrant entry, where their claim is on humanitarian or compassionate grounds, where there is no existing category for entry. He sees it possible that people might make a sham proposal, a proposal that is for a category for which the person clearly does not fit. A person might claim to be a spouse, even though their relationship was one of a homosexual partner, for instance. And uh, in that instance, the person would be seeking because the officer couldn't grant a case that was clearly outside the defined category. But the minister would be in a position to review a, uh, a non-reviewable decision, because the minister would be in a position to invoke uh, his power because the application had been rejected as falling outside of the prescribed criteria of a particular class. And I use those words because those are the words used by the minister in explaining to me and my colleagues who want to know how, in cases where no class exists, they would be able to get the minister to look at it. So that's a separate question, but a very important question that the minister has clarified, and, uh, and I welcome his cooperation in ensuring that that was the case as well. The final matter that I want to address in relation to this matter is the uh, fact that the minister did have a concern, and he outlined it in the uh, Senate, that ministers in the past may have exercised the discretion that they have had irresponsibly. He gave two examples. I think one of a minister who admitted a th over 100,000 people using his discretion. I find it extraordinary that that could have happened. I don't know who he's referring to, 
um, but I am certain that it wasn't a minister on this side of the house, or from this side of the house. But obviously, it is important that the parliament be aware of the way in which a power of this sort be exercised. And so we do have requirements for public reporting. And there is a specific provision for public reporting in relation to the new power that's being introduced. The minister will report six monthly on the way in which he has exercised this power in particular circumstances. I hope it won't be in the form that it's put an unreasonable fetter in terms of the minister properly exercising this power, but I do regard it as important that the parliament and the people of Australia be aware of the way in which the provisions are being exercised. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I have uh, co covered at length the nature of the legislation that we are dealing with tonight because it is an important part of the compromises that have been reached to ensure that the government's migration a legislation amendment act is able to operate with regulations in place. But I don't want it to be thought that our willingness to carry legislation of this sort and the concern that we had that the parliament ought to be involved in reviewing regulations in any way condones the way in which this legislation has been handled by the government. There are a number of uh, simple points that I would like to make. This is a major exercise, Mr Deputy Speaker, of lawmaking. It is of momentous proportion. The original legislation was complex and difficult. The government couldn't show us regulation six months ago, and as a result of hard work by undoubtedly competent officers and diligent officers, there has been produced regulations which run to something of the order of um, 195 clauses in one case, together with schedules, and in other cases, equally complex and difficult regulations dealing with a whole range of other issues Having been trained in the law, having some experience in the area of migration, having had notice of these regulations more than most other people have, I must say, and this is now law, it is now in place, I have little real comprehension of the way in which this law operates. And I'd have to say, that having regard to the amount of time that I have spent on it, that those people who have had one-day courses, like my secretary, or half-day courses, like others, or staff members in the Department of Immigration that are getting uh, documents day by day thrust upon them, I, I just sit here in awe at their capacity if they are to have any competence in dealing with these issues. You may detect from my cynicism, Mr Deputy Speaker, you may detect from my cynicism, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the legislation is so complex, so difficult, that I don't believe, having regard to the timetable that it's pursued, that it can be properly administered, competently administered, and that people will have justice in considering the outcomes of their applications. In fact, the minister himself recognises that these documents may be flawed. He recognises that they may have to be amended day upon day, month upon month, as the detail is addressed. And I want to make it clear, I want to make sure that everybody understands, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the opposition did not agree with that procedure. We have tried to cooperate with the government but we went to the government and said, we know that this legislation has to operate within six months. We know the regulations had to apply by the 19th of December, but on the 24th 
of November, I wrote to the minister, and this parliament was sitting. We sat until the 30th of November. He had time. The minister tried to suggest in the Senate that he didn't have time. That amendments, if they were to be dealt with by both houses of parliament, could not have been dealt with until after the commencement date, the 19th of December. But he was clearly wrong, and I hope he will admit his error in relation to that matter. Because I wrote to him on the 24th of November, and I said, in relation to that very issue, that I believe, for more abundant precaution, it may be appropriate for you to give consideration to an amendment to section four to enable the proclamation of the Act and the regulations to be deferred for a further period by regulation. In that way, the matter could still be in your hands, but it would mean that if for any reason the new administrative arrangements that you contemplate are unable to be put in place, you would then be in a position to ensure that existing administrative arrangements remain in place and our immigration program is not interrupted. And I went on, it seems to me that this decision should be made and the judgment formed at a point closer to the date for implementation of the new administrative arrangements. These comments are not meant as any reflection on the competence of your professional officers, who I believe have endeavoured to draft regulations on very tight deadlines. However, it is a pity that a good deal more work could not have commenced on the regulations before the Migration Legislation Amendment Act came before the Parliament. My concern still remains that the range of possible defects in this new regulatory framework is such that a good deal more public exposure for comment would be a more desirable way to proceed. He had that pledge of cooperation from the opposition, that if he wanted to alter the commencement date, it could have been postponed. Now, we've seen editorials from newspapers. We have seen comments from interested organisations. We know of their concerns. We know that there are possible defects. All of these matters were clearly in the government's contemplation it could have postponed the implementation of this law. The problem that we have is that there may well be complex legal challenges. There may well be, as a result of the haste with which this law has been implemented, a significant number of injustices to individuals. I am concerned that it brings the whole immigration law into disrepute. And I think it needs to be clearly understood that the way in which this matter has been dealt with was of the government's desire, the government's intention. They had another route available to them and they spurned it. The minister said it was not within his purpose, because he was concerned that the, uh, a lot of work had been done, officers had been briefed, there were some costs involved, some printing had been undertaken. These were the sorts of matters that were of concern to him. I'd have to say that I think he runs the risk that the costs of postponing the implementation of this legislation may well be minuscule in comparison to the greater costs that will be incurred in litigation, the greater costs that will be incurred in the uncertainty. And uh, I, uh, I say to the minister, minister, it is on your head, it is on the government's head. There was another route, there was another way, and uh, those people who are interested in this question, who believe that greater public consultation could have delivered regulations that were more workable, more just and more appropriate, uh, should know that the government forwent the opportunity of uh, dealing with this matter in a more leisurely but appropriate way. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Honourable Member for Colwell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm 
in a slightly difficult position in replying to some of the matters raised by the member for Dundas because, as he knows, I'm the chairman of the Joint Select Committee and the Joint Select Committee's uh, deliberations are, to this stage, confidential. However, he did relate on, to a number of matters, um, including, of course, the issue before us, which is the changes to the Act to allow for greater discretion by the, by the minister, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I do want to address myself first to the, his concluding comments in relation to the process. Let me just say that the process um, it, it's very easy to learn about things after the event, but the process that was determined in June was agreed to by all parties. That was the point. The process was agreed to. And the process was that the regulations would be considered in a confidential basis. The draft regulations, and they weren't the final regulations, not even the, because we don't even have final regulations now, because of the regulations now are going to be further uh, added to and amended in the future, as has been made perfectly clear by the minister. I'll come back to that point in a moment as well. But I mean, it seems to me that it's a sort of strange for the opposition to raise on the 24th of November, 24th of November, the issue about the process when they agreed to the process from way back in June. And we've got to go back to the way in which this was formed. The opposition. The committee was formed because the opposition insisted on something which does not normally take place in this parliament, namely the scrutiny of regulations before they are gazetted. And these regulations are the only major regulations that we're aware of that have been put before parliament that have been actually scrutinised by a parliamentary committee before they were gazetted. Now, none of the provisions which apply after regulations our gazette have been taken away. None of those provisions. First of all, the parliamentary committee will make a public parliamentary report after five sitting days. And as everyone knows, what that means is in February. So we have until February, the, the joint committee, to make our observations and to make public observations in relation to the, to, to the uh, regulations as gazetted. In addition to that, because of this uh, public process, we will be able to, to overcome the problem which the shadow minister referred to, the member for Dundas, namely the, from the, the complaints from those people that there has been insufficient public consultation. Well, it was very difficult to have public consultation when the terms, uh, and, uh, the terms had been set down for a confidential process. That was the problem. But after the regulations are gazetted, there is nothing pre preventing a public com consultation process, and the committee has determined, and the honourable members from the opposition on the committee know that the committee has determined, to go into a public consultation and submission process in relation to the regulations. And when the parliamentary report is brought down, that will happen. So that it's not correct to say that, uh, you know, these, as some people, critics out in the community have said, that these regulations were brought out purely in secret and that there was no, there's going to be no public consultation. In fact, there will be. But further to that, Mr Deputy Speaker, the committee went beyond the original understandings and actually received submissions, confidential submissions, from the major organisations that are concerned with this area. And some of the organisations that have made criticisms are the same, very same organisations that were provided draft re regulations to comment on. They were provided the draft regulations on a confidential basis and they provided submissions to the committee. Now, it's true that there was not enough time because of the time span involved for them to, to, to make major... Uh, you know, it would have been better to have a bigger time span but they will be able to make now public submissions in this second stage. Because what will happen after the parliamentary report comes down is that the, the, the parliament has 15 sitting days in which to make a determination as to whether to accept or reject the regulations, as it does with every other regulation. So what we have now is very much 
a transformation from the confidential process into the public process. And I've made that assurance to the public and to those organisations that are concerned that we will be doing that and we'll be looking at that public consultation process and the public submissions. But in addition to that, in addition to that, let me say that no matter how much of a public process takes place, the fundamental point made by the minister in his response to the member for Dundas is correct. Unless you actually put down the regulations, see how they operate, see where errors may occur inadvertently, you'll never get a process going. And the fact is that we were under pressure, not merely because of the deadline set down in the legislation, but we were also under pressure from all the people who wanted to see the new migration system off operate in its full bloom to see how it would operate. Now, the fact is that the minister has accepted the vast majority of the recommendations of the first report of the Joint Select Committee. And not only did he re accept the recommendations in relation to changes of regulations, but he also accepted, and this is very important, he also accepted that the problem which was pointed out by the committee in a whole chapter in the report, that, whole, that problem, namely the problem of discretion and the problem of compassion, needed to be dealt with by changes through legislation. Now, the Honourable the Shadow Minister suggested, or seemed to suggest, that the changes came as a result of representations from the opposition. That wasn't the only thing. As the minister states in his second reading speech, the fact is that uh, the changes came from the concern expressed in particular by the Joint uh, Parliamentary Joint Select Committee on Migration Reg Regulations. So the committee's report was significant in achieving the change that we're, that we're debating here today. But I made the point earlier that it's important for the system to get into place, to see how it operates, and if there are problems, to iron them out. And that's when the public discussion and public submission can be very useful, because we can see then, in the actual operation of the system, those problems which may arise. Now, there is another important point that the media has ignored, because the media has emphasised those areas in which there are harsh regulations, the areas of illegal migrants and the areas of, uh, of the, the difficulties for people changing status if they come here as visitors and tourists. What the media has ignored completely, and this is to their disgrace in my view, is the fact that the new system is going to be much fairer and has already demonstrated itself to be much fairer for the biggest section and the most important section of the migration program, and I'm referring here to family reunion. Because there is no doubt that the new system will be fairer and has already demonstrated itself to be fairer in relation to family reunion. To everyone's surprise, the, the new pool mark, no one has commented on this, but the new pool mark for the, new, for the, for the family reunion system was 85 points. That compares to 80 points of the previous system, but the difference is this. In the previous system, you could, you could only get 10 points for, for the family relationship, and now you can get up to 35 points for the family relationship. In other words, the 80, 89, 90 program, family program, the key immigration program, will be fairer and will be easier than the tough program of 1988-89. And this point has been ignored by the media and to their shame by some of the critics from the ethnic communities, who were the very same people who were insisting on a program. And I point out to the honourable members that the recommendations of Fitzgerald was that the family, and con uh, the, the family category and the independent category be merged into one whereas the government has accepted an alternative suggestion and has separate categories. And this means that the family category has a pass mark of 85 and the independent category a pass mark of 100. 
so that there is no doubt that the new system is much, much fairer for the reunion of relatives, for, for Australian citizens and Australian residents to be able to sponsor and reunite with their families than it's ever been, or at least that it's been, ever been for many years. And in addition to that, when you add the fact that the English language requirement has been taken out of the family program, the program has been made fair internationally, so that there is no doubt that we now have before us a very fair system indeed. And although, of course, the regulations path means complexity, because the member for Dundas said, well, this is all too complex for me. I think he was exaggerating, actually, and under, understating his capacities uh, and, his, and his capacity for understanding. I mean, after all, after all, I can reveal this much about the parliamentary committee. He certainly was, it didn't show that lack of understanding when we were going through the regulations tirelessly, one at a time, for so many hours at the committee. But nevertheless, nevertheless, let me say that I believe that while the new regulations, that while the new regulations the system will be difficult initially, it has the great advantage in that, in that it guarantees, it guarantees entry to people once they pass through the, the particular criteria of the regulations. It takes it out of the realm of subjectivity. It makes it much more objective. And if we talk, for example, about family reunion, we have, in addition to the large category that I referred to before, certain special categories of family reunion, such as, for example, the last remaining relative or the special needs relative, all of which will be able to come in and it won't be a matter of subjectivity, it will be a matter of objective criteria whether they meet those conditions or not. So, of course, you need 190 pages or whatever it is to specify all those rules, but nevertheless, the result will be much greater objectivity in the system. And of course, people are going to take time to get used to it. And that's one reason, one reason why I've argued that in some ways it's better to bring it in to see how it operates. And if we come across either unintentional or excessively harsh consequences, we can fix them up in, in relation to the way in which the system is going to operate and we can have submissions to the parliamentary committee in relation to that. Now, let me now turn to the crux of the legislation itself, which, as I say, came out of the recommendations of the Joint Parliamentary Committee. And the crux of it is that Section 64U, namely the, the Minister's discretionary power, as it existed in the Act that was brought in in June, that, that that power was seen as too limited to deal with certain problem that arose in relation to the regulations. And what was the problem? The problem was what would happen in cases where there were compassionate circumstances where it could be argued that a person should be admitted notwithstanding the fact that they failed to meet a requirement under a particular category. And so, in the, old, in the act as it was brought in, the position was that the minister could look at those compassionate circumstances after that person had been rejected, and rejected in the first review in the department, and rejected in the second review by the Immigration Review Tribunal. And so it was argued that what was needed was a situation to deal with urgent and important cases where there was a, where it was important to deal with the matter quickly rather than have the sort of delays which would occur for if a person was to be, go through the whole system in the first place before they could appeal to the minister's compassion. Well, we have reached an agreement as to, deal, as to how to deal with this problem. And the member for Dundas has commended the government in reaching this agreement because what it will be possible now in the future is that if a person is rejected in the first tier, they will be able to appeal immediately to the minister if there are urgent circumstances. 
and that means that the minister can come into the process much earlier and consider the case at that point. And this is important in cases where the, there are these additional compassionate circumstances. But it's also important in another case which was, which, which was concerning us. And that other case is the case where a person doesn't fit into any category. It appears as if they want to apply, but they can't seem to apply under any particular category. Or if they applied under any particular category, that particular category would not really take account of the real reasons why they were applying to come to Australia. In that case, in that case one way to go would have been to create a special category to deal with those. Well, that approach has not been accepted. And instead, what has been accepted is what has been accepted is the approach which required uh, is the approach which allows the minister under the expanded section 64U to deal with the matter to deal with the matter in the way in which uh, I've explained. That is, after the person's been rejected at the first tier, that person can appeal to the minister and be dealt with under that special discretionary power. Now, the member for Dundas raised a problem with this. The problem, he said, was what about people who can't apply under these categories? Why should they be expected to apply in a bogus way under a particular category? And he, raised, he used the example, for example, of a homosexual person who wanted to be with their partner having to apply under the spouse category when clearly they were not a spouse. Now, let me say, that in relation to that specific example, what is required, a person in that situation can apply under a number of categories. He doesn't have to apply as a spouse, he could apply under independent migration. <laughs> he, he, he can apply, if, he, under, if, if he's got some relative in Australia, he can apply under the family category. Or he can apply under a number of other uh, categories uh, which are established. In fact, there are uh, up to, I think it's nearly 60 categories in which you can apply in this, in, in the, under the new immigration system. So, therefore, uh, what would happen in that case is that the person would apply under one of these categories, the one that he considered was the best suited for his purposes or her purposes, and at that time they could then be considered for the additional compassionate circumstances which they might want to bring to the attention of the minister. And that is the way in which the system will proceed. Now, of course, with the amendments, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, much depends on the minister's desire to exercise the, amend the amendments to 64U. If you have a particular minister who doesn't feel like exercising that power very much, that minister is only going to look at a small number of cases. If, on the other hand, you have a minister who feels like exercising that power comprehensively, that minister may desire to look at a very large number of cases. The, the situation is left in the hands of the minister because there is no requirement, and this is very important, there is no requirement on the minister to look at cases if the minister, if the minister does not feel that the compassionate circumstances warrant anything more than a cursory look at the matter. In other words, the minister can decide to use his own system for determining which of those cases are going to come to his attention and how to deal with them. And that is as it should be, because ultimately in immigration law, the matter that should come to the attention of the minister are those matters which are uh, going to be determined ultimately by the government of the day, by the government of the day. And that principle is important. The government can consult parliament comprehensively, but ultimately the responsibility for the final decisions in immigration must lie with the government of the day. And this is embedded in the new discretionary power. I welcome the extension of this ex discretionary power. I welcome this bill and I welcome the changes that have taken place. I think that I would say to the member for Dundas, let the system operate and let's see if, we, if it operates 
in the best possible way, and where there are problems, the parliamentary committee can deal with them. Order. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm, I'm sure that if anybody is listening to this bill, they would feel surprised at the fact that here is a bill that both the government and the opposition are giving their wholehearted support to, and yet there seems to be an enormous amount of disputation going on in the chamber. And that probably bears a little bit of, uh, little bit of explanation. I was quite fascinated by uh, some of the things that the member for Chifley said uh, in his speech. Um, amongst other things, he contradicted uh, what the ministers on the record were saying about the uh, bill a number of times, and, uh, and a couple of other areas too. And I'll, I'd, I'm very pleased to have the member for Chifley to refer to as a uh, call, sorry, uh, very close, um, when, uh, when having further discussions with the minister on it. The, the essence of the dispute, of course, is, is not the actual bill, although there are certain things that need to be said about it, because uh, the opposition is not, certainly not 100 per cent happy about it and thinks it could have been done uh, in a more satisfactory way. Uh, nevertheless, the opposition is pleased that this much movement has taken place. The essence of the dispute is that this is inextricably bound up with the regulations which were gazetted just Monday this week. In fact, it is because of the consideration of those regulations that this amendment is before Parliament at all. This is not an afterthought that the Minister had last week about a bill that passed the Parliament last June. This amendment uh, relating to ministerial discretion has come about because of discussions that have taken place in relation to some, as the member for um, Cornwall. Chifley, whichever said, um, in a confidential way on some confidential documents, which limits me in what I can say. But I, I have the, the greatest difficulty with, the, with part of the central thesis of the uh, member's argument, if I can come to it. We have what is, in my 16 years of, of experience of parliament, something totally unprecedented before us in this entire change in our migration system. The uh, member for Dundas pointed out how voluminous the regulations are that have been gazetted this week, and they are not all the regulations that are necessary for the operation of the system. There are still some regulations that haven't been written. There are transitional regulations. There is modification of existing regulations required. So, it should be borne in mind that the reference he made to the number of regulations is only one section of them. And I have never encountered a rewriting to the, of a system to the extent that the Migration uh, Legislation Amendment Act rewrote the system, plus the enormous, not only number of regulations, but effect of those regulations. This is, this is landmark legislation and a landmark way of going about something. A system which is operated in a certain way for decades, namely essentially on statements of ministerial policy and instruction, becomes codified. Very, very radical departure from the previous system. And it would not have been at all unusual under those circumstances for the government to have made fully publicly available its draft regulations or most of them. There may have been some reasons for enforcement reasons or policy reasons that a few would not have been made available. I can see that. Governments commonly make available discussion drafts of bills when something major is going to happen in an area. Commonly. I've seen bills lie before this parliament for a couple of years while there's comment and inquiries. I beg Plaid Varieties Rights, uh, Minister. A very long time indeed, through two, uh, uh, through uh, the periods of two different governments. But and, and that can happen when there's a, a very major departure in something. And there's no reason it couldn't have happened in this case. I would love to respond to you all night, but I have only 15 minutes left. We can talk about it later if you like. The rights appeal was absolutely right. 
And that is one of the reasons there is absolutely right that we should be concerned about. And that's one of the reasons there's so much concern at the moment. I have to take issue with the minister in relation to the, uh, some of the things the minister said in relation to timing on this legislation. In the um, Senate, uh, there was um, some comment made by Senator Jenkins, who is the Democrat spokesman on uh, immigration, and there was uh, some reply made to it by the minister, which I would like to quote. The um, Senator Jenkins said, in response to the uh, assertion that seemed to be gathering some strength, that it was the Democrats were to blame for the fact that these regulations had to be in place by 19 December. The government's own drafting instructions state that, that, that although it is the government's preference for legislation to be proclaimed no later than six months after passing through the parliament, nonetheless, the minister has the option of a later date provided there is a suitable reason. I would have thought that very complex legislation, which depends on very complex and numerous regulations, would provide such a reason. The minister, of course, had an indication of that before the regulations were proclaimed and he had the offer of uh, support from the uh, opposition and he had a detailed way of doing it. The uh, minister nevertheless uh, replied, I make it quite clear that the agreed... Oh, I'm sorry, your pardon. Um, the, the minister replied in relation to that, um, we were asked at one stage to defer the bill. There was a practical problem with that. He then ran through the dates and says, a fresh bill on 28 November was a possibility but all these things have to go through some sort of processes through party rooms, etc. And I say uh, to the government, if that was the reason that the government did not take up the uh, suggestion made to it by the opposition and specifically by the member for Dundas, what procedures have been followed with the bill before us tonight? I was the acting shadow minister when this bill first saw the light of day last Thursday. The House of Representatives was not sitting. I heard it existed per telephone. That was the first the opposition knew about it. It was introduced into the Senate, debated and voted on that day. There wasn't too much concern about party rooms. The detailed amendment had not been shown to anyone in the uh, opposition prior to that. No worry about government caucus. It is possible if the need is there. And the uh, procedure that the minister himself has followed shows that. I um, take the strongest possible objection to the suggestion that somehow the Joint um, Select Committee on Migration Legislation has played some sort of role in delay. Um, I want to uh, quote from uh, something the minister said in the Senate last week on that subject. He says, I make it quite clear that the agreed process was that the committee was to give me its observations by 21 November. That did not prove possible. I did not kick up at all. I extended the deadline, even though the parliament had dictated otherwise, and waited. I make the point, Mr. Uh, Act, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that the minister, although he had it explained to him, gave the regulations to the committee on the worst possible date. There was a flaw which had not been detected in the um, resolution which appointed the committee. As acting chairman, I had pointed out to him as soon as it was detected that that was a date he should avoid giving them to us, namely the 31st of October, because there were provisions for how the committee had to proceed if given them before the 31st of October or after the 31st of October, but not on the 31st of October. The committee just decided, out of the generosity of its collective heart, to treat them as though it had received them before the 31st of October in order to try to meet the 21 November reporting date. In fact, it was under no obligation to do so. None. But it, uh, it tried to cooperate with the minister. Nevertheless, there were delays, inevitably, in getting some advice. We were provided with one set of review regulations, which we considered essential to consideration of the leg legislation, several days later. We worked very hard indeed to try to get the reports in. And uh, under those circumstances, I am not going to sit still in this chamber on any occasion that it is suggested that somehow the select committee has delayed things or added to confusion. Now, I refer to uh, something headed, a public control instruction, 
from the Department of Immigration, Local Government and Ethnic Affairs. It refers to procedures advice manuals which have been published and are being issued uh, to uh, guide people involved in advising people of what they must do under the new uh, regulations and legislation. And uh, it's described as being used as a companion to the Act and regulations to aid decision making for applications lodged on and from 19 December 1989. A number of these policy control instructions start with the words in the heading corrigendum and supplementation to PAM subject. So the booklets have been printed and already the corrigenda are going out. Apparently there is a standard paragraph that uh, appears in the advice that uh, it relates to corrigenda. It says the PAM contains relevant extracts from the migration regulations. However, because of printing deadlines, the contents were of necessity prepared prior to the outcome of the extended timetable provided to the Joint Select Committee on Migration Regulations. The PAM content has in places, therefore, been somewhat affected by the outcome of the committee's consideration. I make two points. The committee did not actually have an extended timetable. It had a truncated timetable because of the date on which the minister gave the regulations to it. And secondly, that statement that the content has been somewhat affected by the outcome of the committee's consideration appears as a covering note on matters on which the committee did not make any recommendation for change. So it is being used as an excuse for putting out corrigenda when uh, that was not the reason on some occasions. And, but it's, and I'm not going to allow that assertion to become standard wisdom either. And there's something else I'm not going to allow to happen. I'm not going to allow the minister to try to have people think that he should be a legend in his own lifetime. And in his uh, reply to the, um, to the uh, second reading of this bill in the House of Representatives, he said some pretty extraordinary stuff. An amendment was moved by uh, Senator Jenkins, which uh, added words um, saying, the Senate condemns, uh, added words to the second reading, the Senate condemns the government for setting in motion their process of making complex and weighty migration amendment legislation, which depends heavily on regulations, which are themselves equally complex and weighty, without first giving the parliament a proper opportunity to scrutinise and approve those regulations. In his response, the minister said this, for the first time ever, we circulate the regulations to a select committee to look into them. It in turn circulates them publicly. Senator Teague intervened, not publicly. The minister said, not publicly. They went to only 20 or 30 different groups. They're only in the position of about 50,000 Australians at the moment. One, one suspects the minister was a little emotional at this stage when he made that assertion. I cannot find one person involved in immigration who does not have a copy of them. I can find lots of people involved in immigration who still don't have a copy of them. They can't afford them. We have gone through all that process for the first time in history, and probably the first time in history I get a motion can canning me for doing it. I say, no, we'll bring you all into the process. We will set up a select committee. We will let you examine the regulations. We will go through a series of negotiations and all that. So what do we end up with? We end up with an amendment condemning us for doing that. And Senator Collins, a government senator, interjected, you're a mug. And Senator Ray said, Senator Collins says I'm a mug. I would have to agree with him. At that point, one could hear the, the tears rolling down the, uh, the minister's cheek. The minister didn't set up the committee. The chairman of the committee, a government member, told us tonight why the minister set up the committee. Because the opposition wasn't going to let him have his migration legislation amendment bill if he didn't agree to it. The bill that changed the whole procedure. It was a condition of passage of that bill that parliament have an input into scrutiny of the, the regulations. It was stated in debate here, we would not agree to a move like this that was going to put so much into regulations, including government policy, and policy which would be restricting rights which existed unless parliament got a look at them, the way not parliament can get a look at legislation. So I'm sorry. But the minister's not going to take credit for setting up the committee. Absolutely not. He's been very cooperative with the committee, I will say. He is a cooperative minister to deal with. Sometimes he's a fairly tough minister to deal with. But I don't want him to get too carried away with how golden-hearted he was, because he really didn't want the committee. Not really. It wouldn't be a committee if he could have helped it, but he couldn't help it. And so far as the circulation of uh, the draft regulations are concerned. Since I was the acting chairman at the time that happened, I will place on the record the, the circumstances under which that happened. The committee felt in advance it needed some expert advice and how right it was.
Lots of people, thousands of people are going to need expert advice now that the regulations are public and what the devil they mean. It's, it drew up a list of peak organisations, if you like. It wrote to them and said it was going to have available to them some draft regulations. It would be looking at them on an extremely tight timetable. They were confidential and would remain confidential until the um, regulations were published by the government. However, we would appreciate the opportunity for some outside input and provided those organisations agreed to accept the regulations on the clear understanding they were to be kept totally confidential, they could have a copy, but we weren't going to give them to them otherwise. And every organisation which received a copy of the draft regulations through the committee had given a prior undertaking that they understood that and that they would abide by the confidentiality. Now, it appears that some one or two or three or more, I don't know how many, broke the confidentiality. Not very badly, I might say. The issue surfaced only a couple of times, interestingly, in Melbourne on both occasions, once in a, a small report in The Age and once in a, a radio report. And it really is amazing, when you think of it, that there wasn't a more breach of confidentiality. But there was very little. And I would like to put on record my thanks to those people who did uh, abide by the undertaking of confidentiality. The um, last thing I would like to do is refer to some statements that, were in, uh, that have been made in this debate and quote from an Australian editorial. The, the, uh, the uh, member who spoke before me, I've got myself permanently confused now about whether it's Chifley or Curtin or uh, Cornwall. Um, the the, um, the uh, member for Cornwall said that, uh, you know, this is the way to do it, as the minister has. Put these regulations into effect and then let's find out what's wrong with them. Well, what a horror. I mean, there are so many things in those regulations that uh, are, are going to be, uh, cause so much trouble, the, the, they're going to have to be changed, could have been pointed out before people's positions were prejudiced and before we uh, all started to get much older than we need to be, before our time. The editorial in uh, to today's Australian says, the new immigration regulations are a textbook example of the worst way of making and promulgating laws in a highly sensitive area. The intent of the regulations to be tough on illegal immigrants is laudable. Indeed, it is essential. But the execution has been clumsy and unfair. The Minister for Immigration, Senator Ray, has admitted the rules may be too harsh, especially as they apply to the spouse of Australian citizens. They will need still further amendment. He justifies this approach by saying it is better to start off by being harsh and then become more lenient. This is a silly assertion. It is much better to get it right the first time. The Immigration Department, which traditionally has been lax in enforcing the law against illegal immigrants, has now overreacted. I might say I distanced myself a little from uh, that statement. I don't think that's entirely fair. Uh, the regulations have the air of a public service operating in its most thoroughly bureaucratic manner. They show little understanding of how people actually live their lives. Administrative trial and error is no way to proceed in an area which so affects the lives of Australians, the lives of those who would like to become Australians and the future composition of our population. And um, I say in relation to that, I could not have said it better myself. And of course, it is the fact that in immigration you are talking about individual lives and individual cases in every case that we have this amendment before us tonight. It is essential that there be a capacity for ministerial discretion. And finally, I must distance myself from a statement the uh, minister made and has made more than once uh, in parliament in how ministerial uh, discretion operates. He said on the 30th of May, it goes this way, uh, a parliament comes up to me and says, please let so-and-so's brothers tell you there's a lot of votes. That's in relation to change of status. He said it in other cases about members coming up and saying, oh, look, I've got a marginal seat. If you'll approve this one for me, it'll help me. Now, look, he's a Labor minister. It's pretty clear. Now, Liberals are going to him and saying, look, I hold a marginal seat which the Labor Party might be winning. Will you give me this decision, minister? I mean, that's, that's not happening, number one. It's a pretty sad indictment of what's going on behind the scenes. I have, in 16 years, three times asked a minister to exercise his discretion. On one occasion, because an allegation had been made to me about corruption in one of our overseas posts, I saw the minister about, I'm sorry, I've asked the minister's discretion more often, I've seen a minister on the subject more than once, and I wanted to pass on the allegation. I didn't know whether it was right or not, but I wanted him to know about it. On the other two, and one other occasion, the minister rang me and asked for further explanation 
of an aspect of a case. And the third one, the, uh, the, the situation, frankly, was so wild, if you put it into writing, nobody would have believed it. But I knew it to be true, and I just simply wanted to assure the minister that I wasn't writing a fairy tale. It was right. It isn't overused, but in every case when I have used it, it has been essential. The case has been deserving of, of very compassionate consideration, and there is no way, when you're talking about individuals, that you can cover them all in a just way in regulations. And uh, that uh, use oh, of ministerial order. discretion in extremely compassionate cases is essential. The Honourable One Member's time has expired. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Migration Legislation Amendment Act 1989 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the to proceed to the third reading for fifth? Do I have to put leave for that? It is the leave granted. Uh, leave granted, I'll permit that uh, thing, Minister. I move the bill a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of, the, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Migration Legislation Amendment Act 1989 and for related purposes. Clerk. Oh, what have we Um, order the, uh, <clears throat> the following message from the Senate has been received. The Senate has passed a bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related, and for related purposes and tra transmits the same to the House of Representatives for its concurrence. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. The Honourable the Attorney-General. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. These amendments to the Family Law Act will clarify the rights and obligations of parents and the rights of their children after separation, while the major impact of the amendments will be to, prov will be to provide force to orders. The bill will also provide a mechanism to ensure that the parties and the courts will address underlying problems in the difficult area of access to ensure that the needs of all parties to a dispute are met in the most appropriate way. The amendments will also provide a range of sanctions which are more appropriate to the particular problems created when an order concerning the parent-child relationship has been breached. In most cases where the parent's relationship has broken down, the welfare of a child will be best secured by the child retaining contact with each parent. This legislation has the objective of promoting a climate in which such contact can be maintained, notwithstanding the failure of parents to communicate or agree on other matters. In early 1983, the Australian Law Reform Commission was requested to investigate and report on the law of contempt. The Commission provided a lengthy report in 1987 in which it gave some particular attention to the problems posed by family law matters. In its report, the Commission described the relationship between the family court's role as a helping court, in which conciliation was emphasised, and the penalties available for contempt of court as a central paradox. The maintenance of traditional concepts of rights and their enforcement by penalty can only preserve the existence of that paradox. The problem that is posed for some parents in enforcing orders that they have access to the children was also addressed by the Family Law Council in 1987. The government has been assisted by the reports provided by the Law Reform Commission and the Family Law Council. In addition to those reports, we've also sought and received public comment on the issues addressed by the bill. The Family Law Act now provides courts with the power to punish a person for contempt or for so-called quasi-contempt. There are two contempt and two quasi-contempt provisions. To some extent, they overlap and there's no clear guide to the circumstances to which each offence will apply. The quasi-contempt provisions are to be repealed and replaced with a single non-compliance provision. This will clarify the law in relation to acts and omissions which amount to non-compliance with a court order and define the boundary between what is and what is not a contempt of court. Where a court is satisfied that a person has failed to comply with an order and had no reasonable cause for not complying, the court may impose a penalty. 
The penalties available include those now available for quasi-contempt, such as fines, imprisonment, the placing of a person on a bond, delivery of documents or a document such as a passport to a court officer, or sequestration of property. Two significant additions are to be made to the range of penalty options which are available to a court. A major addition to the range of sentencing options is the inclusion of community-based corrections such as community service orders. There are a range of such penalties now available to the courts when sentencing a person for offences under the criminal law. The amendments will make such sanctions available in response to civil offences for the first time. The novel use of such sanctions in the civil area was recommended by the Australian Law Reform Commission and has the support of the Family Law Council. The practical availability of community-based sanctions will depend on negotiations with the states and territories. Those negotiations have commenced in the Standing Committee of Attorneys General, where there has been a favourable response to a proposal that further negotiations occur. The negotiations will deal with three major topics. First, it must be determined which of the sanctions referred to in the amending bill will be made available by each state and territory. Secondly, there is the issue of the number of hours which a person may be required to attend under such an order. In the criminal area in which we apply state or territory law, the maximum limit of community-based sentence varies from state to state. For example, in Tasmania, the maximum limit is 240 hours. In Victoria, the maximum limit is 500 hours. The bill provides a mechanism to fix a common maximum penalty. It is important that the penalty which is imposed by a court should not be dependent on where one lives in Australia. Thirdly, there is the issue of payment to states and territories for the use of their facilities. In the criminal law area, the Commonwealth does not make any direct payment for the provision of such facilities. An indirect payment is made through the revenue sharing arrangements, but states have a constitutional responsibility <coughs> provide facilities where a person has been convicted of an offence against on. the Commonwealth. A person found to have contravened a family law order will not be convicted of an offence against the Commonwealth and accordingly it is appropriate that the Commonwealth meet the reasonable cost of provision of facilities by states and territories in an area of Commonwealth responsibility. An important issue for the course to consider in determining whether to impose an alternative sentencing option we whether such a sanction should be an alternative to imprisonment or an alternative to other options. In the bill, no attempt has been made to fetter the discretion of the courts in this area. Now, the government will monitor the use of alternative sentencing alternatives carefully, as there could be significant resource implications if an expectation were developed that sanctions such as community service orders were the standard sanction for non-compliance. In the government's view, such a sanction should be sparingly used. The second addition to the range of sanctions which a court may impose is a court may order compensatory access. This power is one which courts now possess, but the absence of a specific provision to make clear the possibility of compensatory access has had the effect of limiting the claims of those who have been denied access unreasonably. While the provision will make a previously little used course of action more likely to be used in the future, it should by no means be assumed that compensatory access will be granted every time access is withheld. As in all matters affecting children, the welfare of a child will be the paramount consideration, and accordingly compensatory access may not be ordered if there are circumstances which rule against such an order. The other sanctions which may be imposed under new subsection 112 AD are sanctions of a type now found in the existing contempt and quasi-contempt provisions. However, even in relation to the existing sanctions, some important changes have been made. It will no longer be open to a court to imprison a person for an unlimited term in order to coerce compliance with an earlier order. An order that a person go to jail until he or she has complied with an order can only be of value for a limited time. After that time, the order fails to achieve its purpose and can no longer be justified. The bill provides that the maximum period for which a person may be imprisoned for failure to comply with an order is 12 months. That limitation is, in one respect, an expansion of some existing penalties available under the Act. At present, the maximum term of imprisonment for contravening a custody or access order or for breaching an injunction is three months. However, there's no maximum term of imprisonment if a contravention is dealt with as a contempt of court. The maximum term of 12 months is subject to an important caveat. New subsections 112 AE2, 3 and 4 
provide an obligation for courts considering the imposition of a sentence of imprisonment to consider other options and to state the reasons for rejecting the other options, including the additional sentencing alternatives previously mentioned. Sequestration of the property of a person who has contravened an order remains a sanction <coughs> that may be addressed to an individual as well as a corporation. The removal of a limitation on sequestration to the assets of a company merely removes an anomaly which has restricted the coercive powers of the courts. Sequestration is, of course, a traditional method of securing compliance with an order. The 1987 amendments to the Family Law Act introduced the concept of child agreements, whereby parents simply file their agreement at a court registry, thus avoiding the expense of a court hearing. Child agreements have been a valuable means for parties to obtain the benefit of the revisions of the Act to enforce or vary their agreement. To date, such agreements have been limited to matters affecting custody, guardianship or access. Any agreement in relation to child maintenance has been dealt with under section 86 of the Act, which has been well understood and used since 1976 and is not to be amended. However, that section applies only to agreements made by the parties to a marriage. The 1987 amendments did not include any provision for parents to register an agreement as to a child's maintenance if they had not been married. The amendments made by clauses 4, 7 and 8 will allow the parents of ex-nuptial children in relation to whom four states have referred power to the Commonwealth to register their agreement and thereby avoid unnecessary and costly proceedings for an order. Clause five, clauses 5 and 6 of this bill revise existing sanctions 6411A and 11B of the Family Law Act. The amendment will ensure that information as to the whereabouts of a child is provided during a period of 12 months rather than only relating to information held by the person at the time the order is served. Because a broader obligation to provide information has been created, there is a provision made to ensure that an unnecessarily onerous duty is not placed on information holders. Accordingly, if a child is located and returned to its parent, the parent is to be required to advise any person who is required to provide information as to the whereabouts of the child that the information is no longer required. A government department or instrumentality will not be required to search its records more frequently than each three months. Clause 24 of the bill will enable the transfer of ministerial responsibility in relation to the Australian Institute of Family Studies from the Attorney General to the Minister for Social Security. The Government has carefully considered the most appropriate placement of those organisations established under the Act which are pro provide advice in relation to family issues. Advice is provided by the Institute in relation to broad social and economic issues affecting family life and by the Family Law Council in relation to the operation of the family law and legal aid legislation. The Institute's work is in an area which has considerable impact on the social security system and it is more appropriate that the existing links between the work of the Institute and the social security system be strengthened. Deputy Speaker, I commend the bill to the House and I present the explanatory memorandum to the bill. I <clears throat> I understand that it is the wish of the House uh, for the debate on the second reading to uh, proceed forthwith. Is that right? There being no objection, I will allow that course to follow. The Honourable, I haven't actually been asked that question, but now that you ask me, you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, you the answer agreeable? is yes. Thank you. And um, now I call the Honourable Member for Menzies. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from time to time since 1975, when it was passed, the Family Law Act has been amended. It is probably inevitable that, uh, in view of the sensitive subject matter of the Act, it will continue to be amended as community needs and uh, perceptions change. It should be noted, however, that the opposition's law and uh, uh, justice policy uh, proposes what we believe to be a much better way of tackling uh, proposed amendments to the Family Law Act rather than the piecemeal method which has been uh, adopted from time to time. And I say that because the opposition's law and justice policy proposes a complete review by a parliamentary committee of both the Family Law Act and the Family Court. And we really do firmly believe that until that review takes place, individual proposals for further amendments will have to be judged on their individual merits. But what you can almost guarantee is that until there is such a wide-ranging review, you will continue to have piecemeal amendments brought up from time to time, and that will not solve the basic problems that there may be in the system. Now, as it is often said, Mr Deputy Speaker, as you know, 
uh, when a suggestion is made uh, that there should be a parliamentary committee, it is often said that that is uh, an abrogation of responsibility, that it is just putting off a difficult problem. Now, we believe that that is not the case, and we believe uh, particularly that it is not the case in the area of the Family Law Act and the Family Court. There are several reasons why what I say is the case, because members of parliament, when you come to consider it, are one of those very valuable repositories of experience in the community. Many people come to members of parliament with problems that they either have experienced themselves or which they have heard of concerning the Family Law Act and its effect and concerning the Family Court and the effect of some of its orders. That often, ha often happens in the case of Members of Parliament. So Members of Parliament are really a vast repository of experience, accumulated experience of those problems, perceived or real, uh, which have arisen and continue to arise so far as the Family Law Act and the Family Court are concerned. And for that reason, amongst others, we believe that it would be very useful to bring those experiences together for members of parliament who have accumulated them to sit on a committee and bring their expertise to bear on those particular problems and to fashion solutions which one hopes could be solutions that would lead to probably to one batch of amendments to the family law system but one which would enable uh, the system to settle down without this continued piecemeal amending process that goes on. And that is the reason, therefore, why we have proposed a parliamentary committee to look at the Family Law Act and the Family Court. We believe that it is a very good policy and one which will be endorsed by the Australian people at the next election. So far as I know, this bill which we have before us is the fourth group of amendments uh, since 1983. Uh, some of the amendments come from deliberations of the Law Reform Commission and the Family Law Council. Uh, some of them come from government decisions and some of them are more technical amendments which have found to be necessary as the system has proceeded along. Now, we have just heard the Attorney-General's second reading speech and it's therefore not necessary for me to go into these proposed amendments to the Family Law Act in any detail at all. Uh, we support the uh, bill, although of course it is a free vote so far as members on this side of the parliament are concerned. And with one exception, the disposition of opposition members in general uh, would be to support uh, the legislation. When I say with one exception, I don't mean one member of the opposition. What I mean is that with respect to all of the amendments uh, except one, and that one relating to the transfer of the Australian Institute of Family Studies from the Attorney General to the Minister for Social Security, and I'll come to that later on. But what I want to do is to address uh, a few brief remarks with respect to some of the most significant changes contained in this bill. And my first uh, remarks relate to orders uh, made by the court. Now, like all courts, of course, the family court makes orders uh, to enforce what it is judged uh, to be right, and it makes orders on such things as the custody of children and the payment of maintenance. But the Family Court uh, has had, in fact, more trouble in enforcing its orders than most courts have. The ultimate penalty is imprisonment, and because judges are reluctant to impose that penalty when people do not comply with their orders, some orders of the court have, as a result of that, gone unenforced. It has been felt, therefore, that in addition to the traditional forms of penalty, an order for community work service may be effective and the bill will give this additional power to the Family Court. The Law Reform Commission and the Family Law Council support this proposal and uh, we support it likewise. At the very least, we think it is uh, a power worthwhile to give to the court and we will be very interested to see the sorts of orders made, the frequency with which they are made and we will, of course, be very interested to see the effectiveness of those orders 
after they are carried out. The second matter I want to refer to is imprisonment because at the same time the government has uh, uh, admitted uh, or perhaps asserted that permanent or open-ended imprisonment as a penalty uh, really does not work in matrimonial uh, causes. And this, of course, is now to be amended to allow only a maximum of uh, 12 months imprisonment. Perhaps some people might say that that won't work for only 12 months rather than not working permanently and therefore is an improvement. Um, but in any event, it's an amendment which is uh, uh, desirable to be made. And again, it is one of those things which really should be monitored uh, to see how it is put into practice. The third area relates to access. Uh, an additional form of access to children is to be allowed and it's to be called compensatory access. Uh, in summary, if one party fails to give access to a child on the day that that party is ordered to give access to the child, then the court will be able to compensate the other party uh, by ordering additional or compensatory access. Now, this is an important uh, change to the law because I suppose of all of those day-to-day -day problems that arise in the family law area, uh, problems of access uh, really lead all others in terms of controversy and friction uh, because uh, one parent uh, allegedly refuses to give access or puts on such an act or a turn that uh, uh, the smooth implementation of access is not possible to be implemented. And many of those problems brought to our notice are problems of uh, access. Uh, and there are endless arguments about whether this party arrived at three o'clock in the afternoon when access was to commence or whether they were one minute late or ten minutes early and it gives rise to no end of friction and argument and of course it often leads to uh, a denial or refusal of access and of course the children suffer. Uh, it might uh, satisfy the ego of one or other of the parents but the result is that the children suffer because they lose contact with one or other of the parents and it's therefore appropriate that this additional form of access can be granted by the court, compensatory access uh, which one hopes will bring recalcitrant uh, parties into line, especially when it is brought to their notice that some additional access may be awarded, as it were, against them. So we support that also. The next matter relates to child agreements. Under the present law, parties to a marriage may lodge an agreement on the maintenance of a child of the marriage, uh, which of course avoids a contest in court, and one likes to see of course, more settlements, more agreements in this area to avoid the nerve-wracking tension of contested hearings in the court with the inevitable costs involved, both to the parties and to the public through the legal aid system. However, the parents of ex-nuptial children are not able to do this, to lodge uh, an agreement, and the bill will allow them to lodge such agreements, but only in the four states that have referred power over ex-nuptial children to the Commonwealth. The next matter is counselling and a further amendment to the uh, Act will apply to judicial registrars and registrars of the family court the same obligations as there are on judges and magistrates to consider whether the parties can be reconciled and refer them to counselling where it is appropriate to do that. So we support all of those amendments and it would seem to us that they are worthwhile. Uh, as I say, however, it's important that they be monitored and watched to see whether they do result in substantial improvements to the family law system. The one uh, amendment to the Act which is contained in this bill which we uh, really do not like uh, is the proposal to by way of amendments, um, transfer responsibility for the Institute of uh, the Australian Institute of Family Studies from the Attorney General to the Minister for Social Security. Now we are told, of course, that this is a desirable move because reports of the Institute of Family Studies um, have an impact on the social security system, 
and it's therefore appropriate that the Minister for Social Security should be able to have a good look at what they do. Well, of course, the real reason is that it's uh, been very critical of the government, the Institute of Family Studies, and it's drawn attention to the fact that the living standards of Australian families have suffered under the present government, what with inflation and uh, interest rates and uh, the uh, increased poverty, despite the absurd protestations of the Prime Minister and the overall economic decay of the uh, smoking ruin, which we call the Australian economy. Families have suffered as a result of this, and the Institute of Family Studies has put the spotlight on the increasing financial and therefore social and psychological and emotional burden of families. And there are people in the government uh, who do not like this, and I would think that uh, uh, probably the people who do not like this extend into the ranks of the ministry of the Hawke government. And uh, I must say that we are a bit suspicious as to why this uh, uh, change is needed. Surely the Institute uh, operates sufficiently under the Attorney General, and no case really has been made out as to why the Institute should be transferred to the responsibility of the Minister for Social Security. It leaves one really with the lingering suspicion that the Minister for Social Security feels he may be able to knock them into shape. And there have been changes, of course, to the personnel of the board of that institute. Uh, perhaps there may be more if the present government gets an opportunity to do that. And there is a danger that what was a robust independent body, which was constructively critical of the government, may turn out to be uh, something of a toothless tiger and one which uh, no longer puts the spotlight on those economic and social problems facing Australian families. So we'll be watching that very closely, but we must say that we are opposed to this change. Now, I've already said, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there is, of course, a free vote on this side of the parliament on family law matters. That has always been the case on this side and it should be the case, but our disposition is that, it should be the case, but our disposition is that uh, the amendments with the exception of the one that I referred to last are acceptable. It should also be said while we're talking about the family court uh, uh, that although it is of course subjected to criticism, it does have a very difficult job. And I think some of the critics underestimate the difficulty of the job that it does. Some critics underestimate and, or perhaps don't know of the vast quantity of work which is done by the court. It's a very large court and it has an enormous workload which continues to impose a, a daily strain on the people responsible for making the system work. Not just the judges, uh, but uh, uh, of course the registrars and deputy registrars and other officials and councillors and such like who actually make the system work uh, and who work within the system. It does impose very great strain on them. But it must be said at the same time that uh, there really uh, have been, uh, in recent times, improvements in that court. Um, Mr Justice Nicholson, in particular, is uh, universally regarded as a, a very competent and able person uh, to preside over the family court in the capacity of chief judge. He does a very good job indeed. He's introduced a number of practical reforms. Uh, he is very concerned about what one might call it without uh, diminishing its importance, the administrative aspects of the uh, court in the sense of making the court uh, run smoothly and efficiently ensuring that uh, the best people are available where they are really needed, uh, in uh, experimenting with new means of getting the cases through the lists. And uh, whatever the secret formula may be, or it's not so secret, whatever the formula may be, it certainly has met with a considerable degree of success. And I really feel that an opportunity like this should not be passed without acknowledging uh, the tremendously valuable and successful work of Mr Justice Nicholson and in addition to that the 
uh, effective uh, and a very uh, commendable work by other judges and other officials in the family court. Um, there is a new spirit in the court, I believe, and uh, uh, work is uh, proceeding and the court is steadily progressing through the vast quantity of uh, cases which are brought before it. It's also important, and this is the last point I wish to make, uh, that that court is properly resourced. Uh, very important, because if it is not properly resourced, it uh, runs the risk, of course, of slipping backwards, and there is a risk of the gains achieved being lost. And that means, of course, uh, adequate numbers of judges. Uh, it means... Um, it means... Uh, proper facilities and buildings. Uh, it means that uh, the judges should have proper salaries. Um, and of course, uh, judges often make comments about, uh, well not often, but on occasions one hears from various sources concerns about judicial salaries. Um, of course, their salaries are about twice our salaries, I might add, in many cases. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they must receive adequate salaries to attract uh, uh, really good people uh, continually to, to, to the bench. So it's important that the remuneration is adequate, it's important that there be adequate numbers of judges, it's important that there should be adequate numbers of other officials whose work is so important to the successful operation of the family court. And it's important, as I've said, that the physical facilities should be there, both for the litigants and for judges and the public at large. And I know, and there's no need for me to go into the detail tonight, I know that work is being done in that area. It's important that it should uh, continue. Um, so what we're saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that there are, of course, still problems, um, and the opposition's policy is to look at these problems on an all-embracing basis by establishing a parliamentary committee where the collective experience of members of parliament can be brought to bear uh, and we can uh, have a thoroughgoing look at the act and the court and uh, any problems that there are in the family law system. But I conclude by saying that we support the amendments to the act which have been proposed with the one exception that I've mentioned and it will be uh, very interesting to see as time goes on um, just how successful those uh, amendments turn out to be, which we hope they are. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Honourable Member for Macquarie. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. We've uh, just listened to the uh, Attorney General's second reading speech, which gave us a very clear and full rundown on the amendments to the Family Law Act. Although uh, many of the reasons for certain things, particularly the, uh, the last item with regard to the Institute of Family Studies, which I'll mention a, a little later, uh, wasn't given uh, perhaps the uh, full explanatory treatment that maybe it ought. Uh, and uh, it was very good to hear the attorney, the Shadow Attorney General, speaking about the the uh, coalition law and justice policy, which has very clearly stated, as he repeated in his own speech, that uh, a full parliamentary committee will be set up uh, very early in government, when we take over in 1990, to uh, fully investigate uh, this uh, Family Law Act and uh, all the, uh, the uh, activities and so on associated with it. Uh, there are many good features, of course, with the, the Family Law Act, as we all know, which was brought in under the Fraser government. But uh, we also all know, also know that there's been a great deal of grief and agony and anger and frustration and death threats and even deaths uh, that have been associated with decisions that have been made uh, in uh, the Family Law Court or decisions that haven't been made sadly, in many cases. And uh, I agree with the Shadow Attorney-General's uh, comments with regard to Mr Justice Nicholson and the excellence of the work that he has engaged in in terms of this act. And uh, in particular, I'm reminded of uh, one of his calls to this very parliament, 
that uh, we in this parliament, as members of parliament representing the people, must come to grips, for example, with uh, the uh, rights of the unborn, something that uh, everybody is running away from at a great rate at this particular time. But uh, Mr Justin, N Justice Nicholson mentioned that factor, and it's very important, I think, that uh, we as a parliament take very special note of what he says. We acknowledge all the other good things that he says. This is one of the things he's also saying with his equal emphasis, and we need to take note of it. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the uh, other point that I want to make before I comment uh, in, in briefly on this particular or this amendment is in relation to the fact that uh, the cost of uh, marriage breakdown, which is dealt with by this court and which all these amendments are relative to, is enormous. And uh, we on both sides of the House talk often about uh, the need to cut down on government expenditure. Uh, and the House needs to be reminded that every year, relentlessly, we spend the equivalent, and I've said this before, of two new fully furnished, almost, almost fully furnished, parliament houses every year, relentlessly, to support families as a result of marriage breakdown. That's the equivalent of around about $500 per family, each of Australia's 4.1 million families. $500. And uh, yet uh, the government still only spends around about 30 cents per family per year to stop that from happening. So one of the other things in the coalition law and justice policy is that there will be substantial increases uh, in funding towards marriage education and marriage counselling. Marriage education in particular because that's the activity or the education that takes place before the marriage breaks down. And the research has told us uh, over and over again that three quarters of marriages fail because of benign neglect, not through malicious intent. So an extensive education program will be of great benefit to the Institute of Marriage and to the family law. In fact, it will reduce its, the need to uh, come to court and uh, a great deal of money will be saved. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish to comment briefly on two aspects of this Family Law Amendment Bill before the House tonight. I first wish to indicate my total support, as did the Shadow Attorney-General, for those provisions of the bill which will provide force to court orders in access matters and workable sanctions against contempt of the Family Law Court. Most members Mr Deputy Speaker, will be aware of particular cases involving the non-compliance of a family with family court orders. I come to this debate tonight familiar with one case in particular, but one case among many, as the Attorney-General said, most members of Parliament have quite a bit of experience in this particular area, and I have uh, one case that uh, I'm very familiar with involving a woman who has consistently flouted the court's authority and simply gotten away with her contempt of the court by calling almost, as it were, the bluff of judges reluctant to jail parents. Now, I'm not suggesting, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I'm in favour of parents being jailed or women being jailed. I think it's probably the very last resort. But even as a last resort, it's not being done, and there are great and very sad and tragic consequences as a result of this non-compliance. The case that I'm referring to involves access for the father to the children of the now dissolved marriage. The woman has simply refused to accept the court decision on the matter and has been found guilty of contempt on at least two occasions. The court, however, has refused to punish the woman for her behaviour. And we might ask why? Well, on one occasion, the reason given by the judge was that if the woman had been a man, he would have sent her to jail, but because she was a woman and presumably, presumably a mother, he would not. As a result, of an unwillingness to sanction this illegal behaviour, justice has been denied and the reputation of the court has been seriously damaged. And of course, one of the very tragic results, Mr Deputy Speaker, of an action like this is that uh, the access of a particular parent, and in this case the father to the children, has become so prolonged, 
uh, from one visit to the next, and in fact since the last visit occurred, that the, the often used reason now to prevent any contact is the fact that uh, the separation has been so long that it would be quite detrimental for the children to uh, link up with the other parent, and in this case the father. So um, uh, this bill before us tonight will provide the court with an option which will be more attractive to judges who would hesitate to jail a parent over an access order. In the future, judges will be able to punish contempt of court in family law matters with community service orders. And I think that's a very commendable additional aspect to this bill. I commend the government for the decision to legislate in this way. The coalition totally supports this move, as the Shadow Attorney General has said. I believe it will benefit both those before the family court and the court itself. It is not an exaggeration to say that unless the court begins to sanction manipulation and contempt of its authority, confidence in the court will continue to decline. Mr Deputy Speaker, I also wish to indicate my support for that section of the bill which makes quite clear the power of the court to order compensatory access. There has been an unfortunate swing from justice to compromise and convenience in our attempt to make family law less formal and less adversarial. The bill before us tonight, in terms of provisions for compensatory access and community service orders as punishment for contempt, goes some way towards establishing justice as overriding concerns of the court. Mr Deputy Speaker, the second matter I wish to raise in this debate is the relocation by this legislation of the Institute of Family Studies from the, the Attorney General's Department to the Department of Social Security. The Institute is an internationally respected body doing absolutely crucial research on the family and its environment in Australia. Unfortunately, this government has been inconsistent in its support for the Institute as a study of the Institute's funding over the last seven years would indicate. This year, the funding that was taken away last year has been restored, but it's been up and down and there's been no consistency. Mr Deputy Speaker, a clear indication of the government's lukewarm support for the Institute is the way the decision to move the Institute from one portfolio to, to another was taken. It's my understanding, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the decision was taken without consultation with the Institute Director, who found out about the decision whilst overseas at a conference. I further understand that the government was not quite clear who, would, who should receive the Institute. The Attorney-General's Department no longer wanted it. The Community Services and Health Department was offered it, considered it and declined. But the Social Security Minister, recognising the worth of the Institute and the value of its research, offered to accept the Institute into his portfolio. Knowing the way the Minister has promoted the Social Security Review, and its excellent research, I must say that the final decision could be a happy ending to a sad story, and I hope it is. I'm also hopeful that the Institute will now get greater interest and support than it has received over the last seven years. It will and I will certainly monitor its progress, as indeed the Shadow Attorney General has said he will. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I have said and in conclusion, the Institute does find fine and significant research and policy analysis. It needs greater political support, more funds and better computer resources than it has received of late. And I urge the Minister for Social Security to expedite its portfolio relocation so that the incoming Coalition Social Security Minister will be able to give the Institute, originally set up by the Fraser government, the support and recognition that it deserves. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call on the, uh, the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank members for their contribution and I thank them for the support of the amendments uh, to the family law legislation. A couple of comments are worthy of reply. The Honourable Member for Menzies was very supportive of most of the matters in the bill and uh, went on to make the point which the Honourable Member for Macquarie has also made, namely there is some concern about the fact that the Institute of Family Studies has been transferred to the Minister for Social Security. I would like to dispel any concern as to the reason for the transfer. If you look closely at what we're talking about here, 
in legal terms in respect of this legislation is divorce. That is the separation of the family. Now the Institute quite validly has shown very clearly in its previous studies this is the most disastrous result both for the family and the children, both from the point of view of how they feel about it, that is all members of the family, and in economic terms. But you wouldn't want to think that that's the whole limit of having a study of families, that you've got to look at it from the divorce point of view. I emphasise that and I think it's wrong to be taking an attitude here this evening that there's something detrimental by merely transferring the Institute to an area of social welfare. In fact, some of the most effective work done by the Institute has been done for the family in respect of its social security and welfare needs. And that portfolio, that particular minister has access to substantial funds by budget for the welfare of children, for the welfare of, of women who need support. And you can't, to think that you've just got to rely on the divorce court to do it, it'd be the weakest read on which to rely. And you ought to understand that because the Institute of Family Studies made it very clear once parties are divorced, both suffer an economic loss. Both are likely to be in poverty. Once parties are divorced, the most unhappiest of them are likely to be the children who would rather they remain together. Now, the Institute has done those studies. The thing we're talking about is how do you do some more effective work to prevent divorce? And how can you do it in the terms of giving adequate remuneration? And I take issue with the Honourable Member for Menzies in suggesting that poverty has increased under the uh, Labor government. Far from it. One million and a half jobs created. The family allowance is, is a substantial increase, well above whatever was given in the terms of Fraser. And you have a look at that from the point of view of poverty. You have a look at the needs. If, if the parents are not employed, you can rest assured that the family is in trouble. And you have a look at the supporting mother's benefit that you had to pay. And how much did you do about trying to enforce the maintenance orders when only 25 per cent were adhering to those orders? What did you do about enforcing the payment? At least we brought in the child support scheme. And none of those things you ever thought of, and you were there for years, 1976 to 83. What did you do about it? Nothing. And that's the issue that we face tonight. And there was a much better economy now as to what you left it. You've, we don't want to go into this debate because you lost government because of your ineptitude in economic management. And that's the issue here. But don't drag in the side issue of what we're about. The fact is the Institute of Family Studies should be maintained and has a role to play. And it will do it effectively in conjunction with welfare and social security aspects. I welcome the support given to Mr Justice Nicholson and the judges of the court, in fact all members of that court. It is a most difficult administration. The parties are never happy. The parties have naturally got a view that they're the best judges. And you can understand that. But the judges have to make the judgment. Fortunately, only 7% of those cases go to final judgment. Most cases are settled by the parties themselves. The Honourable Gentleman from Macquarie raised a good point about marriage counselling. I want to tell him that in the period since 83 when we were elected, we've increased this amount of marriage counselling by 40 per cent. If he wants to have a look at the increase in the term of the Fraser government, he'll find it's less than 10. And I don't think you ought to be drawing those comparisons. There's never enough money to talk about the, those sorts of counselling, but don't put it on the basis as though you're going to do something better when, in fact, in the period of of seven years you were there, you weren't able to do it. And these are the issues that we want you to focus on. The court at the present time is costing about $32 million to run, and in the terms of legal aid, the lawyers aren't doing too bad. They're probably getting about $50 million in legal aid. And the issue, of course, is how do you get the parties to look, talk about their differences without too much litigation? That's the big challenge. And uh, Mr Justice Nicholson, and the court are all looking at issues as to how we might get the parties to be in a form of conciliation. In fact, perhaps one of the best methods of dealing with this might be consideration of the judges themselves, not judging the issues, but perhaps being some of the best conciliators and advisers 
on what you'd call a, a, an indirect basis to the parties. In other words, maybe the parties would take the advice of judges who weren't sitting in the action, but on the experience of what is the situation, because we need to do that. We need to stop parties being in adversarial combat. Whilst it's good for the boys at the bar, and they do very well at it, or I should say the women at the bar as well, we've got to talk about the fact as to what's best in the terms of administration. We're spending a, a, a fair amount of money now in marriage counselling. It's very clear. Once the parties have separated, counselling has little hope of success. Once it gets in the court, it has little hope of success. Once it gets in the court, it's got no hope of success because it's the divorce court. You've got to understand that. And that's where, most and that's where the problems are. Now, you've really got to understand how you might help them when they get to that stage where they re realise there's been a breakdown. And I think mediation is another way to go. So all those issues have been tried. The court was established in 76 without any suitable premises anywhere. Leased premises, causing no end of this. In, in Sydney, the court is in three leased premises. And that's an indictment of bad planning. You can't put judicial premises in tenanted property because you've got all the problems of insecurity of tenure. We've had all the difficulties of murder and threats and all these issues because people do get very concerned about the issues and they want to be their own judges. And so we've spent a fair bit of security. But I thank all of you for praising the work of the court and the judges. It is us that have increased their salaries. It is us that are talking about how we might make that a court not deemed to be something that's somewhat of a pariah and not part of the judicial system. The title family court does build up false expectations. It builds up the expectations that there's going to be something beneficial for the family there. The answer is no. There's nothing beneficial for the family there except a, a rigid judicial determination as to rights on separation, which is the very contradiction of the family unity of being together. It's trying to work out rights when there's been a division, a dissolution, and nobody can really enjoy it, and it costs the community a lot. So thank you for your valuable contributions as to what you feel ought to be done. You're welcome to talk about the issue of a, a, a parliamentary committee. We had one under the previous Fraser government. I was a member of it. We went through all these issues. But it's very clear the most successful people that came and gave evidence about the family issue were those that didn't believe in divorce. They're the most successful people. But you're going to have a big challenge in your society if you expect that to be accepted as a norm. But I thank members for their contribution and uh, hope the bill is now has a speedy passage into law. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. Those of let opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the House to proceed to the third reading? Forthwith. The Honourable the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that this bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Third reading, a bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and for related purposes. Order.